Greetings! We live in a vast world filled with extraordinary Pokémon, but as many of you know, I, Professor Ginkgo, have dedicated my life to studying those Pokémon who have been lost to time. Recent advancements here in the Paleon region have led to unprecedented discoveries. However, I could always use more help, so I wanted to thank you for applying for a research assistant position on our remote biological reserve. Be sure to fill out the appropriate paperwork, and I hope to see you soon! Welcome to Episode 1. It seems that you've been selected to help Professor Ginkgo with her research in the Paleon region. Uploading your employee photo lets you customize your trainer's appearance. But to start off, we need to design the trainers. Our trainers for this region are going to be heavily inspired by Ellie Sattler and Alan Grant from Jurassic Park. Uh, so I'll be pulling some design elements, um, moving around, tweaking stuff. I always like to start these videos with at least having the pose figured out. Um, so, and then kind of sketching in the details from there and figuring it out. One of the biggest challenges was figuring out the headwear. Um, looking back at past trainers, it's a thing that they just all have hats or some type of headpiece. Um, and I don't like hats. Hats are stupid. So I just found a little bit of headwear, um, sunglasses, bow, uh, to check that box. Also, the age of the trainers. This has kind of varied a little bit from generation to generation. Initially, I was like, you know, I want my game to have, like, older protagonists. Um... But I actually just kind of fell back into the standard age range. Um, I know like Kalos and some of those regions have been older. Um, but this is Pokemon. Like, even if they're a kid, they could still, like, whatever, get a parent to sign a permission form to go off on their own to some strange new region. So, yeah. So they're gonna not look out of place with the other ones. That being said, I do really love the idea of, and I, who knows if this will ever be implemented in a game, but like when you get to a boutique or a, you know, a salon or whatever, you know, just like give me, give me an option to have a fake mustache. Like I want a fake little goatee that I can put on my character so it looks more like me. Um, so I'm going to pretend like that's an option in this game. Uh, when I first started this project, uh, I did a completely different kind of line work. Um, I was using vector lines, uh, which gave me, they were really smooth, really nice, and then I would, you know, rasterize them and go through and, and kind of erase sections so it looked more hand-drawn, but that just takes forever. It took so long, and I knew I had a lot of work with this project as a whole, so I'm switching to actually doing all the line work just by hand. Um, no vector lines involved. Um, so I found a nice pen that I like. And I just kind of go for it. Um, it helps that I have a new drawing tablet that's much larger. It helps get those smooth lines. Uh, also, uh, with especially with these trainers here, I wanted to have a little variety in skin tone. Um, representation is pretty important to me. So yeah, uh, and expect to see that throughout all of the characters that are in the Paleon region. I will say these are going to be the only characters that we do a draw session like this with. All of the other characters, including Professor Ginkgo, those are all just based on my friends and voiced by my friends. It'll get a little repetitive for me to draw them and second of all, like I use their I use pictures of them as reference images and they don't want to be in these videos uh, like that. So, yeah, these will be our only people that I'm drawing. I think the last thing to touch on is, oh, I really wanted to get away from the, the like, blue, red, or blue, pink color palette between the boys and the girls that is pretty consistent across all the generations, and I wanted to flip that up, but it just didn't work. I ended up falling back on it, mainly because Alan Grant and Ellie Sattler just happened to be in blue and pink already. Uh, I tried swapping it, but it just didn't look right, so yeah, so I am reluctantly continuing that trend. Alright, anyway, here they are. Uh, this is Ellie and Grant. For the sake of this video series, we'll say that you're going with Ellie. 
Uh, and don't worry, Grant will be joining you on your adventure. Hi, I'm Grant. You must be the other research assistant that was selected. This is so exciting. So few people have even seen this nature preserve. I can't wait to learn all the secrets that Professor Ginkgo has discovered. It's a long voyage, but your boat finally reaches the Palean region. This is Camp Ryhen. It isn't much more than a few pop-up buildings and unpacked supplies, but you see Professor Ginkgo peeking her head out of a welcome building, and she waves you in. Welcome, you two! It's going to be so nice having some additional help around here. Here are your employee badges. Things are a bit... hectic at the moment, so I'll cut right to the chase. We recently had an unfortunate accident that damaged an important lab. We lost a great deal of our research, so I'll need you two to take these. Each Pokedex will let you recatalog the Pokémon here in the Paleon region. Now, of course, this nature preserve isn't the safest place, so I won't expect you to go alone. But because outside Pokémon are restricted here, I'll have you take one of these with you. These three are previously extinct fossil Pokémon, much like you would find in other regions around the world. But here in the Paleon region, our research allows us to restore these Pokémon to their true primal forms without any pesky mineral impurities. Let me introduce Cactamo, Fleetwee, and Salil. All right, let's draw some starters. So every good generation has a theme that applies to their starters. Uh, and what I landed on was uh, going with fight or flight or freeze, um, the three Fs. So that means our grass starter is going to freeze. Uh, they, not like cold freeze, but uh, they're going to rely on camouflage as their survival mechanism. So our round little boy right here, uh, he is the camouflage cactus Pokemon. Um, he's going to be very slow, very cute, very adorable, very round. And those of you who, you know, know any paleontological stuff, you can maybe guess kind of where his design is going to go from here. All right, this is Cactamo, the desert plant Pokemon. This Pokemon is originally from a hot, arid environment. Cactamo are incredibly playful and affectionate towards people. They enjoy basking in the sun and cuddling, and luckily their thorns are still quite dull. When Cactamo are startled, they freeze in place in hopes that they are mistaken for a plant. Uh, of course, it's a starter. It's got Overgrow as its, uh, as its standard ability. I'm not going to go into like hidden abilities. I'm not super knowledgeable about like the competitive scene, so I'm just going to be winging their stats as well. Let's jump into the next one. All right, for our little fire bird, we're going to go with flight, but but not like flying, but like running away, fleeing. This is the fleeing Pokemon line. Um, it's based on early birds. And I think the toughest thing with this uh, was Again, was nailing that, the like proportions of a starter Pokemon, getting that big old dumb uh, head on there. Uh, and the other tricky thing was having it being the, you know, a fleeing Pokemon was finding an expression that could convey that. So originally it had like kind of scared looking eyes um, and that just wasn't as fun. Um, I like the happier expression. Getting the, the kind of wing hands into a, a slightly more nervous position um, accomplished that. And uh, yeah, he turned out pretty pretty cute. I'm pretty happy with this guy. Uh, again, you can probably guess where this line is going to go. This is Fleetwee, the early bird Pokemon. This Pokemon appears to be an ancestor of modern bird Pokemon. Their soft feathers rub together when running to create heat which they store internally, and can release it to gain a burst of energy. When Fleet Wee are startled, they instinctively run away at great speeds. Alright, and lastly, we have our Water Starter. Uh, that leaves, then, the Fight Response. So this is the Fighting Pokemon line. That being said, uh, spoiler alert, this is not going to be a Fighting-type. 
Um, we get too many fighting starters. So I actually ugh, completely redid this Pokemon. So I'll let you know, pretty much every Pokemon that we're going to go through, I've done like an initial pass at. Like I, I have, I've basically completed the whole decks knowing that, you know, it's been several months since I did that. So coming back with fresh eyes, um, I'm able to spot the stuff that just needs redesign completely or the little tweaks that need to be made. Uh, yeah, and this water starter was one that was just terrible. This is the new pass at it. I'm much, much more happy with it. I decided to go uh, with a kind of Dilophosaurus look um, with those two crests. One, it leads into the, the later line a little bit better than what I had before. And two, it's cute. You know, obviously Dilophosaurus... It didn't have the frill, it didn't really spit venom like it does in the Jurassic Park movies. Um, but having this little Pokemon, you know, use water gun and spit water is a cute little way to, to I don't know, reference that. I think the hardest part with this one was I wanted, I wanted this little guy to be pretty grumpy. Uh, and there's not really a lot of grumpy starter Pokemon. So finding that balance of cute and grumpy... Uh, I ended up just leaning into the just giant stupid head, and that helped a lot. This is Sailil, the spitting Pokemon. This Pokemon is an expert fisher, using intense blasts of water to stun its prey. Sailil are distrustful of people and difficult to train. Pokemon trainers who put in the work find that these Pokemon are incredibly loyal. When Sailil are startled, they stand their ground and attack ferociously. Its ability is Torrent. Again, all these starters have their base abilities. Yeah, he's a tough little guy. So I am curious, without knowing what these three Pokemon may evolve into, uh, which would you choose? So I really do. I want you to leave a comment down below with your starter of choice. For the sake of this video, of course, uh, we're going to continue as if you have all three. That way you get to see what they all evolve into. Uh, Grant chooses his favorite Pokemon, um, which unfortunately for him has a type disadvantage against your starter. And Professor Ginkgo picks the remaining Pokemon. Wonderful! I suppose this adorable Pokemon will come with me. Let me point out an important difference here. The Paleon region is far less developed than other regions, so don't expect to run into fully functioning Poke Centers and shops everywhere you go. Instead, keep an eye out for these, Poke Beacons. This will allow you to transfer Pokémon to and from our centrally located Poke Center to heal them. It also allows you to purchase any needed items which are then delivered via drone. Now, I am needed elsewhere, but before I go, do you need a refresher on how to catch wild Pokémon? You appreciate that Professor Ginkgo would explain the basics to you, but Grant and yourself feel pretty confident in your abilities. I didn't think so. You two look like you'll have no problem here. I'm quite busy, running all over the Paleon region, so I'm certain I will bump into you again soon. Until then! Well... That was a short orientation. I'm glad she gave us these partner Pokemon to help protect us out there. We should probably get to know them. What do you say? Care for a quick well? You battle Grant and are victorious. The two of you head out of Camp Ryan for Route 1, where you are certain to encounter your first wild Pokemon of the Paleon region. Leaving Camp Ryan, you pass through a massive gate and enter Route 1. The path winds through an inviting forest, and it isn't long before you encounter your first wild Pokemon. A small bug waddles out of the long grass. Alright, time for our Route 1 bug type. Uh, so, I wanted something pretty cute, pretty adorable. I'm going to be vague with this one because I really like where this design goes, and I don't want to give away too much. Um, I am really curious to see if anybody can uh, pick up on where I'm going. So if you have a guess as to where this design may go, leave me a comment down below. So for this design, I wanted to emphasize uh, that this Pokemon likes to eat a lot. It's a, a nibbling little thing. And that in the act of eating all this food, that's kind of what helps it evolve. So um, you'll we'll figure that out later. But... 
Uh, I really wanted to emphasize those big old mandibles. Um, I also wanted him to look a little kind of defenseless, uh, so that's why his antennas kind of curl up and give him a slightly frightened expression. As he continues to evolve, he will go from a easily step onable, squishable little bug to something a little bit more intimidating. All right, this is Pipskeet, the nibble Pokemon. This tiny bug Pokemon spends its days happily nibbling on strange prehistoric plants. It's particularly fond of sweet saps and honey. Pipskeet often find themselves covered in sticky sap but don't seem to mind. Its ability is, appropriately, Sap Zipper. Not wanting to pass up on the opportunity, you decide to battle and catch Pipskeet. Congratulations, you have your first wild Pokemon. You do spot, in a nearby clearing, another Pokemon. All right, time to design our Route 1 normal type. Now, I will let you know, when I was coming up with this region and how many Pokemon there were going to be, I was keeping it on the lower side, just because I wanted a project that was manageable. So I actually kind of combined our Route 1 normal type with the regional dog, and this made sense at the time. Now, I, I would actually love to just have this design be the regional dog, and instead just have a completely new normal type, Route 1 normal type. So, if you have any thoughts on what a normal type for this region could be. Um, I would love to hear about it in the comments below. Um, now the tough part of this is it should ideally be an animal that is extinct, a prehistoric mammal of some kind, ideally a small prehistoric mammal. So for instance, you know, this design that we're doing here, our regional dog, this is based on the thylacine or the Tasmanian tiger. They are recently extinct. But yeah, if you have any ideas to kind of go with this one. The other reason is that our puppy here, this cute little adorable puppy, um, just with his description, his lore, like he needs to be elusive and kind of rare. Like he'd be that whatever 5% encounter rate. Yeah, I want to hear your normal type ideas and hopefully I can just make a little extra video and add that design in. All right, anyway, this is Marsupup, the shy puppy Pokemon. This elusive Pokemon is very wary of people and prefers to stay hidden. Even in areas where Marsupup are known to reside, it is exceedingly rare to spot one. Once they have warmed up to a trainer, they are very affectionate, loving to lick their faces non-stop. And you, you know what? You try and catch Marsupup, but it flees. It is a particularly elusive species. Next up, you spot a little Pokemon jumping out of a tree and clumsily gliding to the ground. Okay, time for our Route 1 bird. And well, I mean, it's not technically gonna be a bird. Um, this is gonna be based off of Pterosaur. I think that's fine. I think it's okay that this, this is not a bird. We're gonna have enough kind of dinosaur bird things going on later, so. Uh, the other really nice thing with this not being a bird, technically, is that I feel really justified having it be a mono-flying type, because there's nothing particularly normal about a Pterosaur. This guy is pretty cute, pretty adorable. Um, again, it is just monotype, but especially when I get to the description, you may be able to guess what its second typing may be in the future. Uh, but yeah, he's just a fuzzy little guy, and I, I especially wanted to show the, the kind of fluffy fuzz that pterosaurs had. Um, so he's maybe a little bit more poofy than pterosaurs might have been, but yeah, getting those pigno fibers in there was, was pretty important. All right. This is Kaitike, the flutter Pokemon. These fuzzy little Pokemon are not the best at flying yet and can be spotted tossing themselves from trees and fluttering their wings wildly. Luckily, their thick fluff protects their bodies so they can tumble to the ground without injury. Its ability is static, because, well, they're just so fluffy. And there are your Route 1 Pokemon. Again, give me some ideas for a new Route 1 normal type that isn't a doggo. But yeah, there are some truly ancient Pokemon in this region. Um, as you continue on the route, you walk by a tall fence off to the west. You find that it has a large gate emblazoned with a mysterious 16. And it is super locked. You are not able to get through. 
Uh, but you make a mental note to return eventually. Continuing north, you can see buildings peeking above the trees. And after passing through a luckily unlocked gate, you arrive in Ordo Outpost. There's quite a bit of activity going on here. Researchers are busy loading and unloading equipment. Central is a massive building that is part research facility and part arena. A woman comes barreling out. This is Beth, the fighting type head researcher. Ha! Ah, you must be one of the new research assistants that Professor Ginko brought on board. I'm Beth, the fighting type head researcher. Wish I could talk, but we have an emergency at Cratercliffe to the east. Oh, you want to help, do you? Well, looking at the Pokemon you have so far, have to say no. Also, I'm going to be passing through one of our restricted gates. You'll find restricted gates all over the island. If you don't have enough access codes, you won't be able to get through. You need five codes for this particular gate, and I'm assuming you don't have any. In fact, you're looking at me like you don't even know what access codes are. Okay, listen up. There are researchers around the Paleon region who specialize in studying different Pokemon types. If you can prove that you understand the types by defeating their respective head researchers in battle, then they'll reward you with that access code. Now, normally I would let you challenge me, though you probably don't stand a chance. I have to get going. She runs off, tapping her ID badge on a gate to the east labeled with a large five. It opens for her and she is gone. You will not be able to head to help her for quite a while, but perhaps you'll be able to find other head researchers to challenge and gain their access codes. You wander around Ordo Outpost, but there is little to do other than visit a move tutor to help teach your Pokemon new moves. This is Route 2. The forest is thinning a bit as the terrain slopes upward. You spot more Pipskeek, Marsipup, Kaitike, and a Pokemon that we designed in a bonus video, Little Glipig. But as you get acclimated to the area, it's easier to spot rarer Pokemon. In a shallow pond, you see two familiar Pokemon, though something seems off about them. Let's take a look at a couple primal forms to existing fossil Pokemon. Alright, first up, we've got a primal form for little Kabuto. When creating primal forms for existing fossil Pokemon, I wanted their first stages to not change too much, um, so they're going to stick pretty closely to the original designs, and it won't be until we get to the second stage. Uh, that I'll mix things up a little bit more. So, for Kabuto, he's based on a trilobite, obviously. Uh, the only thing I wanted to bring in for sure with this is getting some of those kind of long spikes, because that'll be worked in a little bit more into the second design. The other thing with this is all of the fossil Pokemon, they're not going to have that stupid rock typing. That's the whole point of this region. No more rock type. Um, some of them, actually very few of them, will just go monotype because of that. Uh, but in this case, Kabuto gets the bug type. It should totally have the bug type, so it gets the bug type. But yeah, not too much to say about this little guy. This is Primal Kabuto, the shellfish Pokemon. The more accurate revival process in the Paleon region removed the rock impurities and allowed the Primal form to regain its bug type. Somehow, after losing the rock typing, their defenses are even stronger. Though small, they have few predators due to their strong shell. And the ability is battle armor. You know, the Pokemon cannot take critical hits from attacks. But yeah, you'll, you'll spot little Kabuto just kind of splashing about in a little pond next to another primal form. Let's take a look at our Lilip. Alright, Lilip, again, isn't going to change too much in its first form. The only things I wanted to change to make it look a little bit more like the animal that it's based on is get rid of the kind of bulbous head and make sure that its little tenderly doodads have some kind of frill to them. It's supposed to look like a sea lily, so I don't know. the weird What it normally has, they just don't look good. They look, unfortunately, I, I won't even say, they're, they're, it's stupid. So, yeah, it's going to get some little spines on thinner tendrils and look better. Oh, 
Another thing with, with these fossil Pokemon is that when I get to the shinies, it's fun because then I can just give them their original colors for their shinies. So that's a nice, easy thing to do. Again, the leap, not the most exciting. Its second form will get a little bit more intense. All right. With that, here is Primal Lilip, the sea lily Pokemon. It disguises itself as a prehistoric seed plant in order to lure in prey. Lilip use their strong legs to anchor themselves to the sea floor, but can dislodge and leap about if another Pokemon sees through their disguise. Uh, the ability, suction cups, Pokemon, not able to be forced out of battle. And it gets to be just grass water. That makes so much more sense. Because, you know, out in the wild, this Pokemon is in the water. And, I, again, not that all Pokemon who live in the water needs to be water type, but it's a, it's a sea lily. It's a sea lily water grass. Anyway, I'm liking how this has turned out. Again, it's going to get cooler as we continue. So you can expect to see more Pokemon that are similar, but certainly distinct from the restored Pokemon uh, that you've seen in other regions. As you continue north, you find that none other than Professor Ginkgo is waiting at the gate to the next city. Well, 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 it seems that you have been busy. You have a fine start on your Pokedex, and it seems that you have caught some new Pokemon also. I know a great way for you to show your understanding of these Pokemon. Let's have a quick battle. Professor Ginkgo releases her starter and the battle begins. Even though she has a type advantage against your starter, your other new Pokemon are quite to the help. With her starter knocked out, she sends out a Pokemon you have not seen before. Alright, time for a new addition! So this is going to start out looking like just a cute little baby rhinoceros, but it will pick up some traits of the woolly rhinoceros and some other prehistoric uh, rhinoceros as, as, as it goes. To start off, it's going to be grass type, a tiny little rhinoceros. I had a lot of fun with this one and landed in a pretty adorable spot. The thing that took a while with this one is like landing on the right eye, eye design. Um, I find that with a lot of the previous designs and moving forward as well, I struggle with Pokemon eyes. I just fall back on the classic Pokemon eye, but there's a lot of variety out there. So I need to force myself to use um, and create different eye designs. And I like this one, very innocent, kind of baby doll eyes. And the other fun thing with this little monster is the pattern on his nose. Uh, which will come into play in his dex entry and also in the evolution down the line. This is Rhinosi, the shade Pokemon. This Pokemon's skin is very sensitive to harsh sunlight, but it uses vegetation growing on its back to protect itself. Unfortunately, the shade rarely covers Rhinosi's nose, and they end up with mild sunburns. Trainers can befriend Rhinosi quickly by pouring cool water onto their snouts. Its ability is Chlorophyll. Uh, it's got that big old leaf. Makes sense. Uh, and that doubles the user's speed during harsh sunlight. So yeah, little Rhinosi, pretty adorable. And Professor Ginkgo is trying to use it to beat up your team. It's a surprising challenge, but you managed to defeat little Rhinosi. In fact, you did so well that after the battle, it seems that one of your Pokemon is ready to evolve. Yes, tiny little Pipskeet is evolving. All right, let's design the middle stage of our regional bug. Usually it is some type of cocoon, some type of casing around uh, our larval Pokemon. Now there was some low hanging fruit with this one. Jurassic Park, Mosquito and Amber, it's perfect. I love it. So the idea is that Pip Skeet has eaten so much honey and sap and is so full and big and round, but in eating so much, they got covered in amber uh, and it has cured into a hard resin that encases their body. The 
design is pretty simple. Um, honestly, the hardest thing was just rendering the amber uh, and figuring out the best way to get that transparency uh, so you can see the body and see how rotund it is and yeah, kind of balancing those colors and whatnot. This is Stakito, the encased Pokemon. Pipski to have had their fill, cover their body in hardened tree sap when they evolve into Stakito. While it may lack mobility, few Pokemon can get through its protective shell. And with that, it has gained the rock type. I gotta put some rock type in there somewhere since all of the other regional forms are losing their rock type. And the ability remains Sap Sipper, um, so don't hit it with a grass type move. But yeah, you, you now have a little Stuckito. He's very happy. He kind of waddles around awkwardly. And again, this is a early Route 1 bug type, so it is likely to evolve again very soon. Wonderful work! You and your new Pokémon are working so well together! I look forward to testing you again in the future. For now, let me step out of your way and welcome you to Silur City. Silur City is a proper city. Centrally located in the Palian region, it seems that most researchers live here. There's quite a bit to do. Uh, you spot the main Poke Center that all of the Poke Beacons are attached to, along with a large Poke shop with flying drones kind of delivering small goods to researchers around the island. Finally, there is a large research building center, though it seems to have been damaged recently. There's a sign reading Evolution Research Center and it's currently being reattached as you enter. You are greeted by a friendly researcher playing with an Eevee. Hello, and welcome to the Evolution Research Center. We're just getting some repairs finished up after a group of trespassing ruffians attacked us yesterday. Anyway, this is where we look into the various evolution methods for our new prehistoric Pokemon. It's also where we get to work with Eevee. I know what you're thinking. The Paleon region is supposed to be free of outside Pokemon. But we have to make an exception for Eevee. It seems there is something about the Paleon region and its primordial past that allows Eevee to evolve into new types. Looking around, you see there are quite a few adorable Eevee wandering around the lab. Along with the evolutions that you've seen before, Flareon, Jolteon, Vaporeon, Umbreon, Espeon, Leafeon, Glaceon, and Sylveon. There are a number of doors labeled Evolution Methods, but each are locked shut and display an access code number. Oh yeah, sorry, the Evolution Methods are off limits to new researchers. Come back once you have attained some access codes from head researchers. But before you go, feel free to take an Eevee or two with you. You add an Eevee to your party and leave the building. Now I want you to go down below into the comments and let me know what unused type you would love to evolve your Eevee into. We will slowly be filling in all of the unused Eeveelutions in this series, so I can't guarantee that your preference will be the next one up, but it is coming, don't worry. Wanting to finally get your hands on an access code, you look to continue your journey. The path east is blocked by a restricted gate with a large three on it. To the north, a drawbridge leading out into the bay is currently locked in the upright position. So, you are left with no other choice but to head west to Route 3. Route 3 twists up through a cold mountain pass. Wind and snow bite at your face, but you keep your eyes peeled for new Pokemon. You're certain that the researcher in the last town said that Eevee was the only outside Pokemon allowed in this region, but in the distance you see a familiar silhouette. Getting closer, you see a very chilly Meowth. Yes, we have a primal form for Meowth. Honestly, when Meowth got original form in Sun and Moon, I was like, okay, cool. I, mean, I didn't really care all that much. It was fine. But when it got a Galar form, I was like, okay, this is a silly trope and I like it. So yeah, I had to do my own regional form. Now, I had set a goal for myself with this region to include 
all of the currently unused type combinations. So that is why our Meowth will start out as a normal ice type, though that normal typing will change when it evolves into Persian. Uh, I'd actually love to hear your predictions on where this design will go and what that second typing may be down in the comments below. This design fell into place pretty quickly once I knew I wanted to swap its gem right for an ice crystal uh, and that it would have a large tuft of fur that it was struggling to use to keep warm. Um, the color palette was also pretty apparent. Oh, and I tried to mimic the regular form's color palette in its shiny, like I do with the other primal forms. And here is Primal Meowth, the Scratch Cat Pokemon. This primal form of Meowth lived in frigid temperatures, but does not seem to be particularly well adapted. Its fuzzy paws help keep it warm, but most of its body is covered in short fur. Unfortunately, it seems that this shivering Pokemon struggles to stay warm due to its ice typing. Its ability is Fur Coat, that reduces all damage taken from physical types, and that's pretty good because its normal ice type is objectively kind of terrible. Like, I mean, all ice types. Horribly unbalanced typing. Fur Coat will help a little bit. And you know, wanting to take the feline somewhere warmer, you decide to capture the poor little ice type. Continuing on, you nearly trip over a new Pokemon. What you assumed was just a rock turns up and looks at you. Alright, time for another rock type. Uh, again, all of the existing fossil type Pokemon are losing their rock typing, so we need some fun designs to fill in the decks. This is also really interesting because this gets to be our first design that isn't based on a prehistoric animal. Instead, I'll have a few Pokemon that are based on prehistoric concepts, tools, and stuff like that. Actually, I'll ask later in the video for some new Pokemon ideas, so keep that in mind. It doesn't have to be an animal. Anyway, this is based on early tools, specifically the process of striking flakes from a stone to create a cutting edge. This will be a three-stage line, so I knew this design was going to need to start out very small and adorable. In fact, it's little more than a head with tiny little pebble legs. I made sure to get the kind of strike-like indentation on the face to give it some asymmetry and some character. Oh, and for its shiny, I decided it would be gold! So perhaps it could look like a, a gold nugget item in the wild? That would be a pretty bizarre, amazing way to find a shiny. Anyway, this is Chippet, the cracked Pokemon. This clumsy Pokemon is constantly falling over and running into things. It's quite brittle and loses small pieces regularly. Luckily, it builds itself back up by eating dirt and rocks. This process leaves Chippet with rough edges that it utilizes in battle. Its ability is something I'm calling Sharp Armor. When it gets hit, physical attacks lower its defense, but greatly raise its attack. Yeah, so if it, if it can take a few hits, it'll get super strong. Chippet rolls right up to you and insists that you catch it. Up ahead, you see a pair of people antagonizing a researcher, and the researcher's particularly terrified Pokemon. Okay, time for another fun one. Uh, this may appear to be another primal form, but it's not. Instead, we're treating this little monkey as the ancestor of the other elemental monkeys, so Pan Sage, Pan Seer, Pan Pora. Now that trio has kind of two main inspirations that we're going to play off also. First, it's the, the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil thing. And when there's a fourth monkey, it's usually do no evil, so we're going to run with that. And the second idea is that the monkeys' evolutions, they're based on, like, youthful subcultures, street gangs, and the likes. So we'll follow that as well. Now, those concepts won't really come into play until the evolution. So for now, you just need to know that it starts out as a mono fairy type. In particular, I wanted the design to feel quite defenseless and scared. I think the pose communicates that pretty well. This is Panfear, the frightened Pokemon. Panfear is likely to be the ancestor to the elemental monkeys. 
It is quite weary of other Pokémon and prefers to be left alone. They avoid all confrontation when able. Only when a Panfear understands their trainer isn't a threat are they willing to battle. Uh, and like all the other elemental monkeys, it gets gluttony as its ability. Hey, give us that Panfear. It's coming with us. You researchers need to just stay out of our way or else. Yeah, we're Team Arc, and we're here to liberate these Pokemon. We take what we want, so give us the Pokemon or pay the consequences. You jump into action and battle the two Team Arc grunts. They use Marsipa, Kabuto, and Chippet. But luckily, you are able to defeat them. What the heck? Who are you? We'll be back for these Pokemon later! It seems that the Paleon region has some kind of organized team causing trouble. Let's hope that was the worst of it. With the grunts scared off, the researcher thanks you and offers to give you their Panfear. The scared little Pokemon looks excited to travel with a strong trainer, and you take it with you. You do make a note, there are very few trainers in this region. You've run into a couple here and there, but on the whole, the Paleon region is very sparsely populated, so don't expect too many random battles. Uh, oh, alright, quick segue. I had a really fun time creating new Pokemon based on your suggestions, and I would love to do more of that. So, taking a look at our Pokemon types for the region, I could really use another dark type Pokemon. I would love to hear any ideas that you have. It should be either a prehistoric animal or a concept tied to prehistory in some way. Let me know what you're thinking down in the comments below, and it may make it into the next video. Alright, you climb up the gradual slope until you are able to look down on the rest of Route 3 and the little settlement beyond. Hello everyone, and welcome to Episode 5. I'm Gabe, and today we'll be finishing up Route 3 and confronting our first head researcher and all the puzzly surprises that entails. But before we get started, here is a quick recap. In the last episode, you started up Route 3, but didn't make it far before meeting Team Ark, the evil team for the region. You battled them and were able to stop them from capturing a terrified Pokémon. Alright, you continue down Route 3, you see more Primal Meowth, Chippet, Panfear, and the new Dark type from the last video, Quilvacol. But you soon spot a sparking Pokemon nearby. Alright, it is Pikachu clone time! Now I had done a really bad Pikachu clone design before, but it was horribly generic and it just didn't work. It was literally early mammal without any clear inspiration. In my opinion, Pikachu clones are tough to design, like tough like starters tough. And even here, the design and pose gave me a bunch of trouble. Luckily, Boreal Mind left a comment in a previous video recommending I think about Kimbatopsilis. I hadn't even heard of it, uh, but two cool things about it. One, it was recently discovered in New Mexico, which is where I was born, so that's neat. And two, research shows that it managed to survive the extinction event that wiped out all the non-avian dinosaurs. In my head, that means this small mammal is particularly feisty and determined. And because of that, I decided we would have an electric fighting type Pikachu clone. I should also say, for anyone who watches this video later on, right now, at the moment I'm recording this, we know very little about Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, but there is a theory that Palmy is going to evolve into an electric fighting type, but I just wanted to let you know that I did this first, if that ends up being true, so this is first, yeah. I also lumped in another suggestion, the Pika, mainly because it's cute. I mean, it's not extinct, but it's adorable. And Pikachu clones need that cute factor. Uh, and I also gave it real big feats, just like the prehistoric Lagomorphs, because I really like rabbits a lot, like I love bunnies, and Big Feet also worked for the fighting type. In the end, it's definitely more mouse than the Kimpatopsilis, but I like where it ended up. Colors took some time, but I eventually ended up something close to the Raichu colors. 
they both work pretty well and hint at the fact that I always thought that Ryuchu should have been electric fighting type from the start. Anyway, here is Takashuru, the tough mouse Pokemon. It is unknown how, but fossil evidence suggests that this small mouse was able to survive the extinction event that eradicated other fossil Pokemon. It wasn't able to survive indefinitely and went extinct sometime after that. They are quick and feisty and never back down from a fight. Its ability is Guts, so that boosts attack whenever they get a status condition. But yeah, he turned out pretty good. You actually battle and capture this feisty little rodent, adding it to your team. Continuing on, you spot a little pink Pokemon singing and kicking snow about. Primal form time. You know, I was always bummed that Amora and Aurorus weren't fairy type. It seems so apparent that they should be. This is a prime example of the rock typing of fossil Pokemon completely ruining things. Stupid rock typing getting in the way. Anyway, our Amara will be pure fairy type. And I know what you're thinking. It's in a snowy pass. Shouldn't it be ice type? And I say, hold your horses. You know it's going to get the ice type when it evolves. So now, just let it be adorable. And it is. It's adorable. The design was super easy. I know that Primal Tyrant will be Mono Dragon type, and I wanted Amara to be able to just destroy it in battle. Aurorus needs some serious redesigning when we get to it, so we'll see where that ends up. At the moment, Amara's little horn antenna things tie into Aurorus's current design, but even if Aurorus loses that element, I still think it really works for the fairy typing here. But that's it. This is Primal Amora, the adorable Pokemon. This cute Pokemon wiggles its long horns when it gets excited. Primal Amora are often bullied by Primal Tyrant in the wild, but their fairy typing lets them shrug off the unwanted attention with ease. Its ability is Cute Charm because, I mean, it's so adorable. When hit, you know, there's a 30% chance that the attacker becomes infatuated. But yeah, again, even though they're not ice type, you see them all around, playing in the snow and singing and being painfully cute. Finally though, towards the very end of Route 3, where the ground is almost thawed again, you spot a Pokemon trying to dig by hitting its head against the ground over and over again. A couple of people knew this one was coming, but we have to do a Dodo! I knew exactly what this Pokemon would look like right away, and honestly, it's not much different from a regular Dodo. I did cut its fluffy tail, uh, but I had a couple good reasons. One, its evolution doesn't have much of a tail. And two, I really love this pose and I just could not get the tail to fit without ruining the silhouette. So no tail. Both the pose and the eye design really help show how not intelligent this Pokemon is. In fact, I will let you know that this is basically the Magikarp of the region. It is terrible. Just terrible. Its stats are garbage, its ability is not good, and it's just a mono-normal type. Of course, I won't say what it evolves into, but it's gonna get good. Like, if you want, feel free to guess what it's gonna be, uh, including what typing it'll get. But anyway, this is Dodoi, the dumb bird Pokémon. This bird Pokemon is remarkably unintelligent and quite weak. Researchers completely understand why this Pokemon went extinct, and they struggle to stay safe in the wild. Dodoi seem quite oblivious to their surroundings much of the time, but a skill trainer can connect with this bird brain and get it to follow simple commands. Its ability is something I'm calling unfit. When damaged, its defense and special defense lower, while its speed greatly increases. So Route 3 had a good amount of new Pokemon. Leave a comment down below with your favorite of these. All right, you leave Route 3 behind as you pass into Devo Town. Again, less of a town. This settlement consists of one large research arena surrounded by a collection of trucks and cargo trailers. You heal up your Pokemon at a much needed Poke Beacon and enter the large research building. Each of the eight Pokemon type research buildings in the Paleon region essentially acts like a gym, with one difference. 
we are not focusing on extra trainers to battle as there aren't a great deal of people in the region to begin with. Instead, each research building has a fairly involved thematic puzzle to solve. I love puzzles, and the puzzles in most Pokemon games leave an awful lot to be desired, so I wanted to remedy that. In fact, you should know that I have a very puzzly day job. I'm the artistic director for an escape room company where I get to design and build puzzles for a living. And I know what you're thinking, wow, that sounds amazing. Um, and you would be right, it is the best, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> In fact, I am gonna plug something real fast. The company that I work for is currently doing a Kickstarter for a new puzzle at home product. So if you want to do some puzzles that I help design and enjoy more arts done by me and want all of the dog puns, then check out Rough Bluff. I'll post a link to the Kickstarter down in the description. Y'all, it's real good and it's real cute. Anyway, back to Pokemon puzzles. Stepping into the research building, a helpful researcher lets you know that they are still setting up the space. The open air arena at the center of the building has cargo containers and barriers scattered around creating a squishy maze. Luckily, there are a few trucks with small cranes scattered about. Yep, we are doing a crane puzzle. I'll let you know that this gym is normal type, which doesn't lend itself particularly well to thematic puzzling. So a nice easy puzzle like this is a good way to kick off the region. You would need to make your way through the maze while moving containers back and forth and slowly making progress. You would run into the occasional normal type Pokemon or trainer, so we can still squeeze some battles in there, but it's mainly puzzling. After completing it and navigating the building, you reach the center where someone is working at a makeshift desk trying to organize the operation. This is Kate, the normal type head researcher. Oh, hello there. I am Kate, the normal type head researcher. Work has been pretty boring as of late, so I hope you're here to challenge me to a battle. You are perfect. Kate brings out her Dodoy, which you are able to take care of easily. Her Marsipup is a bit more challenging. And finally, her Primal Meowth is no match for your new Takashuru. Perfection. You certainly know how to deal with my normal types. Give me your ID badge real quick, and I'll load the normal type access code onto it. She presses a button on her ID badge and taps it against yours. To your surprise, your badge unfolds, revealing a normal type icon. You're feeling confident now that you have your first access code. Route 4 lies beyond the next gate, but that will have to wait for the next episode. You heal up your Pokémon at the Poke Beacon in Devo Town and use your access code to open your very first restricted gate. The massive doors labeled with a large number one part for you. This is Route 4. The path is very uneven now with jagged rock faces rising up around you, creating shadowy overhangs. A Pokemon researcher on this path waves you over and asks for help. Throughout the Paleon region, researchers may ask you to study specific Pokémon more thoroughly. This is similar to the research tasks in Legends Arceus. Completing their specific requests rewards you with items and money, and completing the research tasks for any Pokémon will drastically increase their shiny odds. This researcher is asking you to study some of the ghost-type Pokémon on Route 4. They'll probably also give you a heads up, since it's early in the game, not to use normal type or fighting type moves on ghost Pokemon since they're immune. Heading down the winding route, you spot a couple Pokemon that you've already seen. Chippet and Takashuru are scurrying about, but from the shadows, a spooky visage pops out at you. Alright, this design will be based on the Lystrosaurus and its particularly funny looking face. Now. Even though it's got Saurus at the end of its name, Lystrosaurus was not a dinosaur. It's a therapsid. They were mammal-like reptiles from the Permian and the Triassic era, and they're what eventually led to mammals. Lystrosaurs in particular were decinodonts, so little herbivores with big goofy tusks and beaks. I think they're pretty adorable, but in an ugly way, if that makes sense. Anyway, 
we're gonna lean into how strange their faces look. In fact, this little Pokemon will have embraced its ugly mug and it uses it to scare away others. It's so spooky that it will be our first ghost type for the region. I'm a big fan of not all ghost Pokemon being just straight up ghosts. Instead, I love it when a design incorporates spooky, elusive, or mysterious elements to justify the typing. And that's what we're doing here. It was easy to turn the head into a bizarre skull, and some patterns on the palms help suggest little finger bones. I went with purple, classic ghosty types. Oh, and I added some little hairs on its head. This breaks up the silhouette and also hints that Therapsids likely had whiskers and other proto-hair. Okay, this is Listric, the surprise Pokemon. This spooky little Pokemon enjoys leaping out and scaring other Pokemon and people. Listric giggles have the strange property of echoing a great deal, making it difficult to know where a Listric is hiding. Their frightening behavior is a defense mechanism, and if they fail to scare their target, they will flee, partially due to embarrassment. Its ability is Infiltrator, so that allows it to ignore the effects of Reflect, Light Screen, and Safeguard. The idea is that it's able to kind of sneak up on you and get past those defenses. The Listric bobs around, trying to scare you off, until eventually, Another little round Pokemon shuffles over and nudges it back into the shadows. Okay, primal form time! And luckily, this one is going to be very straightforward. Little Shieldon doesn't need much more than a few tweaks. Now, that is not something I can say about its evolution, Bastiodon. When we get to it, it is one of the absolute ugliest Pokemon designs, in my opinion, at least. I mean, if you like Bastiodon, more power to you, but that thing is going to get some serious reworks when I get to it. Shieldon, on the other hand, is such a sweet and simple design. We're going to be shifting its typing to Mono Ground. This is primarily to help balance the types across the region, but I'm also going to justify it by saying that this line is based on Ceratopsians, who were incredibly grounded and sturdy. Yeah, see what I did there? Shieldon in particular is based on Protoceratops, which were wee little Ceratopsians that lacked the iconic horns. We made some minor tweaks to the design, but kept the overall silhouette the same. It was mainly about getting some ground type markings, which I imagine are from this little guy taking dirt baths all the time. Alrighty, this is Primal Shieldon, the shield Pokemon. This defensive Pokemon uses its large head to block incoming attacks. Primal Shieldon enjoy wallowing in dirt and sand dunes. These dust bats keep their skin healthy as they absorb the minerals. Trainers are advised to wear knee pads as Primal Shieldon show affection by gently headbutting people. Its ability is Sand Veil. That boosts a Pokemon evasion in sandstorms and also makes them immune to sandstorm damage. Shieldon smiles up at you before finding a puddle of mud to wallow in. Nearing the end of the craggy path, you spot a small stone topple off an outcropping above you. The stone hits the ground, flops over, and looks at you. This isn't a stone at all. In fact, this is our next design. Ooh, that transition was smooth. Uh, paleontologists have discovered some really amazing dinosaur egg, embryo, and baby dinosaur fossils. And, I mean, it's really astounding when you think about how delicate the bones are and the particular conditions required to preserve them. So that's going to be our primary inspiration. Uh, but that's not all. In homage to all the baby dinosaurs who died and became those fossils, we're also using the idea of broken eggs, so um, shattered shells, embryos, egg yolks, and the general goopiness. In fact, all that sad stuff is going to give us our typing too. This will be our second ghost type for the Paleon region. Instead of being literal egg goo, it's a wiggly mass of ectoplasm. 
We're giving it some egg yolk-like blobs inside it that also hint at a developing body, spine, and brain. Colors were fun to play with, and I love how it almost has a lava lamp look to it as well. Here is Ectrio, the embryo Pokemon. This spectral Pokemon is made up of ectoplasmic gas. Ectrio use discarded eggshells for protection and to keep their gooey bodies contained. Though they are ghost types, Ectrio are not shy and instead will waddle up to people seeking attention. They can be easily trained as they always aim to please. Its ability is clear body, I mean since they're kind of transparent, and that prevents other Pokemon from lowering its stats. I really love how this ghost Pokemon turned out. It's a pretty nebulous design, but I'm sure you could guess from the reference photos that it'll be getting much bigger when it evolves. I'm curious if you can predict how this design will advance. If you have any thoughts, put them down in the comments below and I'll let you know if you're on the right track. Continuing on, you see the end of Route 4 and buildings beyond a large gate. But your friend Grant is waiting there with his starter Pokemon. Oh hey, you made it. I was worried I was getting too far ahead of you. I knew that normal type challenge would be no match for you either. But I want to know exactly how great we are now. Most of my Pokemon are pretty tired from this route, but you know what? Battle me. Grant leads with his starter. It's quite a high level now, but to your surprise, it isn't at full health. It seems that the route really was tough on him. Also, your starter still has the advantage, so you're really not worried. After that, he brings out an Eevee that he must have also picked up in Salur City. You're able to beat him no problem. Dang! If I'd had all my Pokemon healed up, I bet that would have gone differently. Anyway, there's supposed to be another type researcher ahead. Let's get another access code. Grant runs ahead to Camp Niffer. You've got some real battles under your belt now and are feeling pretty confident. But I've got a feeling that battles may become more complicated in the future. In fact, the Paleon region should probably have its own unique battle gimmick, like the Mega Evolutions, Z-Moves, and Dynamaxes found elsewhere. Nothing is set in stone right now, so if you have any thoughts, let me know about them down in the comments below. We'll be talking about our battle gimmick in the next episode. This is Camp Niffer. Tucked in a dark canyon, the camp is primarily kept in shadow, and the researchers milling about seem quite moody. You meander around and see that a restricted gate to the north with a large 2 on it means that you will have to get another access code before you can proceed. One brightly lit building is out of place. It seems that a shipping container has been retrofitted into a salon and clothing shop. Apparently, the head researcher of Camp Niffer likes his cool, edgy fashion and is always bringing in new items, so you'll have to return here throughout your journey to update your look. As you head over to the massive arena-shaped building, a researcher lets you know what to expect inside. The Dark-type head researcher is currently studying Dark-type Pokémon and their ability to sneak about in the shadows. In order to get to him, It'll be up to you to pass through an elaborate light and shadow based experiment going on. When you enter the arena proper, you find it is mostly pitch black, with a handful of spotlights and mirrors bouncing beams of light about. You quickly learn just how careful you need to be as a spotlight hits you and a gate rises into place ahead of you, blocking your path. You're forced to retrace your steps and reset the challenge. And yep, that's right, we're having a, a fun little sneaking puzzle. So as you progress through, you'll find sweeping spotlights that you need to quickly avoid. But it's not all just getting out of the way quickly. There's also mirrors bouncing light that must be rotated to either unblock paths or hit solar panels to open gates or raise or lower platforms. And all the while, you're certain to run into random wild Pokemon and researchers lurking in the shadows. 
This puzzle is much more involved than the normal type crane puzzle we ran into earlier, but you are eventually able to make it all the way through. This is Alexo, the dark type head researcher. He seems annoyed that you are interrupting his observation, but he's doing his best to act cool and not care that you are even there. You must be one of the professor's new assistants, eh? Filling out that Pokedex like a goody-goody, are you? Well, I can't argue with that. However, you're gonna have to prove yourself against me if you want another access code. Alexo throws out his first Pokemon. It seems that he has little Panfear's evolution. And it looks like our scared little monkey does not stay mono fairy type. Yeah, I wanted to have a little fun with it and add the dark typing. Now, I made sure to follow the design conventions of the other elemental monkeys. So first off, it needed a youthful subculture to inspire the look. I went with a kind of goth punk aesthetic and that fits the new typing pretty well. And in order to continue along with the see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, our do no evil monkey here is going to have a weapon uh, <laughs> that it could most definitely do some evil with. This line is inspired also by the evolution of man and how with great intelligence comes the capacity for great evils. In this case, our scared little monkey has learned how to fashion a basic tool and is ready to lash out at the world. Oh, and the very nerdy phrase that also helped inspire this is the, you know, fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, hate leads to the dark side. Not that this monkey is a Jedi, but you know what I mean, with fear leading to this violent little monkey. Anyway, this design was pretty easy because I had the Simi monkey base to work from, and I think it fits in pretty well with the rest of them, albeit on the edgier side of things. Oh, and I'll also give you a little tease and let you know that this is not the end of the Panfear line. Um, if you have any guesses as to where it could go from here, I'd love to hear your predictions in the comments down below. But anyway, this is Simi Rage, the anger Pokemon. Simi Rage have grown out of their timid nature and have become wild and aggressive. They are quite intelligent and regularly fashion rudimentary weapons to protect themselves. Simi Rage are unpredictable as they bounce between helpful and antagonistic behavior. Its ability is gluttony, so that's again the same as all the other Simi monkeys. Now, Simi Rage's fairy and dark typing is tough to deal with, and you know, you need to swap out multiple Pokemon before you can beat it. Alexo is still annoyed and throws out a slithering Pokemon next. Yep. We have to get a prehistoric snake in there. And what better to use than the Titanoboa? This gargantuan ambush predator lived in prehistoric Colombia uh, in swamps and it grew to be over 40 feet long and weighed more than a ton. So like, yeah, it's, it's a real big snake. This isn't going to be a single stage Pokemon. So our little snake needs to start out small. Well, small for a Titanoboa. That means that we'll have a, you know, a wee chunkus getting ready for a growth spurt. Giving it a shorter body, let me land on a pose that none of the other existing snake Pokemon have used. And the silhouette was pretty boring to start, so I ended up playing up the scales along its body. This broke things up and emphasized their importance um, for when we eventually get to its evolution. It wound up being cute, but still intimidating enough to read as a dark type. And of course, as a mono dark type, the colors were pretty easy to figure out. This is Nanoboa, the big snake Pokemon. This prehistoric snake is incredibly heavy. Though not particularly long, Nanoboa can still constrict around its prey with its muscular body. It loses and replaces the scales on its body regularly, and they can often be tracked by following the discarded scales. Its ability is Shed Skin, so the Pokemon may heal its own status conditions, and that again comes from it losing its scales. This beefy little snake is tough, but your Takashuru comes to the rescue and takes it down. Alexo sighs and sends out his final Pokemon, Marsipup. Our adorable regional dog is getting an evolution. Now, 
As a reminder, it's not technically a dog. It's actually based on the thylacine or Tasmanian tiger, which was actually a marsupial. Yes, convergent evolution is a wonderful thing. Thylacine filled a niche similar to that of wolves, coyotes, and other canids. So it evolved a very similar body plan. But yes, it's much more closely related to kangaroos and Tasmanian devils than it is to dogs. Continuing the design, there were some thylacine things that I really wanted to work into it. Firstly, we needed to have those iconic stripes and that was easy enough to pull off. And secondly, thylacines were able to open their jaws incredibly wide, like nearly 90 degrees. Um, we actually have video of a living thylacine and when you see it yawn, it's just bananas how wide it can open its mouth. I find it fascinating and also really sad that we have actual video of the thylacine. We just look how amazing it is. It is such a shame that humans decided we needed to hunt them to extinction. All right, uh, enough being sad. We're continuing to lean into the fact that people still report seeing this recently extinct animal in Australia. It's almost treated like a cryptid there. So we're playing up the elusive deadness to give it the ghost typing. Now, to be fair, I did my very first pass at this design way before Legends Arceus existed. So at that time, this would have been the very first normal ghost type, but I dragged my feet and Hisui and Zoroark got to it first. Though I do like that both Game Freak and myself landed on a similar reasoning for the normal ghost type. This is Nylacene, the elusive Pokemon. This rarely seen Pokemon has mastered the ghostly skill of hiding in the shadows. Nylacene watch over shy Marsupup and will reveal themselves to defend them. Their spectral fur is cool to the touch and waves wildly when they're agitated. Its ability is something new that I'm calling Phase Shift. So ghost type and normal type attacks can hit all Pokemon. So basically, doesn't matter what it's using, it can hit normal types and ghost types. Neither will be immune. Yeah, Alexo threw you a curveball there. Nylacene isn't a dark type, but you can't argue that it, you know, it fits the look. And I also love it when gym leaders throw something unexpected at you. Its normal and ghost type is particularly tricky to deal with. You navigate its three immunities and finally beat Alexo, the dark type head researcher. And most exciting of all, it seems that after that battle, multiple of your Pokemon are ready to evolve. All right, we've got quite a few designs to get through, so let's just jump right into it. Um, in no particular order, let's see who's up first. Little Fleetwee is evolving. So I'm gonna start off by saying that designing starter middle evolutions is tough, uh, like really freaking tough. Honestly, Game Freak still struggles with it. I mean, it can't be, you know, just a slightly bigger of the first stage, you know, but you also don't want it to be too big or different, and it needs a distinct personality, but you don't want to fall into the trap of just an angsty teenager. Let's look at Fleetwee's evolution. I knew that I wanted it to be based on an Oviraptor. Getting that nice long neck already gave me a silhouette that's very different from wee little Fleetwee. And extending Fleetwee's forehead feather up into the Oviraptor's head crest felt like a natural progression. Its arms are in a strange configuration that I'm gonna I'm gonna justify by dropping a little paleontology knowledge on you. Oviraptors have traditionally been depicted as little opportunistic egg thieves. All they wanted to do was find an unguarded nest, go grab an egg, run away, and chow down. This was because a bunch of oviraptor fossils were discovered with eggshells around them. So paleontologists were like, yeah, this little jerk is stealing and eating eggs. But we finally come to understand that those eggshells were likely from the oviraptor's own nests. They were caring parents looking after their eggs. So this Pokemon will kind of combine those two views. It 
definitely loves stealing and running away with eggs, but instead of eating them, it cradles them with its arms and protects them just like a real Oviraptor would. This is Ovanish, the egg thief Pokemon. Researchers initially theorized that this speedy Pokemon stole eggs in order to eat them. However, it seems that Ovanish only wished to look after the eggs and use their soft feathered bellies to help them stay warm. If it's holding an egg, it will stop at nothing to protect it. But once the egg hatches, they quickly get bored and annoyed with the baby Pokemon and move on to another egg. Its ability is Flame Body, so contact moves may end up leaving the attacker burned, uh, and more importantly and thematically, it lets you hatch eggs faster. If you picked Fleetwee as your starter, let me know in the comments below what you think of Ovanish. Alright, next up, it looks like the awkward waddling Stuckito is evolving into its final form. And this will be our first fully evolved three-stage design. You all knew where this design was going. Our mosquito has got to break out of its amber. Now, I didn't want it to completely discard the amber, so I made sure some sizable chunks stayed stuck to its body. This led to a particularly fun insect wing design. Uh, and you can see that the Pokemon's actual body is incredibly simple, but it's the amber pieces that really make it dynamic. I am keeping it bug and rock type, but this is definitely one of those designs where I could have justified making it four types. Like, it could certainly pull off both flying and dark types also. Uh, but we're going to ignore flying by saying that it's generally too heavy to fly and hand wave away the dark type since it's really only mean to plants. By this point, I've got rendering the amber down and I love how it turns out. The body is definitely on the dark side of things, but I like how it makes the eyes really pop. This is Resonetal, the draining Pokemon. After breaking free from its hardened sap, Resonetal has a voracious appetite. It struggles to fly due to the weight of its remaining resin casing, so you can often spot them hopping and fluttering after grass-type Pokemon. Its ability remains Sap Sipper just because it makes so much sense for this line. I do love that such an intimidating design has to resort to awkwardly, like, hopping around. But yeah, let me know what you think about it. The grumpy little Sailil is up next. This is the starter middle evolution that gave me the most trouble. I knew that it was going to be a Dimetrodon, but man, oh man, I really struggled to make it really anything more than a cartoon Dimetrodon. The other starters theming, the fleeing and the freezing when threatened, lend themselves a bit better to a distinct personality. The fight response just leaves you with an angry Pokemon, which just isn't the most interesting personality trait. Now, all of these middle stage Pokemon have abilities tied to their skin, so Ovanish had Flame Body, and I knew I wanted this design to have dry skin. This let me play up the droopy skin folds on Dimetrodon a little bit, but other than that, I was resisting the urge to over-design this middle stage, and even then, it's still on the more complex side of things. Colors were straightforward and help, you know, sell that drooping skin. Anyway, this is Sliscale, the Angry Fin Pokemon. This aggressive Pokemon clumsily charges at anyone who gets too close. The large sail on Sliscale's back is able to absorb water and rejuvenate their injuries. They attempt to hide just below the water's surface, not realizing that their sail often gives away their position. They are incredibly loyal to their trainer and will diligently stand guard without prompting. Its ability, again, is dry skin, so that will heal it if it takes any water damage, though it is a little bit more susceptible to fire damage and hot weather. Of the three, this is definitely the least interesting middle stage, but I can rest easy knowing that its final stage is going to knock your socks off when we get to it, and let me know if you have any predictions about it. But up next, our Route 1 flying type is ready to evolve. Yes. Little Kaitike is going to go from barely being able to glide to now soaring gracefully. 
This will also introduce the line's second typing, electric. Oh, and I can finally reveal some more inspiration. Not only are we pulling from, you know, large pterosaurs, but we will be playing off Benjamin Franklin's key and kite experiment. Being an American, I can pretty confidently say that good old Benny Franklin was, like, freaking amazing. Um, I'm not gonna go on too much of a tangent, but just say that his contributions to electricity are insane. Oh, and no, during his key and kite experiment, the kite was never actually struck by lightning. He was just observing and feeling for himself the electrical charge difference between himself and the cloud. So anyway, our pterosaur Pokemon gets a very kite-like body plan in honor of that electrifying experiment. And now this does mean that it's not gonna be particularly good at landing, but I think it's a cute trade-off for a middle stage. This is as Dazkite, the gliding Pokemon. This Pokemon uses its specialized tail to gather electrical energy from the atmosphere. At night, they can be seen leaving trails of static sparks across the sky. Though they are able to effortlessly glide through the air, they are absolutely terrible at landing. For the ability, it only makes sense for it to get lightning rods so that'll attract any electric type moves and instead of taking any damage, it will boost its special attack. Yeah, this design is pretty cute and electric ground is a really good type combination too. All right, lastly, our happy little Cactamo is evolving also. Pretty silly, but I love the idea of our freeze survival response leading to a horribly uncomfortable pose. Cactamo already had a cactusy appearance, but its evolution needed a ridiculous pose to look even more like a cactus. In an early pass at this design, I had it just holding its big tail in the air to look like a cactus, but this is just so much more ridiculous and fun. Oh, and at some point I may reveal some of those atrocious early sketches. Boreal Mind suggested that I give a sneak peek and it could be fun. But yeah, this pretending to be a cactus pose is much better, particularly when the awkward expression on the face becomes more of a focus point. The actual body plan isn't particularly different from Cactamo, though I imagine that its back has more cactus barbs on it. Regardless, I'm really happy with this design and the amount of personality that it has. This is Cactolage, the disguised Pokemon. This awkward Pokemon is surprisingly successful at mimicking a prehistoric type of desert cactus. Cactolage can balance on their thick tails with their arms up for hours without moving. If discovered, they often resort to falling over onto their attacker. Getting them to do much more than stand about can be extremely difficult. Its ability is rough skin, because well, it's a cactus, so that'll inflict a little bit of damage onto their attacker. And with that, we have a bunch of new Pokemon evolutions. You'll have to let me know down in the comments below which is your favorite. Oh, and do the middle stages for the starters have you rethinking your initial pick at all? As apathetic as ever, Alexo, the dark type head researcher, approaches you. He's struggling to remain unimpressed after witnessing so many of your team evolve. You're certainly making some progress training your Pokemon. Beating me and evolving your Pokemon, you've earned this. He taps his ID badge against yours and you see a dark type icon appear on it. With your second access code acquired, you heal up your Pokemon and make for the restricted gates to the north. It unlocks for you and you see Route 5 Beyond. As you ready yourself to leave Camp Niffer, you are stopped by a young fellow researcher. Now, I know I said we wouldn't be drawing any more characters, but I had to make an exception here. This character will introduce us to the new mechanic for the region, along with fixing an oversight from earlier in the region. When I made the player characters, Ellie and Grant, I initially wanted to add a third, non-binary option, but I was unsure about what Jurassic Park character to adapt. Obviously, I passed over that idea then, but now we're revisiting it. And the more I thought about it, the more that Ian Malcolm actually would be a good basis for a non-binary character. 
So we will be retroactively saying that Mal here is a third potential character. One of the two trainers that you don't pick becomes your rival, like Grant is, and the other introduces you to the new battle mechanic for the region. And since I wanted to introduce the mechanic in the dark type Camp Niffer, Ian Malcolm's look works particularly well. Also, you'll have to excuse the lack of voice acting for Mal, as this was a very last minute addition. As you reach the gate, Mal steps in front of you. They compliment you on beating your second head researcher, but warn you that battles will only get tougher from here on out. They ask if you are utilizing adaption attacks yet. Adaption attacks? What could those possibly be? Yes, but it seems that Professor Ginkgo forgot to mention this new battle option. Mel challenges you to a battle so that they can demonstrate how the ancient Pokémon of the Paleon region are able to harness primal infinity energy and infuse their attacks with multiple types. They throw out a Resonetal of their own, and they explain that during a battle, when choosing an attack, you can pick the Adaptation Attack icon. After this, you choose the infinity energy of one of your attacks to store in your Pokémon. The attack power that is stored is dependent on the move's PP, so you can actually use non-damaging status moves to prepare an adaption attack. Here's a little chart that shows how much attack power you're storing depending on the move's PP. Mal has their Resonetal store up a dark type move, and storing a move like this always has priority. And for that single turn, you will get a defensive boost depending on what type you choose. You gain the resistances, but not the weaknesses, of that type on top of your current typing. So, Resonetal, who is Bug and Rock type, would get the Dark type's resistances for one turn. So if you hit it with a Ghost type move, it would take half damage. Or if you hit it with a Psychic move, it would be completely immune. Again, you're only getting the type's resistances and not weaknesses. So, it's not like Resonetal would become weaker to fighting attacks for that turn. Mechanically, I think this is a lot more balanced than just having this hunker down turn negate a set percentage of damage. It'll balance out that if you choose a more defensive type, you're more likely to negate incoming damage, but have less super effective range when you attack, while an attacking type may lack the resistances you need to survive. Mal explains that after you have stored up an attack, you are not required to use the adaptation attack right away. You can choose to use another normal move, but they remind you that your defensive boost was only active for that first turn and does not persist. When you do choose the adaptation attack icon, you get to decide what second typing is to be combined with your stored attack type. Again, the amount that you're adding to the final attack is dependent on the PP of that move. For actually calculating damage, you're technically attacking with both the moves so that their attack or special attack types can be taken into consideration. But the typing of both moves will change to whichever of the two will do more damage. Mal picks the flying type second, and their Resonetal unleashes a powerful Ominous Wind attack. After this, they end the battle, heal up your Pokémon, and send you on your way but we'll be sure to run into them again in the future. Let me know in the comments below what you think of the adaptation attack mechanics. You step out onto Route 5, where the cliffs become even more treacherous. The path dips down towards turbulent waters, and you are hit with a cool mist. You see Ectrio, Nylacene, and the new ice type from our last video, Penguno, hiding in the shadowy cliffs and crevices along with a handful of Dodoi foolishly playing on cliff edges. In a somewhat cool pool of water, you spot two familiar Pokémon. First off, we've got our little Primal Tortuga. This design was very straightforward, with two small tweaks. Firstly, I wanted to change the personality. I completely forgot until I reread Tortuga's dex entries that it is an active predator. Instead, I wanted to pull in some Finding Nemo inspiration and have our little sea turtle be much more chill. It's not dumb, but ridiculously relaxed at all times. 
Rounding the beak and a rotation of the eyelid was all I needed to accomplish that. The second bit was the shell. I'm adding some large pearls to soften the design overall and lay a foundation for its evolution. You let me know if you can guess the added type as I read the dex entry. This is Primal Tortuga, the proto-turtle Pokemon. This armored Pokemon loves being tossed about by gentle waves. Primal Tortuga's go-with-the-flow attitude give it an extremely calming presence. The strange blue pearls on its shell can detect changing ocean currents and let the proto-turtle navigate without giving it any thought. Its ability is damp, and that prevents other Pokemon from using explosion and self-destruct. Uh, and that's just because it's so chill. Uh, you don't, you don't want to explode around this very, very relaxed turtle. And I love the idea of it being thrown about in the waves, but it's just so relaxed that it's basically surfing. The other Pokemon that you spot is a Relicanth. You examine it closely, looking for variations that would hint at it being a revived primal form. But alas, this seems to be just a regular Relicanth. It has not changed. Amused, you go ahead and catch it. The narrow cliff path twists up and around and ends abruptly at the mouth of a dark cave. Before you can take a step inside, a voice calls out from above you. The sun is in your eyes, but it seems that Professor Ginkgo is being lowered down from some flying Pokemon. Her feet touch the ground, and the Pokemon flies off before you get a good look at it. Wait! I need you to stop there! I'm so glad that I was able to catch up to you. Thank goodness that Bree let me use her ride Pokemon to get here in no time. I just got word that some of those nasty Team Arc punks are up to no good in Mayo Cave. I can't let you walk into that. What? You think you can help? I don't know if you and your Pokemon are strong enough for a challenge like that. But if you want to prove it, you can show me what you got. Ready? Professor Ginkgo leads with her starter Pokemon, who you are not surprised to see has also evolved. She has the advantage over you, but your other Pokemon are able to counter, and she is forced to send out her second Pokemon, Rhinosi. Your flying bug and ice types make short work of it. And finally, Professor Ginkgo sends out her last Pokemon. Okay, let's see if we can give Little Omanite a bit more of an attitude. It's based off a very successful group of marine predators, so, we can add the protective plate over its head to give it an intimidating scowl. The little tentacles held up in the air also had to go. It made it look too helpless, so this more neutral pose is better, I think. And lastly, I wanted to put some colors on that shell. Though I kept the overall smoothness and silhouette of the shell, I was able to use the color pattern to reference the kind of exaggerated ridges found on actual ammonite fossils. Overall, the design is pretty similar, but as with all of the primal forms of existing fossil Pokemon, we'll be having more fun when it evolves. Here is Primal Omanite, the spiral Pokemon. This Pokemon's 10 tentacles are very short but incredibly strong. It uses them to swim about gracefully, and when threatened, Primal Omanite are able to recede back into their shell and cover the opening with a protective plate. While hidden in their shell, they are nearly indestructible. And because of that shell, I am giving it the ability Sturdy, allowing it to survive at 1 HP when it's hit at full health. It's a tricky little water type, but eventually you knock it out. The Professor's Pokémon were tough, but no match for you. She produces potions from her bag and heals up all of your Pokémon. Team Arc is up to something nefarious inside Mio Cave. My, my, my. Mio Cave is pitch black, isn't it? Here, I want to give you this. This is a Poké Ride signal. It will allow you to call my Takashuru to illuminate dark caves for you. Yep, that's right, we've got a basic pokey ride system for the Paleon region. You'll only be picking up a total of four across the region, and the first involves Little Takashuru. When you press the pokey ride signal on your ID badge, Takashuru appears and happily sits atop your head. It charges up until its cheeks glow brightly, illuminating dark caves. 
there were likely some smaller caves and areas in earlier routes that you weren't able to explore, but your new source of light would allow you to backtrack and pick up items and encounter rarer Pokemon. Here in Mayo Cave, you hear voices far ahead and do your best to stay quiet while you navigate the cave. You spy some new Pokemon, which the professor still encourages you to document and catch. A round clay Pokemon hops out and stares at you. This will be the first real object mon for the region. Pottery from ancient civilizations can be found all over the globe and I knew we had to do something with that. And because that pottery is often found as small shards, I decided to bring in another bit of inspiration. Kintsugi is the traditional Japanese art of repairing broken pottery with gilded lacquers in order to highlight and celebrate the damaged history. So our little pot here will also be made up of different clay shards. I could also see a fun little gimmick where the majority of this Pokemon have a handful of mismatched pottery shards, but like the authentic Sinistee, you could find a super rare, completely matching pot. Anyway, this is Kint Sandy, the cracked pot Pokemon. This round Pokemon's body is actually the fluid sand inside the pot. Kint Sandy holds sharp shards of pottery around themselves to create a decorative but brittle armor. If they ever lose a piece of their pot, they will pick up a random shard and incorporate it. Finding a Kint Sandy with an entirely matching pot is extremely rare. Its ability is something I'm calling Melting Point, so Fire-type moves raise the Pokémon's defense stat. And that's just to reference the clay baking process of, you know, making pottery. It waddles around the cave looking for new shards of clay to incorporate into its pot. As it wanders off, you spy a familiar shape gliding around in a clear pool of water. Alright, time for one of my favorite fossil Pokémon to get its primal form. I find Anomalocarids, which is what Anorith is based on, to be so, like, alien and weird and just fascinating. Honestly, I love the original Anorith so much it was a struggle just finding things to change. In the end, I decided I wanted its fins to be a bit more accurate, so I softened their edges and reposed them to better communicate the way they would undulate and flutter, propelling it through the water. I also added some dots on the head, but that just ties into some design elements for when it evolves into a pretty awesome Armaldo later down the line. Here is Primal Anorith, the old shrimp Pokemon. This correctly restored Anorith uses its nimble fins to dart through the water. This species isn't weighed down by the rock typing and can easily outspeed its prey. Their grasping claws are used to crush through the shells of their food. They live in the water but long to become something suited to the land. Its ability is Swift Swim, that doubles the Pokemon's speed during rain, and that just references how very speedy these animals would have been. It glides through the crystal clear cave water effortlessly and looks up at you with its big adorable buggy eyes. Suddenly, something catches your eye nearby. In the dark, you see a nano boa slithering past quickly. It looks like it's pursuing something, but it takes a moment for your eyes to spot its teeny tiny prey in the dark. Okay, I'm excited about this little bug design. It's based on early insects and how they made it to land and just, you know, spread everywhere, diversified and filled every nook and cranny of the world. The overall body plan isn't particularly exciting, I mean it's just, you know, like a bug. But this Pokemon will be tiny, uh, minuscule even, and it's always terrified of being stepped on. So it has these massive antennae that give the illusion of a couple exclamation marks to, to alert others to its presence. It also lets me bring in a nice poppy red to catch the eye, and, and the shiny goes a bright yellow for the same reasoning, good caution colors. But I'll let you know that the real fun comes when it evolves, and we'll learn more about that when we get to the bug type gym. Alright, this is Squishum, the proto-bug Pokemon. 
This minuscule ancestor to modern bug Pokemon is extremely nervous. Being so small, Squishem are worried that they will be stepped on at all times. They can often be found hiding under rocks, foliage, or even man-made trash for protection. Though frail, Squishem are highly adaptable and excel at finding unclaimed niches. Its ability is No Guard, so all attacks used by or targeting this Pokemon hit without fail. You feel terrible for this minuscule Pokemon and don't want it to be eaten by the Nanoboa, so you decide to catch it. Professor Ginkgo follows you deeper into the cave and you soon come across a pair of Team Arc grunts. Where is it? The boss said one of those weird rocks is hidden somewhere in this cave. I feel like we've been searching for hours. Can't we just take some of these fossil Pokemon and get out of here? Stop your belly aching and keep looking. Oh! Here it is! Look! I found it! What are you up to, Team Ark? I know you want to get your hands on every species we've revived here, but now you're collecting rocks? Well, if it isn't the Pokémon Professor, we're just retrieving something for the boss. If our boss wants something, we get it for her, so move out of our way. You join Professor Ginkgo in a double battle against the Team Ark Grunts. You battle their pain fear. Simi Rage, Nylacene, Chippet, Kabuto, and Ectrio. They are tough, but with the Professor's strong Pokemon, you are victorious. Fine, whatever. Let's get out of here. The boss isn't going to be too pleased when she hears you've been getting in our way. There's going to be some serious repercussions, if you know what I mean. The Grunts Retreat? but not before dropping the strange rock they were trying to take. It levitates off the ground and is quite cold to the touch. Professor Ginkgo slides the odd rock into her bag, but before you can ask any follow-up questions, she excitedly points out a rare Pokemon hiding in the shadows nearby. All right, who is ready for a pseudo-legendary? I imagine that this Pokemon would be incredibly rare, but actually catchable in much of the region, like a 1% chance in a handful of areas, Mayo Cave being the first spot. The other exciting thing is that I feel it has a legitimate reason for being a pseudo-legendary, for it has a roundabout connection to one of the legendaries for the region. It's also pulling from a couple places the idea of primordial ooze, along with the fossil revival process and man-made Pokemon in general. This is a pretty substantial redesign from my initial sketch, and again, I may show some of those not very good initial sketches in the future. Yeah, but that first pass just wasn't cute enough, so we needed to boost the cuteness. This is Fossage, the new life Pokemon. A mysterious byproduct from the fossil restoration process sometimes bonds with fossil fragments and spontaneously creates this new Pokemon. Fossage are extremely shy and self-conscious about their appearance. Some specimens have escaped the Palean labs and hide across the region. They are extremely rare and mistrustful. Once bonded, they tend to literally stick to their trainer's side. Its ability is gooey, so contact with the Pokemon lowers the attacker's speed stat, since it's, I mean, it's very gooey. And here are the new Pokemon in Mayo Cave. A particularly adorable lot, if you ask me. But what do you think of them? Let me know your favorite down in the comments below. You follow Professor Ginkgo through the winding cave and eventually arrive at an exit. Thank you for all your help. I had better stay here in case Team Ark decides to come back looking for more of those strange rocks. You'll find Permarina at the end of Route 5, where you should also run into Bree, the flying-type head researcher. Professor Ginkgo heals your Pokémon again, and you leave the cave's north exit. You are left to finish walking the rest of Route 5 alone, accompanied only by the wild Dodoy, Nylacene, Ectrio, Relicanth, and Omanyte. It isn't long before you reach the gate to Permarina. A series of pop-up buildings have been built at various levels along the cliff face. Down below, a dock is crowded with small boats, and atop the highest cliff, you see the flying-type research building. A helpful researcher nearby explains that Bree, 
the flying type pet researcher, is currently studying Pokemon in there. But you are welcome to challenge her if you can make it all the way to the top of the building. Ah yes, we've got another fun, puzzly setup to overcome. Gargantuan fans create strong gusts of wind that crisscross every which way across the arena, with various flying Pokémon deftly maneuvering through their currents. Looking overhead, you spot Bree standing on the highest platform. Other platforms, stairs, and ladders seem to lead up there, but it doesn't take long before a fan blows you off a platform. You fall towards the center of the floor where an updraft from a massive fan softens your fall. Looking around, you see that this will take a bit more thought. By strategically reaching different platforms, turning on and off various fans, and using gusts of air to make daring jumps between platforms, you start to make progress upwards. The occasional wild Pokémon and trainer stand in your way as you climb farther up, but you eventually come face to face with Bree, the flying type head researcher. Good to see you made the climb. Gorgeous view, don't you think? You've certainly mastered any fear of heights to get here, but let's see if you know how to deal with my flying type Pokémon. Bree leads with Azdazkite. The typing is tough to deal with, flying electric, but eventually some of your ice type Pokemon are able to take it down. And next, she brings out a new addition to the existing fossil Pokemon. I always thought it was strange that Aerodactyl didn't have a pre-evolution like the other fossil Pokemon. Now I know that that was Gen 1 and they didn't have all their frameworks figured out then, so a single stage fossil was totally okay. But I want Aerodactyl to be on a similar footing as the rest of the fossil Pokémon. And that means it gets a pre-evolution. Now, because of the lore behind Mega Aerodactyl, it actually made sense for this line to keep the rock typing. So I ended up pulling in some influences from the Mega design. Simplifying Aerodactyl wasn't particularly difficult, it was mainly about finding the right head adornment, and luckily there is a plethora of bizarre beaks and head crests among pterosaurs to choose from. The eyebrows were a late addition as the head still felt pretty lacking. But we'll have even more fun when we do Primal Aerodactyl, as I always felt that Mega Aerodactyl was one of those more clunky and over-designed Mega Evolutions and it, you know, it deserves something better. But anyway, this is Stalactyl, the lost fossil Pokémon. This flying Pokémon's innate rock typing once complicated the revival process. Its evolution, Aerodactyl, has been known for many years, but Stalactyl has only recently been successfully revived. They are fearless and aggressive, but their delicate wings make them quite frail. Stalactyl enjoy perching on trainer's shoulders, but be wary as they are surprisingly heavy. Its ability is Rock Head, and that protects the Pokémon from recoil damage, and that makes sense since it has these big rocky protrusions on its beak. You are able to defeat Stalactyl, and thankfully at this point in your adventure it wasn't a full Aerodactyl. Next, she brings out another fossil Pokémon. In fact, this happens to be my favorite of the fossil Pokémon, Little Archon. I knew that we were going to do two things with the Archon line. One, redo the color palette. Even though I love this line, I can admit that the colors are a little much. And two, pull in more inspiration from early birds. In particular, because of Archaeops' four wings when it evolves, this will be inspired by Microraptor. I knew that I needed to bring the feathers farther down Archon's legs to hint towards it getting a set of back wings, along with diminished feathers on its arms to show that it isn't a true flyer just yet. The other wonderful thing about Microraptor is that we have a pretty good idea what color it was. By examining fossilized feather microstructures, paleontologists were able to determine that Microraptors had dark blue-black feathers likely with a slight iridescent sheen to them. Not dissimilar to some modern birds. I decided to boost the blue a bit so that the design doesn't read too dark. I also removed the visible teeth in favor of a more beak-like mouth. Oh, and for the colors of the beak and belly, 
Well, that comes from its kind of tricky typing. Anyway, here is Primal Archon, the first bird Pokemon. Primal Archon's arms are held out while they run at high speeds so that their short feathers can help them maintain balance. They are also expert climbers and can be seen scaling sheer cliffs and tall trees across the region. Their confidence is only broken when they fall from great heights and flail their arms wildly to slow their descent. Its ability is something I'm calling Optimist, which is the inverse of their normal ability, Defeatist. So, when the HP drops below 50%, its attack and special attack stats are raised by 25%. And because of this Archon and Archaeops, their stats actually won't be raised the way they normally are. They'll actually be the same as all the other fossil Pokemon. It seems particularly unfair for Bree to have a pure ground type as a flying specialist, but you know, I love throwing curveballs like this at you. Of course, you adapt and take it down. Lastly, Bree calls out her ace. All right, it is time for our first new evolution. Flying isn't the most requested Eevee, but we'll be getting through all the new types eventually, and this will be a great place to start. Now, I knew that I wanted this evolution to be in a floating pose, but I actually changed its method of flight last minute. Originally, it was gonna have a massive poofy tail that kept it aloft like a air balloon. Alas, I was just really struggling to get it to work with the other proportions. Luckily, if you watched our last video where I created new bug types, you would know that I was able to reuse that concept in the Raccoon design. As far as figuring out our evolution's method of flight, I knew that I wanted it to be a part of the tail, as I've seen too many flying type evolutions where the ears just get super big and turn into wings. I mean, I'm all for wing ears, but I didn't want them to be any bigger than the other evolution ears. So I eventually landed on this swirling twister tail. I imagine that it's able to spin its tail to create constant lift so that it can kind of lazily float around. Colors were straightforward, though I did have fun making the shiny colors look like a storm cloud. Anyway, this is Loftion, the twister tail Pokemon. The cloud soft fur of Lofty and Swirling Tail is thought to aid it in generating tremendous amounts of lift. Though not a particularly fast flyer, this easygoing Pokemon can float through the air without any effort at all. Lofty and have been known to doze off while their tails continue to spin, sometimes leading to them waking from their slumber far from where they initially fell asleep. Its ability is unburdened, so that raises the Pokemon's speed stat when a held item is used. And Loftion is a powerhouse. It's not particularly fast, but it is extremely bulky, and it takes a while for you to take it down. Very well done! First, that other research assistant beats me, and now you? The professor picked some talented assistants. I just have to reward you. First, give me your ID badge. She taps her ID badge against yours, and you see the flying type icon appear on it. But also, I want to give you this. It's another Pokeride signal. Use this, and my Loftion will happily fly you wherever you need to go. Loftion can only take you to places you've already been, but it sure beats walking. You could even get back to Salur City. And rather than letting you climb all the way back down, she hip-checks you off the platform, where you are caught by the center fan's upward gust. You leave the research center and make your way down to the dock. You inquire about using a boat to continue north, but it seems that all of the boats are currently being used at the moment. Curious what flying will be like, you use your new pokey ride signal and Loftian carries you away! Yes, this is our fun fly poker ride. I really love how silly some of the harnesses and whatnot are for other pokey rides, and I wanted to ramp that up a bit. I immediately imagined a seat reminiscent of fair swing ride things, so this will have you traveling in style, making it a piece of cake to backtrack. The view from up high is truly gorgeous as you leisurely ride all the way back to Salur City. 
You revisit the Evolution Research Lab and are excited to find that your new Level 3 access code lets you into a new room where you can purchase potential evolution items. Some of these you are already familiar with as evolution methods. The water, thunder, fire, dawn, dusk, leaf, and ice stones, along with some rarer evolution items like the metal coat and dragon scale. There are also a number of items that you've seen before, but you didn't realize that they could trigger any type of evolution, such as the normal gem, the pink scarf, black belt, toxic orb, spell tag, and a bunch of others. Lastly, there's a bunch of items that appear to be just old discarded junk. You see a tattered lampshade, a cracked crystal ball, an old box of matches, a folding fan that's all torn up, and a cracked potted plant. You're free to pick up as many of them as you want, and I'm curious if you can predict what Pokemon may evolve with any of these evolution items. I would love to hear your predictions down in the comments below. I will confirm any that you happen to get right. Now the drawbridge to the north of Solur City is still up, but you are excited to see that the restricted gate to the east is waiting to be opened by your new access code. You pass through the gate to the east and onto the gentle fields of Route 6. You recognize Stakido, Rhinosi, Fernanto, Primal Blitzel, and Archon traipsing in the grass. But you do spot two new Pokemon. First off, we've got a strange ancestor to modern giraffes. This is actually a pretty recent discovery with a funky name, Disco Kyrex Jishi? I'm Positive, I mispronounced that, but it's still fun. Their neck joints were incredibly complex and robust, capable of absorbing massive forces, and their theorized headbutting behavior makes for a really nice fighting type. On the whole, fighting type Pokemon tend to be my least favorite design since they usually go for something more humanoid, and we all know how that can turn out. Like, yikes, bikes. I'm a big fan of fighting types that don't have to lean on that. But to further play up the fighting type for our quadrupedal design, I am turning its massive head crests into vaguely fist-shaped mounds. This is particularly fun because it will be elaborated on when this design evolves. Now I pull in some vibrant giraffe colors, which worked really well for the fighting type. And here is Bumpiff, the headbutt Pokemon. This territorial Pokemon charges anyone who hasn't earned its trust. Bumpiff's head sport two massive knotted horns, which it uses to smash through anything in its way. They have a rivalry with Primal Blitzel and chase them off whenever able. Its ability is Mold Breaker, so that means its moves can be used regardless of an opposing Pokemon's abilities. Most of the Bumpiff are busy fighting with one another or chasing Primal Blitzel around the fields. As you continue on, you see a small mound of dirt in the middle of the path, which shifts its weight a bit. As you get closer, it snores and yawns. Okay, alright y'all, it is time to get adorable. It feels maybe a little cliche, but we just have to have a ground type ground sloth. It'll get big and tough when it evolves, but to start off, things are going to be really, really adorable. I knew that I wanted the general shape of the design to look like a little mound of dirt. Also, a lot of artistic renders of Megatherium and other giant ground sloths have a long anteater-like tongue, and I wanted to incorporate that. Though this was mainly to get a cute little yawning tongue sticking out. Yeah, it is so and cute. Uh, I just want to yell about it. Okay, colors felt pretty obvious, but oh, I had more fun with the shiny. Um, one of my favorite YouTubers is Best in Slot. He does a lot of Jurassic Park talk and plays all of the dinosaur games on his channel. Go check it out. Um, but he has an adorable sloth as his channel mascot. So I wanted to use the colors from his sloth to make this guy's shiny. Anyway, this is Slothump. The Napping Pokemon. This sleepy Pokemon spends the majority of its day snoozing on the ground. Particularly long naps often leave Slothump partially covered with dirt, which it uses to appear as an anthill. 
Their long, sticky tongues are perfect for pulling leaves off of branches or nabbing unsuspecting bug-type Pokémon. Its ability is Comatose, so that's Komala's signature ability, and I feel like this sleepy little monster should get it. Um, and that means the Pokémon is essentially asleep and cannot be inflicted with any other major status condition. Now, Slothump is just too adorable to resist, and you just have to catch it before continuing east. You climb a gentle incline and come to a small ranch with a beautiful view of Palian Bay. A researcher welcomes you to the Pokemon Daycare Center. Ah, you must be the other one of Professor Ginkgo's new assistants. She certainly has you two working hard, doesn't she? I know you're getting that Pokédex filled out, but it's like she needs it done by some imminent deadline. Anyway, this is the Pokémon Daycare Center. If you wish, I can look after a couple of your Pokémon and help them get stronger, while you continue your adventure. It's very fulfilling work, though I must admit that I am... perplexed. Sometimes, when I have two Pokémon together at the ranch, a random Pokémon egg just appears I'll have to study this phenomenon further. In the meantime, why don't you take this Pokemon egg with you? You are gifted with a Pokemon egg! You'll have to carry the egg carefully on your adventure. Looking off to Paleon Bay to the north, you can see a research station out in the middle of the water. It's then that a friendly voice addresses you from nearby. I was hoping to get out to whatever lab is out in the middle of the bay, but the drawbridge in Salur City has been raised this whole time. But I'll find a way there. I know that's where all Professor Ginkgo's discoveries must be. Let's see who can get there first. I bet I can beat you. But for now, I'd love to see how your Pokemon are coming along. Let's battle! Grant leads with his starter, which you are able to take care of quickly. Next, he uses his little Eevee. He hasn't evolved it yet, but it is substantially stronger. For his last Pokemon, Grant sends out something that you are fairly certain you have at least seen part of before? Ah yes, the Galarian fossils. Some people hate them, but I for one absolutely love them. I think there's a good amount of people who don't understand the paleontological reference that they make, um, and instead see them as stupid, ugly abominations, which they are, they certainly are. That's kind of the whole point. Oh, and in case anybody doesn't know, Here's the deal. Uh, in the early days of paleontology, there were some individuals who were a little less concerned with scientific accuracy and more interested in presenting captivating fossils, so it wasn't completely unheard of for a set of prehistoric remains to be comprised of multiple species. And so, the Galarian fossils are a wonderful way to play off of that. Now, of course, we are going to have to complete the fossils for our region, and first up is the electric fossil. I feel like we all have a pretty good idea what the rest of this Pokemon should look like. You know, a small Dromaeosaur. And in this case, a Troodon, or Truodon. I was never completely sure how to pronounce that. But they're notable for having great big dino brains compared to their bodies. And honestly, there's not a ton to say about this design. Here is Troazolt, the sprinting Pokemon. A complete fossil for this ancient Pokémon was finally discovered in the Paleon region. Troazolt are incredibly fast and intelligent, seen regularly working together in packs to find food. They are very affectionate, but their nuzzles often leave their trainer's hair standing on end. Its ability is Quick Feet, so that means that their speed raises by 50% when afflicted with a status condition. Troazolt's speed is difficult to overcome, but you finally beat Grant. Your Pokémon may be stronger, but Grant has consistently been ahead of you in challenging the researchers. You wonder if you'll be able to beat him to whatever lies at the center of Paleon Bay. In fact, he's already gone. You follow his tracks to the end of Route 6, and spy Tritown beyond the next gate. But now, you've arrived in Tritown. It's built on a set of dried-out hot spring flats. You see a large research building with spindly pipes coming off of it, immediately giving you bug vibes. There are trailers, large cargo containers, and cages scattered about, but you're surprised to see that all of the researchers in Tritown have actually been locked up inside the cages by Team Arc Grunts. 
you spot Grant hiding by the research building. Well, so much for challenging the next head researcher. That's her locked in that cage. Looks like it's up to us to clear out Seamark. Let's heal our Pokemon at this Poke Beacon and then kick some butt. You ready? Grant follows your lead as you sneak around Tritown's scattered cargo crates. It looks like Team Arc is getting serious. All of the researchers of Tritown are locked inside large crates that you are unable to open. You can see large control cables that snake their way into the big research building nearby. The front door is locked, but luckily you and Grant find an air vent that you are able to squeeze through. Yes, this is essentially our bug-type gym's puzzle. The controls to the cages are somewhere inside this large building, and it's up to you and Grant to be like a little bug, right? Wiggle your way through crawl spaces and climb up and around the building. The place is overrun by Team Arc, and you'll have to battle many grunts, but luckily Grant joins you in double battles. The grunts use Marsipup, Nylacene, Panfear, Simi Rage, Kabuto, Quilvacole, Chippet, Ectrio, and two new Pokemon. First off, it seems that their Ectrio have evolved. Some of you had already guessed that Ectrio was going to get big when it evolved, so we're going to start down that path. We're also continuing with the broken egg theme from before, but flipping the shell so that it now rests on the back. The pose of this design is a little odd. I wanted to reference that as sauropod dinosaurs grew, they were obviously able to reach different levels of vegetation. The final evolution for this line will be upright, so that means that this design will have its head low against the ground. I imagine it acting like a lawnmower, just kind of scooting across the ground and gobbling up all the grass. And there has also been a shift in Pokemon towards designs that work better in three dimensions than just two, and I think this falls into that category. The head and four limbs on the ground make a uniform kind of star pattern that unfortunately doesn't read nearly as well in just two dimensions, so just use your mind's eye to imagine an in-game camera circling around this guy during a battle. Of course, the colors stayed mainly the same, and here is... Plazaro, the growing Pokemon. The gaseous body of this Pokemon is extremely lightweight, so Plazaro try to keep their feet and head planted on the ground at all times to ensure they don't float away. Plazaro also have a voracious appetite and will happily spend their days shuffling about and devouring all low vegetation. They seem determined to grow even larger. Its ability is clear body. Uh, again, because it's transparent, and that prevents other Pokémon from lowering its stats. Plazaro are a pretty tanky mono ghost type, but you know that things will get a whole lot bigger in its final evolution. It will also gain an unexpected secondary typing as well, and if you think you can guess that typing, be sure to let me know down in the comments below. There's also one more, much smaller Pokémon that the Team Arc grunts are using. We are going way back in the fossil record for this one. I knew that I wanted to reference the early aquatic life that first developed spines, so this will be based on the Chordata phylum. Well, the Pokemon World's version of that. I also wanted to show how eyes have evolved multiple times, so this design will have barely developed little eyeballs. They're little more than divots with wee little photosensitive cells inside. Oh, and because of the way that the soft body fossils are preserved, letting us see their proto-spines, I wanted to give this squishy boy transparent skin so that we can see the spine also. This also meant that the brain is visible, which I think is fun for a Pokémon with one of the first complex nervous systems, and lets us pull in the typing too. Monopsychic type. This is Cortulli, the brain Pokémon. This small fish is thought to have been one of the first Pokémon to develop a brain and complex nervous system. Cortulli brains developed so quickly that they gained strong psychic powers. Unlike other aquatic fish, they have left the water using their telekinetic abilities. Cortulli have very rudimentary eyes and get grumpy when they accidentally run into something. Its ability is levitate, so it's using its brain to float and swim about through the air. 
and that means that the Pokémon is immune to ground-based attacks. These little protofish aren't too much of a problem for you and Grant, and eventually you're able to clear out the last of Team Arc. You two are the worst. Sure, we probably shouldn't have locked up all these scientists, but they wouldn't get out of our way. They wouldn't listen to the good we're trying to accomplish. We can't just leave these new Pokémon stuck in this region. Whatever. Just wait until the boss hears about this. You watch as the Team Arc grunts flee the building and retreat to the south. You find the controls to the cages and release the captured researchers. You can hear cheers outside, and it isn't long before the bug-type head researcher bursts in to thank you. Wow, we owe you big time. I know what you're thinking. How did a bug catcher like me end up getting caught herself? Well, they caught us by surprise. I'm Abigail, the bug-type head researcher. I was itching for a fight with those goons, but my Pokémon were all back in my lab when they captured us. Speaking of, I suppose you're here to challenge me. Time for me to prove what bug-type Pokémon can do. Heal up your Pokémon and meet me in my lab. Abigail leads with Primal Anorith, which you are able to dispatch easily. Her next Pokémon proves to be much more challenging, Resonedle. After that, she uses a new Pokémon that appears to be just a Pokéball? Very strange. It scurries across the floor and you do your best to attack the small target. Eventually, the Pokémon uses the move Fling and throws the Pokéball your way, hitting your Pokémon with a strong Steel-type attack. With the Pokéball finally off of its back, you get a good look at this new Pokémon. Abigail has Tiny Squishum's evolution. We're doing something pretty unique with this line, as it's essentially a new version of the Rotom forms. I wanted to explore how early insects were able to spread across the world and adapt to fill every little niche. So basically, this Pokémon is able to hide inside of different held items and use them as shelter that also changes its secondary typing. For instance, when Abigail first threw out the Pokémon, it was using a metal Pokéball as its shelter and became Bug and Steel type. If the Pokémon ever loses its held item by having it taken or throwing it using Fling, it will revert back to its base form, which will help us fill out another unused typing as a Bug and Normal type. And to further justify that Normal typing, instead of just having it be Mono Bug, this design has evolved a big silly mustache and bouncy eyebrows to better entertain humans. It pretty much wants to be more accepted by humans, so it has evolved the Pokemon equivalent of, like, Groucho Marx glasses. Oh, and its little feet also look like teeny sneakers, which also helps with the name. This is Sneakum, the hiding Pokemon. This opportunistic Pokemon may be incredibly small, but it is excellent at adapting to new environments and finding safe places to hide. Sneakum are able to change their secondary typing to better blend into the discarded objects that they seek shelter within. Though shy around other Pokémon, they love people and enjoy dancing and acting silly to make people laugh. Its ability is something new I'm calling Homebody, and that means that normal type attacks and the move Fling change to match the Pokémon's secondary typing. Sneakum's surprising speed and its weird ability put you in a tough spot, but you are able to pull through. Finally, Abigail uses her ace. Alright, time for another evolution. Now, the bug typing is probably the most difficult to add to an Eevee. Like, how do you add insectoid features to a little fox Pokémon and not have it look like a disturbing abomination? I mean, there's a real balancing act between getting bug-like characteristics, but maintaining the established evolution cuteness level. And it was most important to me to maintain the silhouette of the ears, keep a believably Eevee-ish tail, and make it something that you still wanted to snuggle. By curling the antenna around, we still got the ear shape that I wanted, the tail ended up being pretty straightforward, and leaning into the fuzzy bumblebee aesthetic, gave us a wonderfully poofy design. This would evolve from Eevee when it levels up using the Bright Powder held item. Oh, and since I forgot to mention it when we met Loftion, that evolution evolves when it knocks out a flying Pokémon while holding a Floatstone. 
The rest of the existing evolutions are the same, except for I actually wanted to add evolution items for Umbreon, Espeon, and Sylveon, so they can all be evolved using the Dusk Stone, Shiny Stone, and Pink Scarf, respectively. But enough about them, let's take a look at a dex entry. This is Bumbleon, the Snuggle Bug Pokemon. It is not recommended that trainers with seasonal allergies evolve their Eevee into this bug type Pokemon. Bumbleon love to find fields of flowers to roll around in. While their fur is incredibly soft, it is also packed full of pollen. The only thing Bumbleon loves more than flowers is snuggling up with their trainer. Its ability is Shield Dust, so that blocks the added effects of attacks taken. This unique EV evolution takes out much of your team, but you finally managed to knock it out. Nicely done! Bumbleon hasn't had a battle like that in ages. You do understand bug types, so give me your ID badge. If you want to get through that restricted gate leading north, you're going to need two more access codes. Head south and you'll run into Chris, the ground type head researcher. Good luck out there! Before heading to Route 7, you wander around Tritown and spot other forms of Sneakum. It seems that some of the other junky evolution items can serve as homes for the tiny Sneakum. Let's take a look at its other forms. When hiding under a lampshade, Sneakum's booty lights up and it becomes part electric type. Cramming itself inside a box of matches and getting covered in the combustible powder gains it the fire type. Fluttering about with the folding fan gives it the flying type. Propping a potted plant up on its back and peeking out from under the leaves gives it the grass typing. Balancing a mortar and pestle on its back and utilizing the strange chemical concoction inside gives it the poison typing. Resting a crystal ball on its head lets it unlock its psychic type potential. And of course, seeking shelter in a pokeball gives it the steel typing. What do you think of these forms? Let me know your favorite down in the comments below. But in general, being able to easily swap the held item on the fly would make for a very versatile and interesting Pokemon. Oh, and if you have any ideas for other held items that could allow Sneakum to take on other typings, I would love to hear them also. We met a lot of new Pokemon and forms, so be sure to let me know what you think of them and who you would put on your team. The gate to the north is still locked to you, so you set your sights on the head researcher to the south. This is Route 7. The gentle grasslands of Route 6 have faded into barren scrublands and desert. The Pokémon here are hardy and resilient. You observe Simirage, Slothump, and Rhinosi, along with a new species of Pokémon that's running across the desert dunes. You feel as though you've seen it before. Yes, primal form time. We don't have many first stage fossil Pokemon left, and today we'll be tackling Kranidos. This line is based on Pachycephalosaurus, but there have been some discoveries and theories since the original design came out. The biggest one that I want to play off is that young members of this headbutting family did not start off life with their big bulbous heads. Instead, their heads started off much flatter with sharper horns, only to become rounded domes as the animal developed. This process of changing appearance is quite common amongst dinosaurs, and it is likely that some similar but smaller species are actually just juveniles with drastically different skull shapes. And that's a long, rambly way for me to say that Lil Kranidos is getting a head shape similar to a juvenile Pachycephalosaurus or a Draco Rex. Other than flattening the head, repositioning the horns, and tweaking the color palette a little bit, there wasn't much else that I needed to do for this design. It will start out as a pure steel type, and we'll be adding a secondary typing when it evolves be sure to let me know your guesses as to what that secondary type may be. Anyway, here is Primal Cranidos, the Headbutt Pokémon. This correctly restored fossil Pokémon has a flat skull. Primal Cranidos are able to color their hard metallic skull with bright chemicals under their skin. 
They prefer to warn off predators, but will resort to delivering a powerful headbutt if provoked. Its ability is Iron Barbs, and so that's when this Pokemon is hit by a contact move, the attacker loses some HP, because he's, he's got those little spikes on him. You watch the Primal Cranidos run along the dusty dunes while playfully knocking their flat heads together. The heat is really starting to get to you, but luckily, you spot a small oasis ahead. The lush vegetation that has sprung up around it seemed very out of place, and you see a little Pokemon shuffling around in the water. You actually wonder if this oasis and the Pokemon are a mirage, because it is truly bizarre looking. Yes, we're gonna get super weird with this one. This design is based on one of the most perplexing Cambrian fossils. Hallucigenia. Paleontologists initially weren't certain like which way was up and which way was forward on this animal. It seemed to be a random assortment of spikes and noodly appendages. It was initially and incorrectly reconstructed so that it shimmied around on long spiky legs, and that's the body plan that will be the basis of this design. Things will get flipped around when it evolves, but for now, this little derpy Pokemon has spike legs and waving curly tubes on its back. Now, Hallucigenia got its name because it was just so strange that it looked like a hallucination. And we're gonna run with that to get our typing. I figured that a combination of the poison and psychic types best represented the name. It took me a bit of time playing with the colors, eventually landing on something similar to the Slowpoke line, though tweaked slightly. And with that, I give you Hallucip, the confusing Pokemon. Fossils from this perplexing Pokemon have been known for years, but its biology still remained a mystery. Advances in the Paleon region have allowed Hallucip to be restored successfully, but its complete appearance is still quite strange. This Pokemon scurries about in shallow waters, walking forwards and backwards with little preference. And its ability is Poison Point, so contact moves with the Pokemon may poison the attacker. Hallucip scoot around in the water, smiling up at you with goofy blank expressions. You continue through the desert heat until you come across Professor Ginkgo resting under a solitary palm tree. Here. Take some water and let me heal up your Pokémon. Always good to see your advancement. I'm meeting with some researchers ahead. We're going to figure out what needs to be done about Team Ark. Some of us think we need to get them off this nature preserve right away. Maybe you could help with that. But of course, let's see how you and your Pokémon are faring. Ginkgo challenges you to a Pokémon battle. She leads with her starter as always, which you have learned how to counter by now. She uses Primal Omastar next, followed by a Cortulli. Lastly, she brings out Little Rhinoses Evolution. Yes, our little grass rhino Pokemon is going to take on some of the characteristics of a woolly rhinoceros. The little bit of greenery on the back is going to be a flowing coat of leaves. Oh, and woolly rhinos and their relatives also sported massive horns. So this design, of course, has to have that. But we're gonna have even more fun with that horn. If you remember, Rhinosi had a single leaf on its back that it tried to seek shelter under, but it didn't really shield its nose, and Rhinosi ended up with a sunburn. We're gonna let that sunburn worsen with the evolution. The horn will be so sunburnt and will have absorbed so much solar energy that it will gain the fire typing. I'm really happy with this. I mean, I've seen a lot of amazing grass fire designs out there, usually being, you know, like a chili pepper or tiki torches or pumpkins or something like that. But for filling in this unused typing, I'm glad that I found an inn that I hadn't seen before. The colors are, you know, similar to its pre-evolution, but I made sure to give it like a light colored nostril to suggest that the burning fire now exists all the way inside its nose. Oh, and again, I got to have fun with the shiny by pulling in some autumn leaf inspiration. Checking off another unused type combination, here is Rhinoseer, the hot horn Pokemon. 
The sunburned spot on Rhinoce's nose grows into a burning hot horn when it evolves. Rhinoceer try to stay positive but often struggle adapting to their new fire typing. When they are particularly grumpy, they run their itchy horns against trees, leaving long scorched grooves. Rhinoceer's leaves have a waxy coating to protect against their own horn's heat. Its ability is something I'm calling Flame Striker, so making contact with another Pokemon may leave it burned. Rhinoceer's unique typing proves difficult. You are finding that there are fewer Pokemon battles in the Paleon region, but the trainers are far more challenging. You know, perhaps in this the hypothetical game, there could be a difficulty setting, but in general, I love the idea of the Pokemon having wider coverage with their moves and their trainers using more effective tactics. So yeah, Rhinoceer is a toughie, but eventually you are able to defeat Professor Ginkgo. Professor Ginkgo congratulates you and lets you continue towards the end of Route 7. While you're making your way there, let's take a look at how your Pokedex is coming along. This channel is relatively new, but we have certainly been busy. When we go ahead and include the existing evolutions, we filled in a little over half of our decks already. Now that's not to say that we won't be expanding our decks as we continue. The next bonus video isn't a design your ideas video, but another one of those will be coming up soon, so keep an eye out for that. Those extra designs are a fun way to expand things. We're currently sitting in the 130s, but I'm hoping we can hit 150 by the time we end the decks. But continuing on, you've reached the end of Route 7, a large gate leading to Rassy Junction. You take the last few steps into Rassy Junction, and to your surprise, the Pokemon egg that you have been carrying since Route 6 finally hatches. And you know what we really haven't had yet? An intentionally ugly design. A lot of people dislike designs like Trubbish, but you know, I love little Trubbish. So we're gonna have a gloopy and sloppy and ugly little design here. You may be able to tell from the research images that this is based on the evolution of whales. They actually evolved from undulates, which we will reference by it having just two little hoof-like nails on each foot. It took some tweaking to land on the right silhouette. My first pass wasn't bad, but it just wasn't reading cute enough, especially for something that you get from a Pokemon egg. The other main design inspiration, and where it gets its typing from are the layers of mud covering its body. I always love seeing exposed cliffs where you can clearly make out the different sediment layers. So this ugly little whale ancestor will have sedimentary layers kind of built up on its back. Beyond just the goopy mud on its back, I gave it a little mask that looks a little bit like a snorkel mask since although it is going to be mono ground type, it can still swim. All right, let's look at this mess. This is Sedamut, the mud puppy Pokemon. This strange Pokemon coats itself in goopy mud as a form of camouflage and defense. Though weak to water type attacks, Sedamut regularly dive into rivers to retrieve globs of mud from the very bottom. They are quite affectionate towards trainers who can look past their unappealing appearance However, this unfortunately leads to the trainers being covered in mud. Its ability is something I'm calling Slippery, so that raises the Pokémon's speed stat by two stages when it is hit by a Water-type move. And what do you think of this ugly little boy? Is it too goopy for you? Would it be a disappointment when the egg hatched, or would you just give it a hug and get covered in mud anyway? Alright, continuing into Rassy Junction, the buildings here are partially buried by the resentless desert sands. What you can only assume is the ground type head research building is the most buried by sand. But you wonder if that isn't you know, intentional, thematic even. You notice a few researchers meeting in a canopied amphitheater nearby. Among them you notice the fighting, flying, and normal type head researchers along with Professor Ginkgo. Chris the ground-type head researcher is nowhere to be seen, and when you approach Professor Ginkgo, she greets you. Welcome to Rossi Junction. 
We are just waiting on Chris to start our meeting. Will you go check on him in his lab? Heading inside the large area, you do not find Chris. Instead, a nearby researcher explains that Chris is feeling a bit down and is doing some training. They point to a tunnel that leads down into the earth, and they hand you a series of maps and diagrams. Ground type puzzle time. You'll need to find the ground type head researcher somewhere inside a winding subterranean labyrinth. The dug tunnels twist and turn and branch in every direction, and locked gates occasionally block your path. You'll need to reference the different schematics and maps, which you would either carry with you or they'd be repeated on the walls somehow. Anyway, you would need to compare things like wiring schematics with a partial map of the door placements to understand what controls open and close certain doors. It takes some time, and you do run into the occasional ground-type Pokémon and researcher, but you eventually find Chris. You must be one of the professor's new assistants. I just don't know what to do. The others want to confront Team Ark, but that hasn't always worked well for me and my research team. But I suppose you want to challenge me? That will be a good way to take my mind off of things here. Chris seems unsure of himself, but his Pokémon are all too ready for a battle. He leads with Slothump, followed by a Shieldon. These little Pokémon are sturdy, but you take them down. Next, he sends out the evolution to the little Cracked Pot Pokémon Kinsandy. It seems that if you give Kinsandy a Firestone, it is able to evolve into a big round kiln of a Pokémon. We're going to be combining two main ideas. The first, of course, is a kiln. So we're continuing with the process of making pottery. More specifically, the fire that burns in its belly lets it create new pottery shards for it to give to little Kit Sandy. And the second inspiration are Venus or fertility statues. These exaggerated female forms were made by many of the earliest ancient humans. We'll be taking that general silhouette and applying it to this design. Obviously, we will be omitting some of the more uh, voluptuous details since this is a Pokemon, but I was still able to land on something that reads as a Venus statue. What helped the most, I think, was taking the small head on the statue with its, you know, probably braided hair and turn that into the bricked chimney hat. All right, let's take a look at our fire ground type Vilnus, the Kiln Pokemon. This fiery Pokemon creates pottery and small sculptures by ingesting sand and clay. Vilnus care for Kinsandi by providing new pottery for them to use. The fire in their belly burns at over 2,000 degrees. They are incredibly nurturing, but trainers should be careful as their hugs have been known to leave severe burns. And its ability is Flash Fire, so fire type attacks do not deal damage to it, instead they raise the Pokémon's Fire-type attacks. Vilnus is bulky and powerful, but a couple Water-type attacks do make short work of it. Chris then sends out his very own little Setamut. Easy enough to take down, but you are excited to see what that Pokémon may eventually evolve into. Lastly, Chris sends out his Ace. Yep, it is time for another evolution. Now there are a couple different ways you can go with a ground type Eevee. I see a lot of Egyptian looking designs which are pretty cute and I was tempted to go that route since the, you know, archaeological aesthetic feels like it ties in well with the Paleon region. But you know, the Eeveelutions are actually the only designs that should be kind of standalone and not really tied to the region's theming. Oh, and also because there's another idea that I just couldn't not do. Um, I love bunnies, like, a lot. Like, I love rabbits so much, so I couldn't resist having our ground-type evolution be a little dust bunny. I think this works, since the somewhat ambiguous evolution designs could be read as little, you know, fox rabbits. And honestly, the design just fell into place right away. I gave it some thin, wispy bits of fur that trailed dirt behind it, you know, just like a real dust bunny, and ended up with something that looks both soft and dirty at the same time. Oh, and because of that light and fluffy yet 
granulated texture and went ahead and let the shiny be cotton candy or, you know, candy floss colors. Here is our dirty little evolution, Dustion, the Dust Bunny Pokemon. This Pokemon's long, wispy fur is specifically suited to pick up dirt. Though often covered in grime, Dustion enjoy cleaning. They go out of their way to wriggle into small spaces where they might find dust to add to their coats. They shake off massive clouds of dirt if they ever need to make a quick escape. Its ability is Sand Rush, so that doubles the Pokemon's speed during a sandstorm. This little fuzzball is quite fast for a ground type and proves to be a real challenge. Eventually, you do knock it down. Afterwards, you see that your battle has energized the unsure researcher. That battle was just what I needed. We may have lost, but seeing my Pokemon give it their all showed me we should take on Team Arc. First off, give me that ID badge of yours. You follow Chris back through the winding tunnels and emerge outside again. You both join the meeting where everyone has been waiting. We need to do something. Team Arc is constantly causing trouble and stealing the revived Pokemon. That's the spirit. We're not ones to run from a fight. Good to see you've come around, and I suspect my assistant had something to do with it. Well, if you are on board, then it is decided. We will travel south to Creta Cliff and oust Team Arc and their leader from the Paleon region once and for all. It looks like there is a real conflict on the horizon. The other researchers wait for you to be ready, and you all leave for Route 8. Heading towards Creta Cliff, Route 8 crosses a series of bridges between rocky islands. The other experienced researchers are now far ahead of you, and you struggle to keep up. This route is populated by Rhinoseer, Asdazkite, Halusip, Stalactile, Rachnoon, Skergeon, and the extremely rare Fossage. Team Arc grunts are scattered along the path. You're able to sneak by some of them, but others catch you in a battle. It is quite difficult, but you are eventually able to make it all the way to the end of Route 8, where you find Professor Ginkgo waiting. Oh good! You made it! Everyone else is already inside their camp. Here, let me heal your Pokémon. This is going to be a tough battle, but we need to find the Team Arc leader and stop her. Are you ready? Team Arc has a small camp at the edge of Creta Cliff. Their tents and trailers are all set up around a tall lighthouse. The other researchers are busy battling Team Arc grunts all around you, so you're able to slip past much of the action and progress to the base of the lighthouse where two grunts stand guard. Just where do you think you're going? You think you can just see the boss? Not a chance. We'll stop you and the nefarious research you're up to. They pull you into battle against their Nihilusine, Simirage, Plazaro, and Nanoboa. But you defeat them and continue up the lighthouse. Each level of the lighthouse has tricky traps and additional grunts to dispatch of, but you're able to get all the way to the top. A huge collection of mysterious, levitating rocks are floating around the room. Psycad, the Team Arc leader, is surprised to see you and starts collecting the stones and putting them in their bag. Hmm, <laughs> another one of Ginkgo's lackeys trying to ruin my plans. You come into Team Arc's camp, cause all this destruction, and now you want to take me down? Kid, you have no idea what you are doing. I wish I had time to explain, but I need to get out of here before Ginkgo destroys this whole place. Out of my way. She throws out her first Pokemon, as Dazkite. You are able to take care of it pretty easily. Though next, she has a Troazult. It is extremely fast and quite challenging, but you manage to defeat it as well. Next, she uses another of the Galar fossils. Let us see what the water type will be. A lot of you could probably guess that the gargantuan armored fish Dunkleosteus would be the inspiration for this design. I mean, just looking at the existing Galar abominations, there is no doubt that that big old head is exactly the same. So there isn't much to do other than translate it. 
I made sure to get the plate armor on its body, you know, just like the real animal. Though I did exaggerate the belly a bit just to make it look a little goofier and friendlier. But yeah, not a ton to say about this. Other than I'm continuing to pull the shiny colors from the Galar fossil shinies, which they're fun. They're grayscale with little pops of color. Okay, here is Dunklovish, the strong jaw Pokemon. This colossal fish Pokemon was recently revived completely in the Paleon region. Dunklovish have heavy armor plates on their body that th let them ignore most attacks. Though not particularly fast, they can cut through the hulls of ships with their powerful bite. And its ability is, of course, Strong Jaw, and that boosts the power of biting moves. Dunklovish is a tank. Well, I mean, more accurately, it is a, like a submarine, probably, but it takes some serious work to get through its defenses. Alright, next up, Cycad throws out the Dragon-type fossil. We finally get to have a Stegosaurid in here. It is a little bit of a shame that the existing Galar rear of this design doesn't have a Thagomizer, uh, which are, you know, the kind of iconic tail spikes, but the rest of it still reads like a Stegosaurid. In particular, I wanted to pull in the huge shoulder spikes seen on Gigantospinosaurus and Kentrosaurus. The shoulder spikes just, you know, give a little more character instead of just having the back row of plates. Oh, I also did something funny with the head, rounding it into something that's almost a ball. You know, there's always been a thing with calling Stegosaurs dumb, you know, with teeny, tiny, little walnut-sized brains, so I gave it a pea-shaped head since it's a pea brain. Honestly, this was more necessary just to keep the design from looking too much like just a cartoon Kentrosaurus. Oh, and the shiny colors were super fun here because for some reason the dragon fossil's shiny is just super dark. Anyway, here is Drakento, the Spike Plate Pokemon. The front half of this ancient dragon Pokemon was finally recovered in the Paleon region. Drakento are not particularly bright and can be seen in the wild mindlessly eating all vegetation in front of them. They are very gentle but aren't always aware of how dangerous their sharp plates and spikes can be. Its ability is own tempo, and that prevents it from being confused. It has some very pokey defenses to get through, but luckily its dragon typing is no match for your ice types, and Psycad is forced to send out her final Pokémon. Now this fossil part gives us the least amount to work from. I mean, it's really just some snow, a little tail, and a couple flippers. There's a couple different directions I could have gone with this, and maybe I will share with you the beta design, which was a horribly proportioned Mosasaurus, but after throwing that aside, I landed on something that would serve as the ancestor to Lapras. We're gonna tweak the ice and snow on its back so that it hints at the shell that Lapras would eventually get, and plop a little lapras horn on its head too, but to play up the more primal inspiration, we're pulling in the long, exposed teeth of other plesiosaurs, which, you know, also kind of works for the ice typing since they look a little bit like little icicles. And of course, the shiny gets a nice muted color palette. Here is Laparcto, the iceberg Pokemon. Once this ice type Pokemon was correctly restored in the Paleon region, Researchers realized it is the ancestor to Lapras. Laparcto are less willing to ferry people on its back, but once it trusts its trainer, they will gladly take them as far as they wish to go. Trainers are advised to wear snow pants as their ice shells make for a frigid trip. And its ability is then Ice Body, that restores some HP during hail. Laparcto hits hard and takes down much of the rest of your team before you're finally able to knock it out. Psycad stumbles back to the lighthouse railing. No! How could this be? You're just a lowly assistant! If only you knew what was really going on here. There are answers on Route 9. Psycad, enough with your lies! This ends now! Professor Ginkgo and Beth have arrived. Unfortunately, 
Cycad has healed her as Dazkite, and together they leap from the top of the lighthouse and glide away. No! Ah, we were so close. We'll find her. But nice work, kid. I didn't expect you to be able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her. We're gonna clean up this T-Mark camp, but you should meet me back in Ordo Outpost at the Fighting Type Research Building. I'm looking forward to seeing your battle skills firsthand. With the Team Arc camp disbanded, you know that you could use your Pokeride signal to fly back to Ordo Outpost. But you do remember an unexplored route west of Tritown that you now have the time to explore. And maybe Psyched was right. Maybe there is something important there for you to find. You have Loftian take you back, and we'll start in on Route 9. Leaving Tritown, you enter this new route. The desert sands fade into grasslands and then into a sudden dense jungle. Looking through the thick foliage used by Kortoli, Takashuru, Azdazkite, Jerno, and two familiar forms. Time to knock out the final first stage primal form, Little Tyrant. I knew exactly what I wanted to do with this little guy right away. It just had to go fluffy. You know, we know that adult Tyrannosaurus likely lost most or all of their feathers as they grew up, but this little hatchling is gonna be fluffy as heck. And other than the fluff, you know, I did get rid of its fangs just to give it a slightly more bird-like look, you know, while it's small. Color-wise, I could basically do whatever. It's losing its rock typing and will be mono dragon. Uh, I mean, I guess the colors kind of hint at the secondary typing it gets when it evolves. If you have a guess at what that is, let me know in the comments below. I'll confirm if you get it right. Colors came together easy, and of course, the shiny ended up being the normal Tyrant's colors. Okay, this is Primal Tyrant, the Royal Air Pokemon. This correctly restored Pokemon was much fuzzier than researchers were expecting. Primal Tyrant is able to live in a wide range of climates due to its protective feathering. Though they are quite cuddly, they still sport an incredibly fiery temper. When enraged, they sometimes spout steam from their noses. Its ability is fluffy, because it's, it's very fluffy, and that reduces damage from contact moves by 50%, but doubles the damage they take from fire-type attacks. And you can see them stomping angrily through the trees. But they are far too small to intimidate the next Pokémon who crosses your path. Not only did we finish up the first stage designs, but we get to introduce our first fossil evolution. And who needed more love than poor Bastiodon? Nobody, that's who. So let's see if we can make this design just a tad more appealing. First and foremost, the original design strayed a bit too far from its Ceratopsian inspiration, and I want this to be more recognizable at first glance. We're pulling that nose out a bunch and giving it a nice long horn, along with curving the eyebrow horns forward as well. I mean, those changes alone let this read as a real Ceratopsian. You know, it's not really any specific species, it's kind of a mix of like a Taurosaur and a Triceratops, maybe other few things thrown in there, uh, but I think it works. Colors were easy since it's also getting the steel type, so just throwing some grays in there was easy enough. Uh, but let's take a look at Primal Bastiodon, the shield Pokémon. This heavily armored Pokémon has absorbed enough minerals from the earth to harden its horns into steel. Primal Bastiodon are incredibly protective of not only Shieldon, but all small Pokémon. Though quite intimidating, they can still be seen happily playing and rolling around in sand dunes. Its ability is Charger, so taking super effective damage raises its speed greatly. And I'm really happy with this design. Oh, and moving forward, I'm also excited for the rest of the second stage fossil designs as I'll be able to, you know, continue to stretch those designs a little bit further from the base designs. Continuing past this big, bulky Pokémon, the path winds deeper and deeper into the jungle. You often find large, felled trees and eroded boulders blocking the main route, forcing you to explore the small, winding paths to continue west. 
While leaping between boulders to cross a raging river, you spot a glimmer of a man-made structure atop a roaring waterfall. The terrain is unstable, and the Pokémon are particularly aggressive here, but eventually you make your way all the way to the top. The building is abandoned and overgrown with flowing vegetation. It is similar to the other pop-up research buildings around the Paleon region, but it's older. A water wheel still spins before the waterfall's edge, and when you step inside, weak lighting flickers on. Exploring the building's depth, you find useful items and clues that this building is easily a couple decades older than all the other operations in the Paleon region. You hear rustling sounds coming from deeper in the building, and peeking around a corner, you spot your friend Mal leisurely exploring. They spot you, smile, and wave you over. Hey! There you are. I was hoping that you'd be heading down this road too. Can you believe this place? I think it's the original lab for when Professor Ginkgo first arrived in the Paleon region. I was just getting these old computers running again and it looks like there are some recordings from back then. Mal types a bit on a keyboard and a series of corrupted video files begin to play on a large cracked screen. We're all set up here on Paleon Island. It's just the two of us for now, but I am hopeful that once our research begins, we will be able to gain funding for the... Increase our operations. The island is covered in exposed fossils. Yes, but the strange thing is why this whole island is a barren wasteland. Nothing is living or growing anywhere. What must have happened here? I suspect that this island has been deserted ever since ancient times. What? Professor Ginkgo and Saikand used to work together? I can't believe she hasn't mentioned that. It's so strange to think that when they first arrived there was no life anywhere in the Paleon region. I wonder why that is. Hey, looks like there's uh, some more files though. We've discovered something amazing! Found two Holy, unknown, and wonderful. But these legendary Pokemon both seem to in a dormant state. Studying the properties of and the possibility of your life, who knows what else may be, and the possibilities are endless. Well, Professor Genko and Saikad must have discovered something truly extraordinary if it let them breathe new life into all of the Paleon region. That must be how they brought back the fossil Pokemon without any impurities. I'm gonna stay here and see if I can replicate any of their old work, unfortunately. A lot of it is locked by a Pokedex. Mal types a bit on the computer until a red screen stops them. It seems as though progress can only be made by presenting a Pokedex that has registered a certain number of Pokemon. And unfortunately catching Pokemon isn't really my thing. So maybe if you could continue filling up your decks and then just come back from time to time, we'll be able to unlock something truly legendary. Your Pokedex isn't filled enough to help them with the main computer terminal that they're working at just yet. So you wander around the lab and find different cabinets that are also shut with a Pokedex seal. You are able to open some and retrieve some miscellaneous useful items you do come across a research area where three Pokemon eggs are frozen in cryogenic tubes. Some old note explains that these are the initial attempts to revive Cactamo, Fleetwee, and Sailil. A Pokeseal is asking for 30 new Pokemon species to be registered to it for each egg that you wish to take. Realistically, you would need to stop back here multiple times to get all the eggs, but for now, we'll say that you're able to grab all three. You let Mal know that you'll be returning as soon as your Pokedex can get them into the main research computer, and you leave the building to continue west. The route is still difficult to traverse, and your Pokemon are quite exhausted by the time you reach the gate to Ordo Outpost. But before you enter, it seems that your Chippet put in a lot of work and is ready to evolve. Uh, finally, I know that a couple of you have been wondering when Little Chippet would finally evolve, so let's continue the theming of stone tools. 
We're going to have this design showcase the process of striking off bits of stone to create an edge. This is particularly fun as it lends the design to a bit of asymmetry. You don't usually see a ton of that in Pokemon design, so it's nice to have an excuse to try it out. I wanted to have it still feel kind of awkward, so the lopsided arms and pose help communicate that. You may also notice that the rock face has little eyelash lines on it. And I'll let you know that's because when it evolves, it will become a more feminine design. It will become our obligatory waifu mon for the Paleon region. They're usually grass or psychic type, but I thought it would be a fun design challenge to make it part rock type. Anyway, back to this little design. Uh, colors went together well. Uh, and here is Fractip, the shattered Pokemon. This Pokemon has learned how to break off large pieces of its body to leave itself with extremely sharp edges. Fractip are confident fighters, though they must be careful as they are still incredibly brittle. Fractip train regularly in hopes of hardening their weak bodies. Its ability remains sharp armor, so that means that physical attacks lower the defense but greatly increase its attack. Little Fractip is excited to have evolved, and together you head into Ordo Outpost, where you know Beth, the fighting type head researcher, is waiting for you. You arrive in Ordo Outpost again, and you know that Beth, the fighting type head researcher, is waiting for you somewhere inside the massive centrally located building. Let's take a look at what the puzzle will be for our fighting type gym. When you step inside, you are not greeted by any researchers, and instead, you're left to figure out the puzzle without any prompts. You quickly see that the building is separated into a series of hexagonal rooms. And in order to pass to the other side of the building, where you assume Beth is, you'll need to make it through the various rooms. Each room is painted with a fun mural that reflects one of the 18 Pokémon types. Along with that, there are six doors, and in front of each door, there is a training dummy with a sign showing another Pokemon type or two. You can strike a dummy, and if you hit the correct one, its door will open, allowing you to proceed to the next room. But, if you are incorrect, a trap door opens beneath you, and you are whisked back to the start of the gym. It's up to you to conclude that the Pokemon type that is represented by the mural in each room is super effective against one of the training dummies types and that you need to strike that one in order to proceed. And things get a little bit more complicated the further you go as some of the training dummies start having dual types for you to figure out. And of course, you'll run into the occasional wild fighting type Pokemon or researcher that you must battle, but eventually you do make it all the way to the final room where Beth is stretching and readying herself for battle. Took your sweet time, didn't you? I just wanted to thank you again for all your help clearing out that team art camp at Crater Cliff. That psych had his trouble, let me tell ya. Well, I'll let you in on a little secret. She actually used to be Professor Ginkgo's research partner. What? You... you already knew that? Huh. You... you uncovered some of the research at an abandoned lab? Wow. You're a smart one. Well, they came to this island when it was completely devoid of life. They made some type of discovery together that let them not only return vegetation and life to the whole island, but also revive all of the extinct Pokémon. The professor really doesn't like to talk about what happened between them, but Psycad must have tried something pretty despicable to get disbanded from the research program. Enough of the gossip. You came here for a battle, didn't you? Let's see if you can handle my fighting type Pokémon. Beth is a serious combatant and leads with her Takashuru. It is speedy, but you know its tricks by this point. And next, she is forced to bring out her Fractip. After knocking out this rock type, she sends out a new Pokemon. It's time for our headbutting giraffe to evolve. I knew that I wanted a Megaloceros or Irish Elk design, and I kind of stumbled into a connection between Bumpif and this. We're going to have the two large fists that Bumpip sported on its head. We're going to have those open up into a gargantuan hand-shaped rack. I also wanted this design to look as though it could be the common ancestor to the Deerling and Stantler lines. So I pulled in some slight inspiration from them as well. And on the whole, it kind of needed it to be fairly simple to allow it to lead to both of those lines. 
Oh, I didn't mention this when we made Bumpiff, but I was really on the fence about typing since they could pretty easily be normal and fighting type, but in the end I landed on them both being just fighting type since we could really use more monotypes in the Paleon region. Anyway, this is Elocedric, the head hand Pokemon. The heavy antlers on Elocerec's head are swung in a wide arc to keep predators at bay. Though rigid, they can be quite dexterous with their head adornment, and have been seen picking up and throwing annoying Pokémon. Elocerec are protectors of forests and fields, and stomp any injustice they see. Its ability is Mold Breaker, and that lets it use a move regardless of the opposing Pokémon's ability. This regal Pokemon is well-rounded and strong, but you take it down. Next up, Beth sends out another new Pokemon. Something based on Therizinosaurus or Dinochirus has been requested since the start of the series, and I'm happy that we've finally gotten here. I'm really partial to the artistic renders of these animals that have them particularly poofy, especially with their you know big shaggy tails, and I wanted to bring that in. I also messed with the posture a bit, both to mix things up and also to introduce a few more slightly humanoid silhouettes to the decks. On the whole, I'm not a huge fan of people looking designs, but I think this overall shape treads that line successfully. And it's always nice when we can get a few more kind of feminine silhouettes in there too. Now obviously, since Beth is using this Pokemon, it's a fighting type, but I am pulling in the secondary type from the claws, steel type. I felt like it just had to be. They're, the claws are just so gigantic. We're also justifying the fighting type by having the Pokemon use its claws kind of like swords. Think of it like a knight errant or a wandering samurai, keeping the claws tucked away almost like a sheathed sword and attacking only when necessary. Oh, and the shiny is just awesome. No real inspiration, just cool colors. And here is Theraslize. The Blade Pokemon. This Pokemon wields its long metal claws with deadly precision. Theraslies have an innate sense of justice and wander the land seeking to right wrongs. They never lose their cool in battle as they have complete confidence in their composed fighting style. Theraslies' claws have been observed cleaving through all natural material in the Paleon region. And its ability is, of course, tough claws and that increases the power of moves that make contact. It tears through much of your team before you are finally able to knock it out. Beth follows with her ace, fighting evolution time. I was surprised how much trouble I had with this. Honestly, this has been the most difficult evolution to design so far. I've seen some awesome Fakemon designs out there, but they always feel slightly over-designed to me. You know, the karate gis and headbands just feel a little too much, like they would stand out against all the other evolutions. And I don't know if I've mentioned it before, but evolutions need to be clean and simple designs. I mean, all Pokemon designs should be clean and simple, but especially evolutions. But finding a way to evoke the fighting type without adding a bunch of extraneous details was difficult. I mean, what does the fighting type even mean? In the end, I think the pose is doing most of the heavy lifting here. It being crouched down and ready for battle at any time sells the fighting type more than the actual design. Other than that, you know, I threw in some banding that feels like fighters wraps, along with some markings that could be read as scars. The ears gave me the most trouble, as I wanted something that vaguely resembled headband tassels without just being tassels. Um, colors were simple enough, though I had more fun with the shiny. Personality-wise, it feels like this evolution is on the edge of being a dark type, so the shiny colors are a pretty awesome dark type color palette to reflect that. All right, here is Sparion, the scrappy Pokemon. This feisty evolution is always looking for a fight. Sparion are determined to become the best that they can be. They are often a little too headstrong and challenge opponents that they are not ready for. Even when they lose, Sparion study their opponent's moves and learn from their mistakes. 
Trainers must spend extra care to keep this Pokemon from picking unwarranted fights. Not gonna lie, this is probably my least favorite Eeveelution so far, but then again, fighting types tend to be my least favorite designs overall. Be sure to let me know what you think of it down in the comments below. Anywho, Beth pushes you to the limit, but you somehow knock out her Sparion and emerge victorious. In fact, it was such an intense battle that some of your Pokémon are ready to evolve. We've got quite a few to get through, so let's actually start with our Route 1 Flying type. Yes, little as Daz Kite is going to get quite large, and if a Pterosaur is going to be getting big, well, we better use an Asdarkid as the inspiration. More specifically, this will be based on Quetzalcoatlus. The most fun thing about the overall shape is that Asdarkids had just ridiculously large heads and necks, to the point where you're like, hey, paleontologists, are you, like, really certain that this thing could fly? So, yes, our design gets a great big old noggin. Because of this, the silhouette on its own could pretty easily read as though it were a much smaller or even like a baby Pokemon, but a couple of things can be done to help counteract this. One, small eyes. Just making the eyes smaller really helps with the overall scale of the creature. I've ranted about this before and that there are some designs like Dragonair that just don't follow this guideline particularly well, but we will be using that here. And two, just the, the level of complexity. Generally, the smaller the Pokemon, the less detail it has in its design. So, I mean, we don't want to go overboard, but I'm going to incorporate a good number of elements. As far as the pose goes, we're going to be going from Asdazkite's flying pose to this grounded one as a reference to real Asdarkids being incredibly effective hunters on the ground. Oh, and lastly, we are continuing with the Benjamin Franklin key and the kite experiment by giving this design's tail a couple ridges that make it look like a key. Uh, colors are just a slight update on the earlier stages of the line. Oh, and I usually don't bring it up, but this is one of the Pokemon names that I'm really happy with. It just works really well on a bunch of levels. All right, this is Quetzal Key, the lightning Pokemon. This massive flying Pokemon seeks out thunderstorms to collect lightning with its long tail. It is able to tame storms or unleash lightning whenever it pleases. Remarkably, it is just as agile on the ground as it is in the skies, and its ability stays lightning rod, so that makes it draw in those moves and get boosted because of it. You're pretty pumped to have this massive flying type on your team, but let's see how your starters are doing. First up, is the water type. Sliscale is evolving and everybody was pretty certain what was coming. Yes, Spinosaurus time. But to be precise, this is based on the more accurate modern reconstructions of the Spinosaurus. So that means it gets that big paddle tail, the little jog in its sail, shorter limbs, and of course, you know, referenced by this Pokemon's primary typing, it was a very successful predator in the water. Now, all of these starters are getting a secondary typing in their final form, and a few of you actually guessed that our big Spino would be gaining the dragon typing. You know, it's actually pretty easy to justify the dragon typing on almost any dinosaur design, but this one felt particularly appropriate. Now, of course, because this is a Pokemon, I did end up exaggerating the proportions a bit, which gave us these large arms and claws, Oh, and for the overall pose, I did want those hands to be on the ground, just to reference that the real Spinosaurus probably could have run short stints in a bipedal stance, but that in general they more likely lazily moved on land in a partially quadrupedal stance. I knew the colors right away, uh, but getting the place was took a little bit of juggling. And here is Spinozar, the sail Pokemon. This incredibly territorial Pokemon tears through anyone who gets too close with its massive claws. Spinozar are able to move through the water with ease, but are fairly clumsy on land. They are very difficult to tame, but will form an unbreakable bond with any trainer determined enough to befriend them. Because of this, Spinozar should always be approached respectfully. Its ability 
is aggression. So that boosts its dark type attacks and essentially gives it another stab. And it's a, it's a real meanie. Uh, if you picked Grumpy Little Sailil at the beginning, be sure to let me know what you think of the final design down in the comments. Next up, let's take a look at the grass line. Yes, it's Cactolage's turn to grow up. I wanted this line to stay pretty adorable through and through, so this was mostly about balancing the complexity of an ankylosaur with a relatively clean and cute design. Also, I know that I just made a big deal about Spinozar's pose, accurately reflecting the Spinosaurus's actual stance, but we're gonna be a lot more loose with this starter. It's just that getting it up on its hind legs allows for a much more friendly posture, and allows me to pose the hands with a bit more personality. I actually don't think anyone guessed its secondary typing, uh, but the barbs on our cactus along with this armor-like plating are gonna give this final evolution the steel type, which is particularly fun as the cactus theming allows me to create a really good and thematic signature ability. Past that, you know, it was just tweaking the design to land on just the right amount of detail, I mean, I think it would feel a lot more busy if it weren't for the cute and chill personality that comes through still. The colors were, you know, relatively straightforward, though I did waffle a bit and almost switched the shiny and base colors. They're just, I like them both a lot. But here is Ankylotus, the flowering Pokemon. This gentle Pokemon keeps predators at bay with its armor plating and massive steel thorns. Ankylotus still enjoy hiding in plain sight by hunkering down and holding their large tails in the air to appear like a desert cactus. They enjoy having their bellies rubbed, but sometimes need help getting off their backs afterward. Its ability, something I'm calling Desert Adapted, and that basically makes it immune to fire type attacks. This grass type has become a real tank, especially after losing that fire weakness, but if you chose cute little Cactamo at the beginning, be sure to let me know what you think of this friendly behemoth. But let's go ahead and take a look at the last starter. Everyone knew that we were going to get a raptor, and here we are. And I know that a couple of you are particularly fond of the featherless raptors seen in the Jurassic series, but we are going to be going with something a little bit more scientifically accurate. If you do like your raptors naked, I will have a good surprise for you later in the series, but for now, get ready for some feathers. A bit of ornamentation on the head does quickly give away its new secondary typing. Our raptor is going to be so speedy that it's gaining the electric type. I've been wanting another fire electric type for a really long time, and this felt like a great fit. You may also see that I did tweak the placement of the raptor's iconic sickle claw. Just to mix things up, I decided to put it on the hand instead. Again, if you like the classic Jurassic raptor, you'll get that foot claw later in the series. Now, with all the feathers and whatnot, it took me a lot of time to get things to kind of flow together nicely. The tail in particular was rough. I mean, I wanted to work in some lightning bolt imagery, while still preserving the gradual fan of feathers that most dromaeosaurs likely had at the end of their tails. Colors, also a little tricky with all the details, but we ended up with something pretty awesome, and the shiny is also just as cool. Alright, here is Flytor, the Quick Claw Pokemon. The extreme speeds that this Pokemon reaches allows it not only to generate intense heat, but also massive stores of electrical charge. Flyter are incredibly intelligent and know when to either flee from a battle and quickly run and attack from behind. They attack with sharp sickle claws on their winged arms, but are also quite dexterous and have been observed opening doors. Its ability is something new, Plasma Burst, and that means if it's ever hit by a fire or electric type attack, that boosts both its attack and special attack. And here's our speedy little glass cannon. You'll have to let me know if you picked Fleetwee what you think of its final evolution, but I'm really happy with all three of these. They feel cohesive, and they still represent that initial theming of the fight, flight, or freeze survival instincts. Oh, and I'm excited because in the next episode, we'll get to see some variants for the starters. 
Yes, yes. We're actually going to do new forms within the same region that they're introduced. Yeah, it's very cool. I think you'll enjoy them. But uh, back to the gym. You just beat Beth, the fighting type head researcher, and she steps up and congratulates you. Nice work. I was certain I was going to beat you, but you really pulled through. You're proving to be a great Pokemon trainer. Congratulations on evolving your Pokemon. I want to give you a couple things. Take this Pokeride signal. This will allow you to smash through any damaged obstacles. And secondly, it's my pleasure to add another access code to your ID badge. Oh, oh another Pokeride signal. And there is, of course, sure to be a spot where you can use that coming up quickly. You thank Beth and decide to head north and stop into Salur City again. Your new access code lets you purchase additional items at the Evolution Research Building. You pick up some odds and ends, but your frack tip seems particularly interested in the black belt item you just bought. You give it to your feisty little rock type, and it happily evolves. Yes, we are not done. There is one more evolution to take care of. Our sharp and irregular rock type frack tip is going to be turning into the obligatory humanoid feminine waifu mon of the Paleon region. This design wasn't originally going to be like this. In fact, one day I will share with you the beta design for this Pokemon. It is so bad. It was probably the worst initial design that I did. So I scrapped it completely. And as I was thinking about the redesign, I realized, yes, we don't have anything that fills the waifu mon trope. And I took this on as a challenge. The easy first step is just figuring out a feminine silhouette that works, and these sharp legs and hips pretty much do that job on their own. Because of the stone tool theming of the line, and the fact that I didn't want our waifu mon to be a sweet pushover, our design is going to get some literally killer obsidian blade arms. Thematically, little frack tip is taking the black belt evolution item and using it to bind together its sharp fragments. So that also lets me pull in some ninja-like wrapped elements. Oh, and, and hair. I wasn't sure how I would get believable flowing hair from a rock type, but the wrapped fabric worked itself into a ponytail surprisingly well. It took some fussing, but we ended up with a dark and edgy color palette. Get it? Edgy because the... All right. Here is Bledger, the Blade Pokemon. This Pokemon has overcome its brittle stone body by reinforcing it with tightly wrapped bandages. They are quite agile and can run circles around most other rock-type Pokemon. Bledger have honed their arms into blades sharp enough to cut through solid steel with ease. And its ability remains sharp armor, so that means that when it's hit, defense drops, attack goes way up. It's pretty formidable, if I do say so myself. Oh, and I'm also glad that I finally got the fighting type into the line that's, you know, based on weapons. But there were a lot of evolutions for one episode, so you'll have to let me know down in the comments which of these designs is your favorite. In fact, with all these new Pokemon added to your Pokedex, you will now be able to travel back and help Mal at the abandoned laboratory. You do a little bit of backtracking and leave Ordo Outpost through the gates to the east and walk into the jungles of Route 9. You leave Ordo Outpost and begin trekking through the dense jungles of Route 9 again. With the Pokey Ride that you got from Beth, you are able to break through some of the more frustrating barriers along the path and take a more direct route back to the abandoned lab. As you approach the front door, you hear faint cracking coming from your bag. Ah, it seems that the three eggs that you got from this lab earlier are now hatching. Let's take a look at Professor Ginkgo's initial attempts to revive the starter Pokemons of the Paleon region. Now we've got a really fun design concept to play with for these new forms. We're going to be pulling directly from the often less than scientifically accurate dinosaurs of the Jurassic series for these. So, if anyone out there is familiar with the Netflix show Camp Cretaceous, our Cactamo line is going to be based on the Ankylosaurus Bumpy. Bumpy also works extremely well as these designs are going to start off looking slightly underdeveloped and a little off, 
And that's Bumpy's whole thing. She hatched with lopsided horns on her head. And part of being underdeveloped means that these starters are going to be tiny. In fact, I want their proportions to read more like baby Pokemon than starters. Oh, and of course, they're getting new types. I wanted to use Bumpy's nice and vibrant colors, which work well enough for its new typing. Uh, and here is our first little ball of cuteness. This is Spliced Cactamo. The two cute Pokemon. The DNA from a number of fairy type Pokemon were used to fill in the gaps of the incomplete Cactamo fossil during the revival process. This variant is too friendly for its own good, and they have difficulty recognizing dangerous situations. They cannot survive alone in the wild. Splice Cactamo's horns grow in a lopsided manner, which some find off-putting and others find endearing. Its ability is unaware, so that lets it ignore any stat changes. And it's pretty adorable, right? Let's take a look at what Fleetwee's other form will be. Uh, right off the bat, we can say bye-bye to the feathers. In fact, our raptor is going to pull elements from the scene in the original Jurassic Park where Hammond holds the raptor egg as it's hatching. We'll actually leave some of those bits of eggshell on our scrawny little raptor as well. Losing the beak and tweaking the head shape does make this design feel pretty far from the original Fleetwee, but I like where this line is headed, so I'm just going to roll with it. I was initially going to pull the color palette from that hatching Jurassic Raptor, but I ended up landing on these cool purples and blues instead. This just, it leads into the rest of the evolutions better and works with its new typing. Uh, oh, and I should have said, all of their new typings are parts of the original's personalities, but they're just more pronounced here. So Cactamo was super cute, and now it's got the fairy typing. And here, Fleetwee's line was incredibly intelligent, so we end up with a psychic type. All right, here is Spliced Fleetwee, the hatchling Pokemon. The DNA from a number of psychic type Pokemon were used to fill in the gaps of the incomplete Fleetwee fossil during the revival process. This variant is incredibly intelligent, though its tiny body and muscles aren't able to accomplish much yet. Splice Fleetwee recognize their own defenseless nature and stick on pieces of their eggshells to serve as weak armor. Its ability is Sticky Hold, since it just hatched and it's all sticky, and that prevents items from being taken or switched. It's pretty goofy and kind of ugly in an adorable way, but I'm a fan. Uh, alrighty, let's see what our new Sailil will be. Again, new proportions. So its big head has somehow gotten even bigger. I wanted it to feel like this little Pokemon could throw a tantrum and risk just toppling over due to the size of its head. Inspiration-wise, we're still going to eventually get to the Spinosaurus, but we'll be heading that way by the way of a Baryonyx. Now, a Baryonyx design could very easily still be the water typing, but of course, we need to mix things up. So the original lines were aggressive, and we're going to take that and translate it into the dark type. That also means that with my updated type chart, these new starters will still make a nice triangle. Cactamo's fairy type hits Sailil's dark. That dark hits Fleetwee's psychic type, and though it's a little divisive, Fleetwee's psychic type hits Cactamo's fairy typing. Oh, and little Sailil here will actually start out with its secondary typing, to better illustrate how kind of unstable these spliced forms are, they're going to be getting their original line secondary typing, but they'll all show up at different times. So, the angry little guy actually starts with its dragon typing already. Alright, here is Spliced Sailil, the fussy Pokemon. The DNA from a number of dark type Pokemon were used to fill in the gaps of the incomplete Sailil fossil during the revival process. This variant is always in a terrible mood. It stomps about in a rage at all times and screams when it does not get what it wants right away. This grumpy Pokemon is incredibly difficult to train and requires constant feeding and praise. Its ability is actually Anger Point. So, its attack stat is raised to the max if it's ever hit by a critical attack. 
Uh, and be sure to let me know what you think of these strange and underdeveloped starters down in the comments below. These three adorable Pokemon, they follow you into the abandoned lab where you find Mal still trying to access the computers. You're back. And it seems that you've hatched the eggs. Very interesting. It seems they've not been able to accurately revive fossils yet when they were working on these three. But they don't have the usual rock type impurities. From the little bit that I have been able to uncover, it seems that they were able to fill in the missing DNA sequences by using a bunch of other Pokemon species to fill in the gaps. It's certainly not an accurate restoration, but you have to admit that they're quite adorable. It, oh yeah, is your Pokedex filled out enough to help me with this? Here, uh, just uh, scan it in. You scan your Pokedex at the main computer and access is granted. A corrupted program labeled E150 begins to run, but it soon stalls out. It seems that it requires Pokedex entries from a handful of specific Pokemon to complete its task. You have most of the required entries already, but you do see that you'll need each of the fully evolved spliced starters. The program is so corrupted, it's really hard to tell exactly what this is trying to do but I hope you're up to the task of helping me figure out what it is. Get me the dex entries for uh, these missing Pokemon. I really feel like we've got something legendary on our hands. You agree to continue helping Mal and leave them in the abandoned lab to continue your adventure. You look at your little level one spliced starters standing in the dark jungles of Route 9 and figure you better level them up somewhere a little bit more appropriate. You call out your trusty Loftion with the Pokey Ride and leisurely float back to Route 1. You have a wonderful trek back along the first few routes, letting your little starters slowly get stronger until they are finally ready to evolve. Ah yes, let's go ahead and knock out the second stages. First up, Cacto Lodge. No big surprise here, it just looks even more like Bumpy, and if you know Camp Cretaceous, you know there is nothing wrong with a little bit more Baby Bumpy. In fact, I want this design to be as cute as possible, so in the same way that the previous stage was underdeveloped, this design kind of sits in that area between a starter's first and second stage. Also, because it now has so much more Ankylosaurus plating, it's gonna get that secondary steel type right away. Colors, just coming from the almighty Bumpy. Oh, and though I am sure you noticed the shiny colors are just the normal starters colors. All right, here is Spliced Cactolage, the Bumpy Pokemon. For some unknown reason, Spliced Cactolage expresses its steel typing earlier than the completely restored line. Their strong defenses offset the fact that they still view literally everyone and everything as a friend. Some of their misplaced DNA must be canine, as they love to play fetch and lick their trainer's faces. And its ability is Iron Barbs, and that just damages people who attack it. I can definitely see this little guy running around just like a clumsy puppy. Alright, um, let's see what our psychic type Fleetwee becomes. Uh, no feathers again, and we've got another adorable reference to use. Baby Blue and Beta are some pretty darn adorable designs from the Jurassic series. Arguably, they are horribly inaccurate. They've just got... I mean, they're just tiny versions of the adults with big chunky muzzles and everything, uh, but I digress. It does make for a cute design here. I know that we're definitely treading the that's just a cartoony version of the reference animal territory, but in the end, that's kind of what these splice forms are about. Uh, luckily, the Jurassic Raptors have this fun blue color palette to work with, which helps it feel more Pokemon-y. Here is Spliced Ovanish, the clever Pokemon. Even after evolving, Spliced Ovanish still lack the distinct feathers of their complete form. Their intelligence continues to grow, and they are able to devise complex plans and coordinate other Pokémon. They are quite mischievous, and trainers must work very hard to keep them out of trouble. 
But once bonded, they are incredibly loyal. Its ability is Infiltrator, and that ignores effects like Reflect, Light Screen, Safeguard, uh, and that's that's the raptoriness of you know, striking from the sides. I'm also enjoying how, even though this one has almost exactly the same pose and proportions as the original Vanish, it just feels so different without the feathers. But let's take a look at our Dark Dragon Sliss Scale. So, this one is a little bit more difficult. The other lines have a baby and adult versions to pull from for inspiration, but we just know that we want this to end up looking like the Jurassic Park 3 Spinosaurus, but how we get there is a little bit more nebulous. So we're going to continue with some of the vague Baryonyx inspirations, but I definitely let things be a little looser here. More, more of that general Pokemon feel. Honestly, it's just more about bridging to the Spinosaurus and building some anticipation for that final design. All right, here is Spliced Sliscale, the hunched Pokemon. This spliced variant has only the slightest indication of the massive sail that the complete Sliscale sports on its back. These Pokemon continue to be in a perpetually foul mood. Spliced Sliscale are quick to anger and prove to be one of the most difficult Pokemon to train in the Paleon region. Its ability is Unnerve, since they're so intimidating, and that makes the foe nervous and unable to eat berries. Alrighty, your new splice forms are coming along nicely, but they still have a ways to go before we'll get to the final stages. But you're feeling a little bit better about bringing these three with you onto the more difficult routes ahead. You recall a restricted gate labeled with a 6 on the north side of Tritown. This is Route 10. There is some geothermal activity in the area as powerful geysers erupt around you. You see multiple Pokemon enjoying the natural hot springs. Sedamut, Plazaro, Theraslice, Resonidal, and Drakento. They all look pretty tough, and you eventually make it to the entrance of a cave. Stepping into Plyo Cave, is like stepping into a sauna. The geothermal activity continues. Pools of cave water bubble around you, and colorful metal deposits paint the walls. You keep an eye out for Pokemon and spot Kinsandy, Sedamut, Nanoboa, Trozult, and a bizarre new species flying through the air. There is a prehistoric shark that we needed to do. Helicoprion. If you've never heard of this thing, all you need to know is all we really have are these fossils of its teeth in this spiral configuration. It's very weird. Um, and there's a few different reconstructions of its jaw, but you end up with something just really wacky looking. We're going to be working off of that jaw to get its two typings. Firstly, focusing on the teeth. They almost feel like a saw blade, so we're going to bring in the steel type. And then, the swirling nature of the jaw also made me think of like a hypnotism swirl, which we're going to put into the eye and then give it the psychic type as well. That psychic type also means that we can pretty easily give this thing levitate. So, just like Cortulli, it can swim through the air. I always think it's fun to have a Pokemon based on an aquatic creature that doesn't actually have to have the water type. Anyway, this design came together really easily. I knew that I wanted this thing to feel, you know, sharp and angular, and the rest just fell into place. Alright, this is Whirlicon, the Steely Stare Pokemon. This Pokemon's fossilized jaw perplexed scientists for decades. That uncertainty hindered the revival process until the advancements made in the Paleon region. Whirlicon zipped through the air, hypnotizing others with their swirling eyes. Only when their prey is incapacitated do they swoop in and attack with their extended jaw. And, like I said before, its ability is levitate. You see them zipping and zagging through the air and splashing into various bubbling pools. After battling through the wild Pokemon and exploring the cave, you find some unique items uh, Stardust and Big Nuggets will sell for a great deal when you finally make it back to a Pokebeacon. You also find a Poison Orb. 
Your primal Meowth seems fixated on its purple gleam, and so you decide to give the cold little feline the item. Unsurprisingly, it becomes poisoned. But it also miraculously evolves! Ah uh, yes, we're finally getting to our primal Persian, and we just have to do a saber-toothed cat. I thought about doing a new evolution, kind of like Berserker, but I felt like Persian deserved a little better after Alolan Persian. So, I went ahead and beefed up Persian's proportions just a bit and gave it a bob tail as well. It is getting a bit of a mane, just to continue with that ice type aesthetic. Oh, and we're bringing in some icy fangs, of course. But the more interesting element is its new secondary typing. Yes, this fills another unused type combination with poison and ice. The reasoning is in the dex entry, so I'll save that. But, you know, a cool new look and a unique typing is just the love that Persian needed. Oh, and I went ahead and used the normal Persian colors for the shiny, and it also turned out really well. Uh, okay, here is Primal Persian, the classy cat Pokemon. This fierce Pokémon struggled to stay warm as a primal Meowth, but they have learned to embrace its ice typing and weaponized the cold-induced sickness in its body. They are extremely protective of primal Meowth and can often be seen curled around them to keep them warm. Its ability is Strong Jaw, since it's a saber-toothed animal, and that boosts the power of biting moves. You also feel much better now that your Pokemon is no longer shivering all of the time. Continuing deeper into the cave, you wind this way and that, and you do discover an access gate labeled with a large 16. It will certainly be a while before you're able to open that, but you make a mental note to return eventually. The geothermal activity begins to die down, and you soon see the cave exit up ahead. Snow blows outside, but a silhouetted figure steps before you. There you are. I was wondering when you'd catch up to me. While you were off exploring the action at Credit Cliff, I was able to catch up and surpass you. Don't believe me? Grant leads with his starter, which you are happy to see is also fully evolved. It's still no match for your Pokemon though, as you have the advantage. After that, you have to deal with Espeon, and then Jolteon, and then Sylveon. Yes, it seems that Grant has been visiting the Evolution Research Building in Salur City quite a bit. Finally, he sends out his newest EV evolution. I was really unsure how I would do a normal type evolution without it just looking like a slightly larger EV. In the end, there's a concept that I've seen a bunch of other artists riff off of, and that is giving it some type of hint that it's connected to all of the other types. I landed on giving it gems in its neck ruff. Oh, and of course the biggest tweak to help keep it looking like a big Eevee is just changing the color palette a little. Though I did, of course, make the shiny the regular Eevee colors. Oh, and I always forget to mention the evolution methods, but this is one of my favorites. Uh, your Eevee will need to knock out a Pokemon of every single type and then use a normal gem in battle. It's a lot of work, but I really wanted the normal type Eevee to feel special. Also, especially with its new ability, it is legitimately like a really good Pokemon, so you need to work for it. But let's take a look at Eeveon, the shifting Pokemon. This unique evolution is incredibly well attuned to all of the different Pokemon types and is able to change its type at will. The gems nestled in Eevee's mane are crystallized infinity energy that it taps into to change its type. Though they are skilled in battle, they more often than not prefer to curl up and nap on their trainer's lap, and its ability is Protean. So if you don't know that ability, it's awesome. It'll let Evian change its type to whatever move it used. Yes, Evian's ability makes it particularly unpredictable, but eventually you do manage to knock it out and win the battle. 
Grant promises to work even harder with his Pokemon and reaffirms that he will still beat you to the mysterious research station in the center of Paleon Bay. He runs out of the cave and onto the rest of Route 10. Outside of the geothermal caves, the remainder of the route is much colder. You can make out Pokemon moving in the blowing snow, Chippet and Fractip roll themselves down snowdrifts, while Primal Persian is on the prowl. A towering silhouette emerges from the snow. And before we get to it, we're actually going to revisit a previous design. I generally don't plan on doing that many redesigns, but let's take a look at a quick change for Primal Amara. So because of a tweak that I will be making to Aurorus, Little Amara is switching from pure fairy type to an electric type instead. I know I made a big fuss about wanting this line to have the fairy typing, but the type combination that we're going to be ending up with is so good that I'm just going to have to be okay with losing the fairy type. So yeah, Little Amara's design is essentially the same other than a slight color palette swap and some changed verbiage on its dex entry. It is now the Static Field Pokémon. This cute Pokémon wiggles its long horns when it gets excited. Primal Amora's horns are used to help it navigate by sensing electromagnetic fields. They are unable to become lost due to this sense. Primal Amara are often picked on by Tyrant in the wild, and will resort to surprisingly strong static shocks if provoked. And its ability remains cute charmed. I like that it's just as a wink that it kind of maybe should still be fairy type. But enough of that, let's take a look at what Primal Aurorus will be. So. Obviously, we're going to continue with the original inspiration, which is the Amargosaurus. I was looking into it to see what the recent consensus on its spines were, you know, within the paleontological community, but it looks like the sales are still correct. There were some studies put out that suggested that the spines could have been covered by, uh, like, keratin sheaths, essentially turning them into, like, a bunch of thin horns along the back of their necks and with no sail structure at all, but it's looking like that is not correct. Oh, but it's also likely that the sail was not a particularly like fleshy hump, like some had theorized, so I wanted to make sure that in this redesign, you were still able to see the individual spines. Also, instead of the flowing ribbon of the original, this will have a more rigid or frigid uh, sail made out of ice. Uh, that, you know, kind of grows on its back. And of course, that gives us our typing of electric ice. This just made the most sense for a Pokemon inspired by the Aurora phenomena. Electric because, well, you know, they're caused by the Earth's electromagnetic field, and ice because they're most commonly observed closer to the poles. I actually lived in Alaska for a few years and got the opportunity to see the Aurora Borealis for myself, and it's unbelievable, like just bananas. So anyway, I'm pretty happy with getting this fairly unique type in there. This is Primal Aurorus, the twin sail Pokemon. This gentle giant comes to the aid of any Pokemon or person in need. They often lift smaller Pokemon off of the ground with their dexterous tails and place them between their two icy sails for protection. They can cause their ice to illuminate with a rainbow of colors by charging it with electricity. In the wild, only Tyrantrum dares hunt this titan. Its ability is Radiant Sparkle. So that means when it's hit by a contact move, there is a 25% chance it'll confuse the attacker. Primal Aurorus lumbers through the snow and causes its icy sails to pulsate with color to say hello as it passes by. You do spot a much smaller Pokemon that darts between the mighty Aurorus's feet. It's incredibly fast, but you squint against the snow and sun to get a good look at this tiny Pokemon scurrying atop the snow. Time for another ice type. I'll let you know that this design has some slight inspirations, but that it's mainly a transitional design to get to its second stage. But there was an arboreal reptile called Avacranium that used a clawed and likely prehensile tail to climb trees, and I wanted to riff off of that. Also, because of the snowy environment, 
I'm bringing in some elements of the Jesus Lizard, which runs normally on water, to let this little guy run on top of snow and give it a fun, active pose. We're also gonna add some little ice crystals on its back, though these come more into play once it evolves. If you have, you know, a guess as to what it'll evolve into, you just let me know down in the comments below. The colors were easy to find, something nice and icy, though I did make sure that the shiny had some warmer greens to hint that the fact that the actual avicranium likely lived in a much warmer climate. All right, here is Guanice. The Snow Sprinter Pokemon. This speedy Pokemon can be seen running atop even the lightest of fresh snow. Guanice also use their sharp tail to aid in climbing vertical walls of ice. If a predator ever begins to catch up to them, they will resort to diving headfirst into the snow and digging their way to safety. Guanice are skittish, and trainers will need to be very patient to earn their trust. Its ability is Slush Rush, and that means the Pokemon's speed is boosted in a hailstorm. But yeah, Guanice is pretty cute, and you see them skittering around on top of the snow all around you. As you climb up the mountain, you do come across a construction site. Some friendly workers are putting the last touches on a massive hotel and arena. Apparently, some wealthy individuals from outside the region have funded their own scenic hotel to visit the Palean region. It is sure to be finished soon, so you'll have to come back and challenge some of the trainers who visit. Well, just, you know, we just, you know, had to squeeze in a battle frontier setup into the region somehow, and, you know, we can easily say that good old Professor Ginkgo couldn't say no to some additional funding from a wealthy benefactor if all she had to do was let them build a hotel and battle facility. Oh, and uh, speaking of Professor Ginkgo, I'll let you know that I'll be marrying her here in a few days. I usually try and I'll let you know, read and respond to comments right away, but if there is a delay this time, just know that we are in that last mad dash before the wedding. Um, but enough about me. You continue trekking through the snow. You're feeling quite cold as you near the summit. Your teeth are chattering loudly. But a song on the wind lifts your spirits and gives you the motivation to carry on. You look around for the source of the pleasant tune and spot a new Pokemon. All right, if you remember back when we did the Hellfoof fairy line, I had mentioned that I already had a Nurse Joy Pokemon in mind for the Paleon region, and this is it. This is our musical Parasaurolophus. Parasaurolophus, is, is that how you say it? For the longest time, I used to say Parasaurolophus, but I think that's wrong. So yeah, Parasaurolophus. Oh, and we're going to be running with the calls that these hadrosaurs likely made using their resonating chambers and their ornate crests. In particular, we're bringing in brass instruments like the trombone and trumpet. Oh, and the body shape of Parasaurolophus always reminded me a bit of like an ocarina as well. So we're going to pull in some inspiration from that too. We're going to make it so that the tail and like some of the body are hollow with holes to let air out so that much like a real wind instrument, this Pokemon can play different notes by covering different holes along its tail and knees or, you know, head crests. So just imagine that while it's playing music, it is just like smacking itself all over, almost like a ham bone dance. In the end, it ended up nice and musical, you know, instrument head, holes making the shape of notes and even lines on its belly like sheet music. Uh, oh, and of course, the shiny just had to be golden so that it could look even more like a brass instrument. This is Hadratoot, the trumpet Pokemon. Fossilized remains from this ancient Pokemon have been played as instruments. It wasn't until Hadratoot was revived that researchers realized that it uses its mostly hollow body as a resonating chamber. They love to cheer up others with their uplifting music. Recently, they have been observed moving in herds and playing epic orchestral arrangements. Its ability is Pixelate, so that takes normal type moves and makes them do fairy type damage and increases their power by 20%. And that's mainly just so that this can use all of those normal type sound moves and they'll do fairy type damage. The Hadratoot's jolly demeanor urges you to the top of Mount Paleo. 
where you find a resilient settlement. You look around, but nobody is in sight. Something feels off. You peek your head into some of the smaller buildings here at the top of Mount Paleo. You see freshly poured cups of coffee, still steaming, but no researchers are in sight. Listening closer, you can hear muffled talking coming from the largest building at the very peak of the mountain. Climbing up there, you find Grant peering into the building through a window. Oh, it's you. I was worried you were another Team Arc member. It looks like all the researchers were captured by the remaining Team Arc grunts. Grant follows your lead as you sneak into the research building. Yes, it is time for our ice gym. The inside is a winding labyrinth of ice tunnels. There are quite a few icy slopes that you are forced to slide down without the ability to climb back up. These one-way paths make for a tough journey through the various frozen paths. Grant also joins you in double battles against Team Arc Grunts who attack you with Nylacene, Simi Rage, Fractip, Plazaro, and a new sinister Pokemon. Oh yes, we're going to be knocking out yet another unused Pokemon type combination by giving our little bug type Kabutops the dark type as well. On the whole, this design is about making Kabutops even more intimidating and aggressive looking. It's, you know, continuing to be based on Trilobites, just like the normal Kabutops, but I'm also pulling in some inspiration from the Kabutops skeleton sprite, especially in like around the eyes. Oh, and the pose is tweaked slightly to show off even more scythe-like arms. Yeah, gosh, I mean, there's not a ton to say about this design. It just ended up looking like an even more kick-butt version of the original. You know, uh, dark, sleek color palette again. Uh, and of course, the shiny is just the normal Kabutops colors. Here is Primal Kabutops, the deadly bug Pokemon. Primal Kabuto, who have grown tired of taking hits on their tough shells, evolve into this aggressive dark type Pokemon. Primal Kabutops are focused on defeating any opponent and will attack wildly if provoked even slightly. A trainer who befriends it will find a fierce and loyal guard and its ability remains Swift Swim. I wanted to, you know, give a nod to the fact that it is still based on an aquatic animal, and that doubles the Pokemon's speed in the rain. Primal Kabutops is a tough addition to have to face off against, but eventually you take out the remaining Team Arc Grunts and make it to the main arena, where Psycad is talking to a group of tied-up researchers. You don't understand at all. You follow Professor Ginkgo so blindly, you're not able to see what I am trying to accomplish. Oh no, her assistants? Team Ark, get them. Team Ark? Of course you've defeated my followers. I don't have time for this. You'll never stop my vision. Psycad escapes down a winding ice tunnel while you free the researchers from their bindings. Mark, the ice type head researcher, shakes off his ropes and thanks you. Oh, well played, you two. That bag of hot air was just about to launch into a series of ridiculous lies about Professor Ginkgo and our research. And I don't think we would have survived that. <laughs> it's a shame she got away, but it really seems like you took out the very last of the Team Arc grunts. Now all we need to do is track down Psycad and get her off this island for good. But first thing is first, let me heal your Pokémon, because you're gonna need to prove yourselves against me in my Ice types if you want the access codes needed to proceed. Which of you two is going first? Grant lets you battle first, and you are immediately attacked by Mark's Primal Persian. Several of your Pokémon are poisoned in the process, but you continue on. Next, he uses his Primal Aurorus, which is just an icy titan that takes a lot to take down, and that is followed by his Leparcto. Yeah, a lot of tough Pokémon to start off. His next Pokémon looks familiar. Yes, it's time to see what our laid-back Primal Tortuga turns into. And I'll let you know that this Pokémon is Mark's Curveball, as it isn't even an Ice-type. You know, I like to throw those in there. A few of you had guessed that our Caracosta would be gaining the Psychic-type. 
I had hinted that little Tortuga was using the pearls in its shell to sense the ocean's currents and navigate with ease, and we're gonna have that sense further develop. The pearls are basically like crystal balls for this Pokemon, and I wanted a pose that would show how it is harnessing that psychic power. The idea that I had doesn't work as well when it isn't a fully animated sprite, but I like to imagine the pearls and the scales along its forearms that they glow and pulsate in series when it's focusing its psychic powers. But let's learn about a big brainy turtle friend named Primal Caracosta, the crystal ball Pokemon. The cool blue pearls on this massive Pokemon's body channel the ebb and flow of the ocean. Primal Caracosta have learned to decipher the pearl's vibrations to predict the future. They are remarkably relaxed in all situations and often appear out of nowhere to help people and Pokemon in need. Its ability is own tempo, so that prevents it from becoming confused. You're certainly annoyed with a non-ice type attacking you, but you manage to knock it out. After that, he lets loose his speedy guan ice, which is not particularly difficult, you knock it out as well, but it is soon followed up by its evolution. Ah, yes. I just had to do Longusquama. Now, I will fully admit that I am leaning into an outdated and incorrect reconstruction of this animal. This reptile had long, scale-like structures protruding from its back that early restorations kind of doubled up and turned into strange gliding wings. In actuality, it was much more likely that these were just display structures. But, you know, because I wanted a unique flying type, we're just gonna use the outdated look. Um, so I hope you can forgive me for that. I was unsure about it at first, but as soon as I sketched out a silhouette with this, you know, hunched back and dangling arms, I was immediately just a huge fan of the personality that it had. To me, it just looks like, like a little goon who will fly by and knock your hat off just for the fun of it. Just like a little icy jerk. And I thought that was fun, so yeah. Uh, the cool colors persisted from the pre-evolution and also, like the previous design, this one's shiny will get a warmer kind of green to show that it actually lived in a more temperate climate. Okay, this is Icequama, the ice glider Pokemon. This nimble flyer uses the frozen scales on its back to soar through wintry skies with ease. Icequama take advantage of their aerial superiority by swooping down and picking up unsuspecting prey with their long arms. They enjoy perching on their trainer's shoulders, but it is advised that you wear a winter coat and hat to avoid frostbite. Its ability remains Slush Rush, so that will boost the Pokemon's speed in a hailstorm. It is incredibly fast and hits pretty hard, but eventually you are able to knock out this flying menace. Well done! My ice types may be brittle, but they are often able to chill my opponents to the bone. I'm impressed that your Pokemon made it through. Give me your ID badge. You'll need this to follow and defeat Psycad. Mark is healing his Pokemon and getting ready to battle Grant as you leave the research building. You are able to follow Psycad's tracks as they dart behind buildings and disappear through the restricted access gate leading to Route 11. Route 11 is littered with slippery ice flows. You try and watch your step, but you still end up slipping down icy slides from time to time. You spot wild Pokemon playing on the slopes like Fractip, Iskwama, Aurorus, Primal Persian, and Hadratoot. You are luckily able to just follow Psycad's footprints pretty easily through the snow. And this frozen landscape is a little bit easier to navigate on the way down the mountain. The wild Pokemon here are quite difficult, and as you battle, two of your Pokemon are ready to evolve. Yes, let's take a look at what a couple of our primal fossils evolve into. First off, little grumpy Omanyte is going to get long. It'll be inspired by the Orthoceros fossils that are commonly found around the world, 
these spiky little guys were very successful and I wanted to reflect that by having this design here. Also, Omastar always fell into the Gen 1 designs that just aren't different enough camp for me, so we're gonna we're gonna go in a different direction. The face remains nice and grumpy, though now it has like a little trident looking plate over its eyes. You know, a little nautical theming. I had to resist the desire to over design the shell with spikes and whatnot, and landed on a much simpler set of markings that reference the banded chambers on real Orthoceros fossils. Oh, and I usually don't talk about stats, but the original Omastar Dex entry talks about how it went extinct because it was too slow to survive, which just felt like a dumb reasoning. So it'll get a mediocre speed stat, um, but I'm gonna give it an ability to compensate for that. Oh, and of course, colors are similar to Omanite with the shiny colors being the same as normal Omastar. All right, let's take a look at Primal Omastar, the Cone Pokemon. Incorrectly restored Omanite are unable to develop their shells into the conical shape of Primal Omastar. This streamlined shape allows this efficient predator to reach great speeds. Previous theories about their extinction being the result of limited mobility appear to be false and its ability is Speed Boost, so that just lets it get faster and faster every turn. Omastar is long and speedy and still pretty formidable even though it's just a mono water type. All right, but let's take a look at what little Archon evolves into. Now, a lot of the primal fossil evolutions are more drastic changes, but this one is about fine tuning my favorite fossil design. So things are just a little bit more subtle here. Our little ground type is taking to the sky, so obviously it has the same flying pose. We're continuing with the Microraptor as the inspiration, which means that the back legs are getting even larger fans of feathers, since Microraptor really did have four gliding wings. Next up, just to show how bird-like this animal is, our line work is going to separate the mouth into more of a beak and we'll be simplifying the hand a bit. I wasn't sure if changing the hand was gonna be necessary, but I am elaborating on enough other elements that this simplification helped to balance the whole design. Oh, and lastly, the head and tail are changed from being scaly to feathered, with a nice big tail fan at the end. Small changes, but I like them. Oh, and I can't remember if I said this when we talked through Primal Urchin, uh, but this line's ground and flying types are a reference to a likely incomplete but still fun theory about how dinosaurs learned to fly. Uh, Wing-assisted incline running theory um, showed that you know terrestrial dinosaurs with wing arms likely used them for stabilization when they were running at high speeds and got in some good flaps whenever running up hills or climbing. So yeah, that running and wing combination are reflected here. Oh, and like before, the colors are all about the iridescent feathering that Microraptor actually had, but of course, if that's too subdued for you, you can always get loud with the shiny colors of the original. All right, here is Primal Archaeops, the first bird Pokemon. This adaptable bird is just as comfortable flying as it is running or climbing. When flying, Primal Archaeops hold their feet out to act as a second set of wings. Their iridescent feathers give off a cool shimmer, and sometimes this is all that is seen as they travel at high speeds. Its ability is again kind of a mirror of the normal ability that it has to feed us, so Optimist, that means that whenever the HP of this Pokemon drops below 50%, its attack and special attack get boosted by 25%. And I gotta say, I love it. It is not the flashiest redesign, but I think that these little tweaks make my favorite fossil Pokemon even cooler. But you'll have to let me know what you think of these two fossil Pokemon. Which one would you put on your team? Now, looking proudly at your new evolutions, it seems that one of your other Pokemon is a bit jealous. Yes, your Relicanth is very excited to see these other evolutions, 
but wants to raise its body out of the water so that you will notice it as well. It struggles to do so and you feel bad for it, so you decide to tie your air balloon item to it to give it just a tiny bit of assistance. And what's this? It seems that its motivation to leave the water and that extra lift from the balloon is all that Relicanth needed to evolve. Now, I know that the Relicanth and Tiktaalik are not super closely related, but I want our neglected lobe-finned buddy to make his way up onto the land, and Tiktaalik is a great inspiration. A prime example of a transitional species leaving the water for dry land, Tiktaalik didn't so much you know, as walk as it did just kind of clumsily drag itself around, and we're going to be using that locomotion for Relicanth's evolution. This yoga-looking cobra pose also lets our little guy just look so darn pleased with himself that he managed to leave the water. In fact, I moved Relicanth's iconic red hexagon to the side of its head so that it could have happy little rosy cheeks. I also figured that it would be so happy to be, you know, walking about that it would open its eyes wide to take it all in. The pupil is still, like, elongated to both reference Relicanth's previous eyes and kind of show that its eyesight is underdeveloped still. You know, I fumbled a bit um, with the colors, but eventually landed on something that felt pretty balanced. Oh, and since our fish is so happy to have crawled out of the water and put his swimming days behind him, we'll be tackling another unused type. Alright, let's take a look at Ticketanthic. The crawling Pokemon. Many Relicanth strive to leave the water, but they require assistance to do so. Tiktanthic is finally able to lift its body off the ground slightly with strong lobe fins. Access to dry land has left this Pokemon in a perpetual state of glee. Tiktanthic love to slowly waddle around and show off their new mobility. They are forever grateful to any trainer who helped them evolve and its ability is sturdy. And that just lets it survive with one HP when it would normally be knocked out by a single attack. With this surprising evolution dragging itself behind you, you return to sea level, warmer air, and the gate of Neo Outpost. This appears to be the main dock of the Paleon region. Cargo containers are stacked high, and trucks seem ready to take heavy equipment all over the region. You hear shouting and spot Psycad knocking her way through a crowd of researchers and workers. You race after her as she heads for the dock. Other researchers stand in her way, allowing you to finally catch up to her. No, not you again. Can't you just let me be? You don't understand the danger we're all in. That's it. Time to wipe the floor with you and be on my way. Psycad attacks you again with her Dunklivish, Troazolt, Dracanto, and Leparto. But you've had plenty of experience with these correctly restored Galar Pokemon, and you're knocking all of them out, no problem. On the ropes, Psycad calls out her final Pokemon. Alright, unlike the other modern elemental monkeys, Simirage is getting an evolution. We're bringing in inspiration from two places. Firstly, the Gigantopithecus. This was a gargantuan ape that I really wanted to get in here somewhere. Um, some claim that the Gigantopithecus didn't actually go extinct, and it's what's responsible for, like, Bigfoot and Yeti sightings. Uh, so yeah, it's a giant ape. Very cool. And secondly, second inspiration, it is retaining its fairy and dark typing, which we will be using to further explore the ideas of mysticism, spirituality, and religion. Probably a little heavy for Pokemon, but it's not overt in the final design, so I think we're okay. Tufts of fur give it a kind of Pope-like or shamanistic headdress. Again, skirting the line of being too on the nose, but I think it's okay. Also, it's going to have a fuzzy cape going around uh, and long fuzzy sleeves. Just hints at, you know, ceremonial garb. Oh, and of course, Simi Rage's sharpened stick has become a staff now. 
I did resist the urge to put any religious iconography at the top of it. And lastly, it gets a sedentary pose, which makes more sense with the dex entry. All right, let's take a look at Gigantope, the fairy tale Pokemon. Simi Rage exposed to the stories of a mysterious old book become Gigantope. They weave fantastical and horrifying stories to entrance other Pokemon. Even humans must be cautious of their dark influences. Gigantope prefer to be feared by other Pokemon and expect berries as tribute. And its ability remains gluttony since it wants to eat all those berries all the time. You make a mental note that Psycad must have used the old book item to evolve her Gigantope, just in case you want to do the same with yours. Psycad battles desperately but is unsuccessful in stopping you. She falls to the ground and the contents of her bag spill out. More of the mysterious levitating stones. Researchers and dock workers close in around her. No, you don't understand. I'm trying to save the Pokemon of the Paleon region. A great threat lies dormant, and Professor Ginkgo intends to wake it. They are keeping it a secret from you all. You, Assistant, I implore you to go see for yourself. Take this Pokeride signal. Call on my lap Harkto to carry you across the waves. Get to the Sunazone lab at the center of Paleon Bay and learn the truth. The other researchers and dock workers carry Psycad away and collect the levitating stones to return to Professor Ginkgo. But for some reason, you can't help but believe Psycad. You look out at the waves and call out her Leparcto. You hop on to Psycad's Leparcto and jet across the water. Jagged rocks and protective barriers limit your path as you travel north. Strong, wild Pokémon breach the waves around you. Dunkleavish, Leparcto, Caracosta, and Relicanth, along with a new Primal Pokémon. Yep, it's about time that we get to little Primal Leleep's evolution. Here's the thing about normal Cradilly. You know, I actually, I like it, even though I think, objectively, it looks a little dumb. You know, especially the pink doodads around its head. So I think we can make it look much cooler. Right off the bat, it's going to get much cooler fronds around its head. They just look sharper, you know, plant-like, and just more interesting overall. Leaning into the primal nature, I wanted this to feel almost like a warrior's headdress or something. Next thing to change, this is an active predator, and I wanted those jaws to just be more intimidating. Let's get some jaws going on, like real jaws. You should be afraid that if you anger it, it could just chomp your arm clean off. And the third thing is a fairly small tweak. A lot of people, somewhat understandably, think that the pattern on top of Cradilia's head are its eyes. So we're just going to modify the markings slightly so that it's just a little more obvious that the eyes are actually those glowing orbs inside the mouth. Just like that are Predatory Sea Lily Pokemon is all updated. This is Primal Cradilly, the Hungry Lily Pokemon. This ravenous Pokemon hides among swaying sea plants waiting for a chance to strike. If it is discovered, Primal Cradilly scurries across the seafloor with its root-like legs to attack. Researchers have even spotted it leaving the water to hunt. Its jaws and sharp leaves make it an effective predator, and its ability, which I'm now noticing I misspelled, surprise attack, sur surprise attack, whatever. Uh, this Pokemon always moves first during the first move of a battle, and I love that this thing looks like it could really mess you up, even though it's got like this soft pastel colors to it. Yeah, good stuff. All right. You navigate the strong whirlpools and soon run into Professor Ginkgo in a little boat. She eyes you with caution. There you are. I hear word that you helped take down Psycad for good. I hope she didn't get to you with any of the lies she likes to spout. I know, I know she thinks she's doing what's right, but she's always failed to see the big picture. Together, we used the might of a legendary Pokémon to revive all these fossil Pokémon. But a second legendary is here in the region too, and it demands to be studied also. 
Cycad is too much of a coward to continue our work, and the other researchers don't need to be burdened with what I have to do next. Oh, you believe Cycad, do you? You don't think I should continue? Well, it looks like I'll just have to stop you then. Ginkgo leads with her fully evolved starter, which demolishes your own starter. After some effort, you knock it out, and she follows up with Primal Omastar, Whirlicon, Cortali, Rhino Seer, and the tiny rejected Fossage. After all that, you finally defeat Ginkgo, and she flees to the east. Your Pokémon worked very hard, and you find that two of them are ready to evolve. First up, your ugly little muddy boy, Setamut. Now, if you recall, this is based on the evolution of whales, so let's get massive with this design. One thing to point out right away, I had this line designed long before Generation 9's Satitan was revealed, so any similarities are likely due to common theming. Our whale is going to have some legs, but be a bit too accustomed to the water by this point to walk around easily. Also, I wanted this design to retain some of that goopy, muddy, goober aesthetic of the previous form. So, a little droopy mud and a big goofy smile do the trick. I juggled the color palette a bit to finally land on something that felt right. Oh, and as a last-minute change, I ended up giving Satitan's colors to the shiny. Alright, say hello to Setameg, the first whale Pokémon. This massive Pokémon is the closest relative to modern-day Satitan populations. Though Setamega are quite cumbersome on land, they have become incredibly agile in the water. They retain Setamut's eager nature and show affection to anyone who can look past their ugly appearance. Trainers should be careful not to be crushed by their emphatic hugs. And its ability is slippery, because they're all muddy and slick. And that raises the Pokémon's speed stat by two stages whenever it's hit by a Water-type move. I think we did a pretty good job of landing on that elusive, you know, Pokémon ugly cute that, that I was going for. You'll have to let me know if you think this design is on the cute or the gross side of the line. Oh! And actually, you know what? There is another ground type that needs some love. Yep. Yep, it looks like your sleepy little Slothump is ready to evolve too. Now, this line, as a reminder, is based on the Megatherium, or giant ground sloths, so we'll be maintaining that sloth-like look. Megatherium was a slow-moving but formidable opponent with its massive clawed hands. Because of this, we'll be introducing the fighting type. Now, Instead of having it slash at opponents with its claws, which would be a little too similar to Theris Lies, we'll have those claws curled in to create heavy, solid boxing glove hands. And to play into this boxing look, we'll, we're actually going to give it a slightly more humanoid, old-timey pugilist silhouette. Oh, and I was able to finish off that look with a little tuft of chest hair, a fancy mustache, and a cute little head curl. The colors, pretty straightforward, uh, pulling most of them from Little Slothump and seeing where they landed best. And of course, the shiny are the mascot colors from the Best in Slot YouTube channel. It's got a little sloth, it's very cute. I mean, I had to do everything in my power not to add a little top hat to this design to match it. All right, but let's take a look at Mitarium, the pugilist Pokemon. This Pokemon punches trees out of the ground when it cannot reach the leaves. Mitarium are usually incredibly slow, but can throw their heavy fists with alarming speed. They like to look after Sleepy Slothump in the wild and can be observed covering them in sand for added camouflage. Its ability is Iron Fists, since it has those big old boxing glove hands, and that increases the damage of punching moves by 20%. And I love how it turned out. You know, it's a perfect balance of tough, but lovable. Oh, and with these new Pokemon added to the decks, we've made some serious progress completing it. In fact, let's take a look at the decks. There's a few empty spots sprinkled throughout, and a decent gap for some legendaries, and 
plenty of space for whatever we add in any bonus videos before the end of the series. Oh, and be sure to let me know what of the remaining Pokemon designs you're most excited to see. I may give you a little heads up on when they'll be appearing. But seriously, we have done some good work on the decks. And I just wanted to thank everyone who has been watching this series. I mean, it means the world to me that you've been following along while we populate the region with these ancient designs. But anyway, back to the task at hand. Professor Ginkgo has fled, and you make chase after her, soon arriving at the Quater Ocean Station. You hop off of the helpful Leparcto and onto the massive rocking sea platform that is Quater Ocean Station. You actually feel a little queasy as it tilts on the powerful ocean waves. A barrier fence wraps around the center of Paleon Bay, and a restricted gate with a large eight stands in your way. Senozone Lab is out of reach for now, and there isn't much on this research station, but you do spot a final Pokemon-type research arena. You run inside expecting to find a water-type researcher, but instead the interior is filled with pipes, pumping gurgling purple liquid. You do also find a note left behind. Sorry, Professor Ginkgo just sent me on an emergency mission on Route 13. I'll be back soon. Serena, the poison-type head researcher. Not having the time to wait for her to return, you use your Pokeride signal again and begin sailing across Route 13 to find her. You battle wild Pokemon as you search for her. There's Primal Omastar, Primal Kabutops, Dunklevish, Leparcto, and even the rare Fossage. In addition, the currents are quite strong out here. This dangerous path actually serves as our poison-type puzzle. There are jagged rocks and currents that whip you this way and that, and little barriers and valves and pipes. I kind of had flashbacks to, I think, Soul Silver uh, navigating all the whirlpools and stuff, so I wanted to do an homage to that with a little bit more, so you gotta, you know, spin some dials to flip the direction of certain whirlpools and different eddies and whatnot. Oh, and during all this, you do sail past a small island that is fenced off with a massive restricted gate labeled with a huge 16. In fact, you've seen two other massive doors with 16s on them, um, but we will tackle that mystery soon, I promise you. You just make a mental note. Eventually, you do find Serena, the Poison-type head researcher, on a small beach island. You hop off of your Leparcto and rush up to her. Well, if it isn't the professor's little assistant. I'm surprised you were able to make it out here, but I'm very busy. The professor said an outside Pokemon was spotted on this island and that I needed to catch it. Wait, what? You think that Professor Ginkgo told me that just to get me out of my research building? Well, that's just not cool. I need to get back to my research building then. Someone needs to remove the toxins released into the bay by the professor's research. And when you get there, I suppose I could put you in your place real quick. We'll see if you understand the frightening beauty of poison-type Pokemon. Serena calls out her own ride Pokemon and flies back to Quarter Ocean Station. When you eventually return, you find that she is ready for your battle. Serena leads with her Primal Persian, which you know pretty well and you're able to knock it out. Next up, she sends out Hallucid, but she follows up with its evolution. We're popping back to the Hallucigenia inspiration for this one, and we'll be referencing the fact that this animal was initially reconstructed upside down, so it will finally get flipped right side up when it evolves. Those silly little spiky legs are now massive defensive quills, and the noodles on its back are now a bunch of more practical legs. I actually liked the little curly bits on its back from before and wanted to maintain that, so I gave it a couple of long whiskers. These are also a good parallel for the little frontward facing arms that the real Hallucigenia had. The last big design element that I wanted to pull in was bubbles. I just love the idea of it generating these poisonous, hallucinogenic bubbles that it, you know, surrounded itself with as an added defense. Now there's a good amount going on with this design, but I think it doesn't quite cross the line into being cluttered. And in conjunction with the pose, it's, you know, head lifted up to spout bubbles, I think that it makes the head a little 
intentionally ambiguous at first glance, which I like. You know, gotta keep that weirdness in there still. All right, let's take a look at Halutrip, the confusing Pokemon. This bizarre Pokemon produces powerful poisons that affect perception. Halutrip blow bubbles filled with toxic chemicals and swirling vortexes of psychic energy. Contact with one of their long spikes or floating bubbles can leave someone in a daze for hours. Halutrip use their psychic abilities to ensure their bubbles never pop on their trainer. And its ability is bizarre. Making this up, it is contact with the Pokemon may confuse the attacker. It is slow but strong, and its ability to poison and confuse your Pokemon, it's a big hurdle to get through. Eventually, you do knock it out, and she follows up with the evolution to little Primal Cranidos. Now, a big shout out to those few who guessed that this line would be gaining the poison type. We'll be keeping the general pose the same. It'll still be running into its opponents with its big old dome head. But we'll be switching out the personality. It'll be a lot less angry. And bringing in the imagery of a beaker of volatile chemicals. This transparent vessel of roiling liquid kind of makes the body also look like a lava lamp, which is pretty cute. This silly mad scientist chemistry look was really just a happy accident. A, a result of me wanting to use the poison and steel type. I, of course, did this design before the little engine designs of Generation 9 came out, but I'm pretty happy with this combination of types. It's cute. Let's take a look at Primal Rempardos, the headbutt Pokemon. The bulbous head of this ancient Pokemon is filled with a volatile liquid. Primal Rampardos prefer to slosh their poisons around in a threatening display rather than risk damaging their brittle heads in battle. If forced into combat, their poison-laced heads can deal an extraordinary amount of damage. And its ability is Poison Touch, and that means it may poison targets whenever it makes contact. So it's like Poison Point, but for being on the offense. Its Poison Steel typing takes a while to overcome and you lose more Pokémon. After it falls, Serena chooses the middle stage of our pseudo-legendary line. Yes, we are finally getting to Fossage's evolution. I know that a number of you have been clambering for this design to finally show up. We met Fossage like forever ago, but you know, pseudo-legendaries evolve so late that I just had to keep the evolutions until late in the series. Our adorable lump of poisonous goo is going to become an awkward teenager. I wanted to show that this is a lot more, you know, capable. It can actually walk around, even if it still feels really unnatural. The whole line is slowly developing and pulling itself into something larger. And this is a good transitional stage, which still has its own personality. Oh, and I really like this color palette. It's kind of fun because it's very close to the color palette of one of the legendaries, which it'll make a lot more sense lore-wise when we eventually get to that. But let's go ahead and learn about this middle stage. This is Sludgeolum, the new life Pokemon. Fossage, who master the bone fragments stuck in their bodies, evolve into this shambling, spiky Pokemon. Sludgeolum balance on thin bone legs, allowing them to clumsily walk about instead of slowly sliding everywhere. Researchers suspect that their gooey bodies analyze and copy the trace DNA present in the fossil pieces, allowing them to continue developing. Its ability is gooey still, and that slows down the attacker whenever they make contact. Slajolum, while goopy and adorable, decimates most of your team before it faints. With one Pokemon left each, Serena sends out her ace. Poison Eevee time. There are some different directions you can go with a poison design. The first route is a, you know, gloopy poison Eevee, but since we just had Slajolum, that felt kind of redundant. I've also seen some designs that incorporate iconic poisonous animal traits like scorpion tails or cobra hoods, but these always feel a little tacked on to me. So the route that I chose to go with was spiky. I decided not to give it the regular floofy evolution tail. Instead, playing off of the set of spikes that Jolteon has, but you know, exaggerating them even more. Kind of like it has like a sea urchin on its butt. 
This makes for a pretty impactful silhouette and lends itself to a surprising amount of personality. I think the tiny mohawk of Spikes helps too, it makes it look like a little punk rocker. Uh, I did have someone comment about the upcoming Poison EV by saying that they just didn't want it to be all spiky. And I am sorry to disappoint, but I really like how this one turned out. All right, let's learn about Toxion, the quilled Pokemon. This poison type evolution is covered in long poisonous spines. Toxion are playful and confident, but keep others at arm's length for their own protection. Trainers who form a strong bond with this spiky Pokemon may receive gentle nuzzles from the unquilled parts of Toxion's face. Its ability is poison points, obviously, and that may leave an attacker poisoned. It comes down to a couple last moves, but you are somehow able to knock out Serena's last Pokemon. She pats her Toxian on the head and congratulates you. Alright, that was quite the battle. I'll be honest with you, Professor Genko told me not to give you the last access code needed to get to Cenozone Lab, but you earned this fair and square. With your final access code acquired, you will be able to pass through the restricted gate and make your way to Cenozone Lab. But before you can do that, it seems that three of your Pokemon are ready to evolve. All right, let's not waste any time at all and see what the final forms of our spliced starters are. So, the psychic type Ovanish is up first. Uh, as a reminder, these spliced forms are based off of specific dinos from the Jurassic series. This raptor is, of course, blue. That means she isn't feathered like the regular Flytor, and gets you now a more kind of boxier snout like the Jurassic Raptors. We're also going to restore the sickle claw on the feet instead of the Pokemon-y hand position that it had before. Flytor is the last to get its secondary typing, which you probably could have guessed would be electric again. This actually works out well since I was able to take Blue's iconic stripe and turn it into this zigzagging lightning bolt. The overall design definitely falls into the this is just a cartoon version of an animal category, but again, that's kind of the point of these spliced forms. So we'll roll with it. The colors came together pretty easy here. It reads, you know, less as a psychic type, but I don't know, that's one of those types that it's often difficult to communicate that with just the color palette. And of course, all of the shinies for these are just the base form colors. Okay, let's take a look at Spliced Flytor, the Lightning Bolt Pokemon. The intellect of this spliced variant is unmatched in the Paleon region. They often refuse to stay in their Pokeballs and escape from most forms of containment. Though they form strong bonds with their trainers, they require a great deal of freedom. Even well-trained Spliced Flytor have been known to ignore commands. And its ability is Surge Surfer, and so that doubles the speed stats whenever there is electric terrain. It's speedy and smart and featherless, which I know will please those die-hard Jurassic fans. Okay, next up, let's make things cute. Hopping back over to Bumpy from Camp Cretaceous, we'll be maintaining the personality with this. And Bumpy is basically like a puppy inside the body of a armor-plated titan, so right off the bat, it needs a big old tongue hanging out. You know, Bumpy is big on giving kisses, and this Pokemon will be the same. Oh, and the other thing about Bumpy that I wanted to continue with are the lopsided spikes on its head. In fact, We'll be making a lot of the dermal spikes kind of wonky. And, you know, this also works since this Pokemon is a spliced form and, you know, maybe the genes didn't come together perfectly. It is keeping the fairy typing since, you know, it's so friendly. And, of course, it has the steel typing, which, you know, makes sense because of the armor plating. But I did want to do something a little extra to reference the flower that normal Ankylotus sports on the end of its tail. I ended up with this metallic blossom that's, you know, it's kind of pretty, but also rather menacing. Uh, the colors are, you know, bumpy colors, and the shiny feels a little more plant-like. All right, let's take a look at Spliced Ankylotus, the Steel Blossom Pokemon. The tails of this fully evolved spliced Pokemon have a series of sharp metal plates which resemble the petals of its complete form. 
Spliced Ankylotus is as playful as ever, and trainers should be careful not to be accidentally crushed by this behemoth's affection. Their spikes rarely grow in straight, but this leads to a surprisingly sharp defense. And its ability is sturdy, and that makes sure that it can't be knocked out in one hit. It's a big, lovable goofball. When dealing, you know, with all these dinosaurs, it's tempting to have them just be designs that are cool and edgy and fierce and intimidating, but I always need to remind myself that it's important to have designs that appeal to all types of people, and I hope that someone would love this goober as much as it would love you back. Okay, but that's enough cuteness. Let's get moody. I love that the regular Spinosaur is a pretty good approximation of the scientifically accurate Spinosaurus, but I also know that the Spinosaurus from Jurassic Park 3 has a lot of fans. In all honesty, I'm not really one of those people. I just had some major structural issues with that film and my opinion of the Spino suffered because of it. I've warmed up to the design more, especially after seeing it again in Camp Cretaceous, so I was excited to do justice with this spliced form. And again, yes, Maybe it is just a cartoon version of the animal, but I did make sure to get a fun design on our dark type sail. It's a little abstracted, but I gave it something akin to the scary face Pokemon thing. It's more apparent in the shiny. Okay, let's learn about Spliced Spinozar, the Rage Dragon Pokemon. The fully evolved form of this spliced Pokemon is completely unpredictable. They are so consumed by rage the majority of the time that they can be difficult for a trainer to connect with. Once they have been offended, it is extremely difficult to win back their trust. This Pokemon should only be trained by expert Pokemon trainers. And its ability is enraged. Uh, that's something new that I'm making up, so that means the Pokemon ignores 10% of the commands given to it, but has a 20% chance of performing an attack twice. Is pretty neat if I do say so myself, but you'll have to let me know what you think of these spliced forms. I know it was kind of a strange thing to do, you know, give alternate forms to the starters. I wasn't initially planning it, but when I decided kind of last minute to squeeze in a third legendary and an accompanying side quest, these felt like a fun addition. You do know that you should be continuing to the Cenozone lab to stop Professor Ginkgo and, you know, whatever her destructive plans may be, but you also finally have all of the spliced final evolutions in your Pokedex and can complete that legendary quest line back in the abandoned lab. So, you pull out your Poke Ride and call Lofty into your aid again. Now, Lofty knows that time is of the essence, so it lazily floats as fast as it can back to Route 9. Arriving at the abandoned lab, you see that Mal is still waiting for you. You did it! You have all the necessary Pokemon in your Pokedex. Let's get this data entered into the computer and see what this E150 program is all about. You let the computer scan your Pokedex, and the corrupted program flutters to life. A bunch of distorted progress bars fill the screen, along with flashing text that says, Combine all DNA and start revival process? Well, we don't know exactly what that means, so I'm just gonna type no. No! Unfortunately, the corrupted computer program processes their keystrokes incorrectly, and the text changes to confirmed, starting revival process. What? No! I typed no! What is going on? Oh, this is bad. This is very bad. We should get out of here now! You watch as all of the progress bars begin rapidly filling and the entire lab begins to shake. Strange equipment is whirring to life all around you as you follow Mal out of the lab. When you get outside, there is a massive explosion of multicolored flames. And the silhouette of a giant Pokemon can be seen stomping through the fire towards you. I have no idea what we managed to create, but you're gonna have to deal with it. Good luck. Let's make our first legendary. Now, this technically counts as, like, the third legendary of the region, but y you know what I mean. Anyway, paying homage to the Jurassic Park and Jurassic World series, we'll be looking at the Indominus Rex. 
Now, I may not be the biggest fan of the hybrid dinos that are in the Jurassic World series, from a narrative standpoint at least, but I can at least recognize that they are like really cool designs. They just look neat as heck. And this legendary side quest just had to end with a hybrid. Now I'm definitely risking making the design a bit too busy, but I love the idea of this Pokemon just being a mass of claws and teeth and spikes and muscles. You know, it was important to me that, you know, some of the elements just felt unnatural. So, so that's why the hands with their little thumbs are split into different colors. This makes the function of the hands feel almost Frankenstein together. Uh, same goes with the overlapping sections on the face and the, the scar-like X on the chest. You know, I am pretty happy with how it turned out, though. Busy, but in a good way. Oh, and even though it is essentially a dinosaur and the dragon typing would fit, I decided to make it mono dark type. Honestly, it being mono type will make a lot more sense when we get to the ability. All right, let's learn about Dominex, the hybrid Pokemon. Strange abandoned research in the Paleon region resulted in the creation of this hybrid Pokemon. The DNA of Dominex is an amalgamation of multiple ancient species. This haphazard combination has left this Pokemon with a fractured and violent personality. Researchers doubt that any trainer could tame its unpredictable nature. And its ability is something that I'm calling unstable. And that means that this Pokemon will change its type to match any move that it uses or any move that hits it. So it's just constantly changing type all the time. It is a particularly difficult Pokemon to challenge due to that ability, and its stats are nothing to laugh at either. It chews through most of your team until just your scrappy little splice starters remain. It takes even more time to whittle down its HP, and you have to toss way too many Pokeballs at it, but you eventually catch this legendary. Mike's work. I'm thinking that we, um, keep this accident our little secret, okay? Who's to say that the lab wasn't all exploded when we found it, right? I'll stay here and see what can be salvaged. Hopefully that legendary Pokemon will help you with whatever you have ahead of you. I'll see you around. Now that you and Mal have agreed to never discuss the destruction that you accidentally caused, you can fly back to the north. You hop onto your lofty and take to the skies. You pass down Route 14, spotting Primal Caracosta, Dunklefish, Leparcto, and even more Fossage. You actually notice that sections of the water glisten with a strange purple and green shimmer. Something going on at the Cenozone lab is causing an unnatural pollution. The lab is an even larger floating research station. And luckily, a Pokey Beacon waits for you at the entrance so you can heal up your Pokémon. You visit an upper level where you find Professor Ginkgo's office. The Professor is nowhere to be seen, but you make another bizarre discovery. Floating in the center of the room is a large ball of pulsing ooze. It's dripping into some sort of collection vat, and you read through some of the professor's notes and realize that this is the original dormant legendary Pokemon that they had discovered and helped them return life to the Paleon region. You wish that you had more time to investigate, but you head back downstairs to find Professor Ginkgo before it's too late. The lab has four research sections and a centrally located elevator that must lead below the surface. Unfortunately, when you attempt to use the elevator, a lab-wide alarm sounds. All of the exits from the lab seal shut around you. You notice that the control panel to the elevator requires a level 12 access code. A figure barrels down the hallway and nearly knocks you off your feet. Whoa, I don't know what you did, but I barely made it in before you put this place into lockdown. Congrats on beating me here, but what's going on? What do you mean the professor is working with potentially dangerous legendary Pokemon? Normally, I would take this opportunity to challenge you to a battle, but we better figure out how to get down- I, You have four research sections to explore and arbitrarily pick a door and run through it. 
Everything here is made out of polished chrome. Tim, the steel type head researcher, looks up from a welding project. I never thought the professor's new assistant would make it this far. Care to show me if you fully comprehend the resilience of my steel type Pokemon? Tim leads with his Rampardos, followed up by his Basiodon. Next up, his Theraslice cuts through much of your team. But luckily, his next Pokemon is just a teeny tiny dumb little Dodoy. Unfortunately for you, when you knock it out, you get to meet its evolution. Now, we ran into little Dodoy a very long time ago, and now we're finally going to get to its evolution. A couple of you guessed that it would be turning into a terror bird. You know, we're kind of treating Dodoy as the region's Magikarp, so it's going from completely useless to a real powerhouse. If you haven't heard of the various species, commonly referred to as terror birds, these were massive terrestrial birds that hunted in the scrublands of South America. These things did not mess around. They could screw you up big time. So, they felt like a good fit for our Dodoy to mature into. You may have also guessed from the axe shape of the beak here that it's gaining the steel typing. And actually, we're going to be knocking out one of the few unused type combinations, normal steel. Now, the typing doesn't initially sound great, what with both of those types being weak to fighting, but I came up with an ability that compensates for that. That steel typing also lets the talons on the feet and the single claw digits on the little wings be more deadly means of attack. The color palette is mostly from Dodoy with some cool blues to help balance things out. Uh, oh, and because of the overall shape of this design, I could not resist making the shiny orange, you know, like a chocobo. All right, let's meet Teraxa, the axe beak Pokemon. Dodoy, who learn how to fend for themselves and survive long enough, may evolve into this terrifying flightless bird. Teraxa can be seen gently picking on Dodoy in the wild. While this behavior appears malicious, researchers suspect the Teraxa are trying to toughen up their little pre-evolution forms. Few Pokemon are foolish enough to challenge their sharp beak and claws. Its ability is something new, I'm calling it High Ground. Because it's a bird, but it doesn't fly, but also it's really tall and can jump really high, um, it's basically gaining the defenses of a flying type. So this Pokemon takes half damage from flying and ground type moves. Taraxa hits like a truck. I mean, it messes up most of the rest of your team. When you do finally faint this terrifying bird, Tim sends out his final Pokemon, another evolution, And dang, y'all, this one was tough. These last few evolutions are ones that I hadn't really given much thought to before. A bunch of the earlier designs, they've just been rattling around in my head for a while, but these later ones, I never got to do any early sketches of or anything like that. So yeah, steel. I thought this would be easy to figure out. The problem is, is that you know, I've seen a good amount of Steel-type Eevees, but I never really found myself liking them that much. They were either an Eevee in, like, a literal suit of armor, like a knight's helmet and everything, or the tail is like a mace or a sword blade. I think these can look cool, but they often just feel too gimmicky and complex. I was really striving to have this design look like it fits in with even the simpler evolutions like Espeon and Umbreon. So, we're gonna give it some metal plating, but nothing that's drastically changing the silhouette. It can be clean and simple, and instead, you know, I can let the pose also communicate the typing and personality. All right, this is Galveon, the plated Pokemon. This steel-type evolution sports gleaming metal plating that makes it a defensive and offensive threat. Galvian are often stoic, opting to calmly watch others and analyze any potential danger. They strive to protect anyone in need, and their independence can lead them to traveling alone to help other Pokémon. Trainers who manage to befriend this Pokémon will find a loyal companion, and its ability is Anticipation, and that just kind of comes from its personality that lets it shudder whenever the opponent has a super effective attack. 
Tim's resilient Galvian puts up one heck of a fight, but you do manage to take it down. I haven't had a battle like that in ages. You and your Pokemon are certainly made of some tough stuff. Give me that ID badge. You deserve this. You're feeling pretty pumped after getting past your first Elite Four member, and you're ready to take on another. You leave Tim behind and run into another nearby lab. This lab is quite eerie, and a form lurches out of the dark at you. This is Kyler, the ghost-type head researcher. So you're the one trying to break into our labs. Aren't you the professor's assistant? What, you think you understand my ghost-type Pokémon? Let's see... Kyler leads with his Nylacene. You've learned how to deal with its troublesome typing and knock it out. Next, he sends out the evolution to a ghost type we met early in the Paleon region. The previous stage, Listric, is based on those adorably ugly little Dicinodonts. But when it evolves, we'll be pivoting to the Tsakasaurus. It has a similar little beak and kind of pointy face, so that's enough of a similarity for me. I just really wanted to use this dino. It is one of the few dinosaurs we have a pretty accurate view of what it looked like. Not only do we have fossil evidence of the quills on its rump, but there was subtle pigmentation fossilized as well. So we actually know that it had counter shading for camouflage. That's uh, when an animal has a lighter underbelly. Uh, oh, and along with a speckled or dappled pattern moving upward. I just can't get enough of how accurate our reconstructions likely are. So what we are bringing in for this design is the counter shading on the belly, you know, gotta have that. Some speckly spot markings on the legs, cool. And of course, all of the quills, which will be represented by grass. In fact, this will evolve by using a miracle seed. I always forget to say the evolution methods. Uh, anyway, we're also keeping the skull motif and the, you know, subtle shamanistic inspiration, primarily with the pose. Uh, oh, and the shiny gets to be dried grass colors, which would be particularly fun in the overworld. All right, this is Setuft, the hidden Pokemon. This frightening Pokemon hides in tall grass using the long blades of grass growing from its back. Though it uses fear as a deterrent, it will stand its ground if an opponent does not flee immediately. Setuft have sharp beaks, horns, and bladed grass that make even the largest predators think twice. And its ability is Infiltrator, so that's staying the same as it was before. Basically, it's able to sneak around and ignore the effects of Reflect, Light Screen, and Safeguard. It's shimmying and shaking all that bladed grass at you, but you are able to knock it out. Next up, Kyler sends out another evolution, this time to that chunky little nano boa. I knew early on that I wanted to do a design that referenced shed snakeskin. I eventually realized that this would make for a great ghost type. Our design will wear its own dead skin, both as a form of camouflage and to serve as a ghoulish mask. It'll be so spooky that it'll cause others to freeze in fear, allowing me to treat it a bit like a basilisk. It'll be slow since it's just using its ghastly appearance to stop its prey in its tracks. Uh, the colors came really easily here, and uh, and similar to Setuf's shiny looking like dried grass, this shiny will have the shed skin looking like fallen leaves, for camouflage reasons. Also, since it is still based on the Gargantuan Titanoboa, this thing finally gets to be big, like really big. Like this Pokemon could probably legitimately eat you in one bite. But you can see that on the dex entry. All right. Let's take a look at that now. Here is Huskalisk, the petrifying Pokemon. This massive serpent wears its discarded skin as a ghastly mask. Huskalisk are quite slow, but ambush their prey and freeze them in place with fear. Few can escape this titan. Huskalisks use their tongues to grab prey before constricting their bodies around them. And their ability is Arena Trap and that prevents opponents from fleeing or switching out of battle. 
This thing is just a big meanie. Uh, not particularly speedy, but tanky and still able to hit with a decent special attack stat. You're losing some of your team members, but eventually you take this Titan down. Luckily, Kyler sends out an easier Pokemon next. Plazaro is also relatively big, but it's just not quite as strong, comparatively. Unfortunately, when you do knock it out, Kyler follows up with its towering evolution. Plazaro already showed that we are dealing with sauropods, but now we're going to get truly gargantuan. This will end up being the largest Pokemon in the entire Paleon Dex. Now I know that the largest sauropods didn't have this more vertical body plan, with this you know, Brachiosaurus look being a bit of an outlier. But that verticality is important as we add a second typing. Even though it usually stays on the ground, it will be so tall that it's gaining the flying type. There's a weird new ability that will reflect this as well. It is you know, still going to have the little ectoplasmic blobs visible inside its body, though now they are much more defined as bones. And we're even maintaining the little bits of eggshell. Not only does this help add some weight, you know, kind of solidness and more colors to the design, but it also gives it the recognizable Brachiosaurus head crest. And before anyone points out that the nostrils should be up there and not at the end of the nose, paleontologists have updated where the nostrils would have been. The head crest was likely a resonating chamber, but the nostrils would be still at the end of the snout. But enough of that. Let's learn about Titanost, the Cloud Spirit Pokemon. This colossal Pokemon is able to reach such a size due to its lightweight ectoplasma body. Titanost have mastered the manipulation of wind with their billowing clouds of ghostly energy. They feed on the tallest prehistoric trees and are able to float off the ground if anything is ever out of reach. And its ability is this new thing I'm calling Grounded. So it's no longer immune to ground type attacks, you know, normally it would be as a flying type, but instead takes half damage from ground, electric, and rock attacks. Titanost is bulky as all get out, and still packs quite a punch. It's able to beat down most of your team before finally fainting. With no other options, Kyler sends out his final Pokemon. Yes, a ghost type Eevee. This is another design that I never got around to doing an early sketch for, so I was kind of going in blind. The only thing that I had was that it would be neat if it evolved holding a reaper cloth and it fainted. There is a lot of really amazing ghost type Eevee designs out there, but I also wanted to avoid the all too common just slap some ghostly fire on it route. And also, while I like some of the more skeletal designs out there, I have to admit that, that a lot of the time they end up reading a little too dark and edgy, and they just kind of feel out of place with the other evolutions. So, we continued with the Reaper Cloth as our main inspiration. In order to keep from just looking like an evolution with a sheet tossed on it, I gave it these little detached feet. These give it a more ethereal, ghostly appearance, and also look like cute little spell bags. The tail was also a fun challenge, but I landed on this bit of reaper cloth that is dragged around like the blade of a scythe, completing that grim reaper look. Uh, also, let's, let's talk about this adorable pose, shall we? It is cute as heck. Now, Eevee is definitely more fox-like, but the evolutions all sit somewhere between Canidae and Felidae. Like, Espeon is definitely more cat, and Flareon is definitely more canine. Spookion is going to be more cat, uh, and this pose, I think, shows it. Honestly, this is mainly because my best good buddy Kyler is the Ghost Type Elite Four member, and he has a little cat named Pamela. So, Pamela, if you're listening, this pose is for you. Okay, let's take a look at Spookion, the Reaper Pokemon. This ghost-type evolution enjoys creeping about in the shadows and scaring others. The draped cloth of Spookion's body is incredibly resilient due to being filled with ghostly energy. It is able to wield the fabric trailing from its tail as an unexpected blade when provoked. 
Harnessing this spectral energy is quite demanding, and they spend most of the day napping. Its ability is Intimidate, and so that lowers the attack of opponents who enter battle. It's adorable and frightening at the same time, but you are able to pull through and emerge victorious. You even took down my Spookion! Impressive! Well, that shows me that you belong here. Give me that ID badge. When you exit into the hallways, you see Grant being thrown from a nearby lab. It seems that he wasn't successful. You help your friend up from the ground, heal your Pokemon, and enter that lab. You run into the lab, though you could have sworn that you entered a cave. The walls are made of solid rock. Topher, the sturdy rock-type head researcher, saunters over to you. Are you going to be more of a challenge than your friend who just tried to take me on? Just because most of the revived fossil Pokémon we create here no longer have rock typing, doesn't mean that rock type Pokémon are something to underestimate. Let's see if you understand that. Topher leads with Resineedle. It's a tough bug, but you manage to take it down. Next up, Topher brings out the artistic Quilvamir. After you break through its defenses, Topher sends out a familiar silhouette. We introduced a pre-evolution to Aerodactyl a while back, and now it's time for it to finally get its evolution. Now, this is one fossil line that is keeping the rock typing all the way through, and that is due to Mega Aerodactyl being said to be closer to its ancient form. So, we're going to use Mega Aerodactyl as inspiration, but I didn't want to worry about deviating too much from its silhouette. Now, there are some Mega Evolutions that just feel a little too much at times, and Mega Aerodactyl rides that line. It's basically like, hey, I heard you like Aerodactyl. Well, what do you think about rock spikes? Whoa, so cool. And, you know, there's part of me that appreciates how much they just went for it. So we're not going to really shy away from the rock spikes too much. I also wanted to reference some of the seemingly impractical, long, ornate head crests that other pterosaurs had. So, in the end, we're gonna have a very spiky boy here. To the point that it's probably not a particularly good flyer. So many rock spikes. Like, you may be best buddies with your primal Aerodactyl, but you may struggle to give it a hug. Um, the colors are just following through from Stalactile. And of course, the shiny is the regular version's colors. This is Primal Aerodactyl, the fossil Pokemon. The primal form of this well-known Pokemon is wild and incredibly difficult to train. Nearly every part of Primal Aerodactyl's body is covered by sharpened rocky protrusions. They struggle to fly due to their surprising weight, but are effective hunters on the ground as well. And it gets the ability Aerial 8, so normal type attacks become flying type with a 20% increased power. And that basically makes up for the fact that it's getting the dragon typing instead of the flying type. This true form of Aerodactyl is quite the challenge. Basically hitting you with triple stab is pretty rough, but you eventually take it down. Next, Topher brings out his Tiktanthic. It's big and bulky and a pain to get through. After that, his Bledgeer cuts down a bunch of your team before finally fainting. Topher is visibly angry that you are doing so much better than your rival, Grant. Left with no other option, he sends out his Ace. Ooh, yeah, we are getting really close to having filled in all of the missing evolutions. Just one more after we make this Rock type. Yes, the Rock type Eevee. Generally, this tends to be one of the more boring evolutions I've seen, and that's usually due to one thing, the color palette. I mean, it's just hard to make it interesting when they just tend to be monochromatic gray or beige blobs. So we're going to sidestep that issue by not focusing on normal rocks, and instead and instead give our evolution mineral deposits on its body that are actually glistening crystals. We don't want it to be too overwhelming, but the color just breathes so much life into the design. And personality, too. The little bit of glitz from the gems replaces what could 
pretty easily be just another bland and stoic rock type. I went with emeralds for a couple reasons. Firstly, the slightly bluish green just happens to be my favorite color, so that's fun. And secondly, amongst all of the existing evolutions and my new designs, I wanted there to be a good balance of the colors. And other than Leafian, there's just not a lot of green going on, so these shiny greens are a perfect addition. And to be complimentary, the shiny gets to have rubies. Okay. Let's meet our rock-type evolution, Gemion, the crystallized Pokemon. This rock-type evolution fosters the growth of strong crystals on its body by rolling around in rare mineral deposits. Gemion sometimes forget about the abrasive nature of their rocky protrusions, as their affectionate nature often leaves their trainers with scrapes and bruises. Researchers suspect that Gemion crystals may be different in other regions. And its ability is clear body, you know, because of the crystals, and that prevents other Pokemon from lowering its stats. It takes quite some time to chip away at this cute little rock type, but you do manage to take it down. Topher heals it back up and lets it snug into his beard as he congratulates you. You didn't crumble under the pressure, and I applaud that. Here, you will need this. Needing only one more access code, you are ready to burst into the final lab. That'll be in the next episode, but before we end this episode, I've got two more Pokemon to reveal. These two are based on the suggestion from James Gabor. James wanted me to look at the extinct giant platypuses, or platypi, whichever you prefer. Not only that, but James also had a genius idea to play up the pieced together look of platypuses and then kind of work it into a ghostly, taxidermy look. Now, I won't be showing any footage of me drawing these Pokemon, as I'll be using those to make a How to Create Fakemon series in the near future. So, we're actually just gonna hop straight to the dex entries. First up is Platy Stitch, the Soned Pokemon. Fossils of this ancient ghost type confounded researchers for decades. Platy stitch fossils were initially believed to be a collection of unrelated species. Its pieced together appearance appears to be a defense mechanism as it spooks other Pokemon. Platy stitch enjoy consuming electricity as it helps power their ghostly bodies. And its ability then is Lightning Rod. So instead of taking any damage from electric type attacks, it has its special attack raised. It's pretty stinking adorable. Uh, but, since those giant extinct platypuses were, well, giant, uh, it'll need to get much bigger when it evolves. It also has an additional influence, let me know if you can spot it. Say hello to Platystein, the sewn Pokemon. This lumbering ghost type appears quite ghoulish, but is incredibly gentle and kind. Potentially due to the assortment of body parts it sports, Platystein regularly use water, poison, electric, and of course, ghost-type attacks. They don't have the best control over their stitched-together bodies and are incredibly clumsy. And the ability remains Lightning Rod because of a, a you know, Frankenstein reference. These two turned out to be a great addition to the ghost-type. And while I could have added a number of secondary types, it's always nice to have another monotype in there. You'll have to let me know what you think of these two down in the comments. And again, be sure to keep an eye out for the How to Create Fakemon series that I will be releasing after the Paleon region wraps, where I'll be using these two to showcase my process. With no time to waste, you burst into the last lab. Amy, the dragon-type head researcher, swooshes her cape melodramatically and beckons you closer. It looks as though I'm all that stands in your way now. Do you have what it takes to tame the terrifying might of my dragon Pokemon? Amy starts out strong with her own primal Aerodactyl. But luckily, you learned how to deal with it when you fought Topher. Next, her Drakento and then her Hadratoot are both tanky and take some time to get through. She then follows up with two newly restored fossil Pokemon. First up, our tiny little dragon-type Tyrunt 
is getting to be king again. Now, regular Tyrantrum is a pretty solid design, and it isn't going to get all that many changes, especially compared to some of the other fossil Pokémon. This design is going to be about two main things. Firstly, we're taking the rage burning inside Tyrantrum and having that manifest as a new fire typing, so we'll need to communicate that. And secondly, there are still a couple tweaks to make. Now, the things to cut, right away, the beard, all right? I always hated the beard. I understand that it's supposed to make the design look more like a king, but whatever, that thing had to go. And same goes for the crown. We're not going to get rid of it completely, just simplify it down to three points instead. The original crown, you know, just felt a little cluttered up there, in my opinion. We are also gonna take the previous collar of feathers and turn that into a collar of flame. This lets us minimize the amount of feathering overall. We now know that adult Rexes weren't covered in long feathers, as it most likely just had a fine, short layer of proto-feathers. Think of the wee bit of hair that an elephant still has, even though, you know, they're so big. But I still wanted to show that the Rex did have at least some form of short feathering. So we're going to cover that feathering with ash to make it more visible. The colors fell into place pretty easily, and I do love how keeping the face white makes it feel like a flaming skull, which is, you know, it's pretty awesome. And by coloring lightly inside of the mouth, you can almost feel that fire that is burning inside of it. All right, let's take a look at Primal Tyrantrum, the Fire King Pokemon. This regal Pokemon focuses its rage into an intense internal fire. The feathers along their back are coated in a fine protective ash. Primal Tyrantrum rule their territories by striking fear into all other Pokemon. They have much more control over their temper now and help Little Tyrant to manage their own anchor. And its ability is Strong Jaw, and that increases the power of all biting moves by 50%. Tyrantrum is a well-balanced special attacker, and though its attack stat isn't quite as high, the Strong Jaw ability means that it is still able to deal a lot of damage with its ferocious maw. I mean, this thing doesn't care who it faces, it will damage everybody the same. But you do manage to knock it out. Amy follows up with her second restored fossil Pokemon, and this will finish up with all of the primal fossils, actually. Very exciting. All right, I love little Anorith so much, and I felt like it deserved a real kick-butt evolution in our region. There is a typing that I've always felt Armaldo was just a hair away from, the dragon typing. So we're gonna pull the design in that direction just enough to justify the awesome dual typing of bug and dragon. First up is the face. Extending the snout just a little bit and adding some fangs really feels draconic. Changing the placement of the eyes is also going to make it feel a little bit less buggy. Next up, we'll be changing and simplifying some of the patterning and plating on the underside so that it feels more like the, you know, lighter underbelly of a dragon. I mean, it's still obviously armored like a bug and the arms are, you know, sticking out of the plating just the same but we're gonna slide dragon where we can. Lastly, the weird scale feather things on Armaldo's neck are going to drop down under the back coverings. This lets me squish them together into something that feels more like a wing while still feeling bug-like. I mean, especially with them being able to pop out from under the back covers, you know, like a beetle. But yeah, that's the balance of bug and dragon that it needed. The color palette was easy enough to find here with some classic dragon colors coming in. And of course, as with all of the previous primal fossil designs, its shiny will also be based on the original design. Okay, let's check out the final correctly restored fossil Pokemon, Primal Armaldo, the plate Pokemon. Researchers were surprised to see dragon type characteristics present in Primal Anorith's evolution. This Armaldo's armor plates are somehow even stronger than its rock-type counterpart. 
Its fangs, claws, and tail are all deadly weapons. When this Pokemon summons rain, it is said to become unstoppable. And its ability is Swift Swim, which is to reference the fact that the original inspiration for these animals is aquatic, and that doubles the Pokemon's speed during the rain. Primal Armaldo has terrible special defense that you are hoping to take advantage of, but after it sets up the rain, it begins speedily sweeping through your team. You eventually pull through and knock it out, though. But you are left with a single Pokemon as Amy sends out her ace. Okay, it's time for us to fill in the very last unused evolution type dragon. Here's another difficult type to incorporate into an evolution. Kind of like Bug, the overall characteristics of the type don't gel particularly well with the mammalian look of Eevee. In this case, most people just tend to slap some horns and dragon wings on it and call it good, but I wanted to avoid the wings entirely as this is a dragon type, not a flying type, and since our flying type evolution doesn't have wings, I didn't want there to be any confusion about which is which. And instead of just, you know, adding horns, I wanted to challenge myself all right, by somehow still introducing that reptilian feel into the design without just slapping stuff on the head. As you can see, I played around quite a bit with the pose and the body plan. Again, it's just really tough to find the right balance of features. Oh, and in the end, I felt comfortable changing the feet ever so slightly to look as if they have talons. This is different from all of the other evolutions, but I think it's fine here. And giving a tail, similar to Vaporeon, but of course with a different end, gave it a familiar but, you know, vaguely draconic silhouette. I couldn't get the idea of whiskers out of my head, you know, paying homage to the various Asian dragons, uh, so I plopped those on there as well. I felt it was important. What with this being Pokemon and all, for the dragon not to feel too much like a dragon from the West. This proved to be the right choice, and the fluffy manes seen on Asian dragons let me add tufts of fur to the legs and tail. This fuzz is a great way to bridge the mammalian and reptilian features together. And just to further tie things together, when it came to color, I was able to give the suggestion of scales with all of these extra little markings. The colors did take me forever to finalize. There was already enough going on with the design, so I knew that the color palette would need to read as clean and simple as possible. That's why in the end, though I had been toying around with three different colors, I eventually changed one of those to white to really limit the palette. Oh, and to pay respects to the influence, our shiny is reds and golds like a Chinese dragon. Alrighty, let's finish up the evolutions with Drakeon, the fierce Pokemon. This dragon-type evolution is particularly difficult to train. Drakeon's savage nature causes it to completely ignore all but the most skilled trainers. Its draconic appearance was initially thought to be unnatural, but researchers suggest this evolution may be more akin to an ancient Eevee ancestor's appearance. And its ability is multi-scale, and that reduces damage taken whenever HP is full. Drakeon's ability lets it take a hit no problem while it sets up a Dragon Dance, further boosting its formidable attack and speed. This is by far the most ferocious evolution that you have come across. To Amy's surprise, you are able to fell her ace. She heals her Drakeon, clumsily scoops it up into her arms, and approaches you. Very impressive! I never expected you to earn this, but somehow you did! That's it. You have all 12 access codes needed to get into the elevator to Ginkgo's lab. As you leave, Amy smiles at you and her tracheon grumbles and nods its head in approval. <laughs> you hop into the centrally located elevator and scan your ID badge to descend. With the last necessary access code in your possession, you ride the elevator down. It drops much lower than you expected, like much, much lower. You are definitely far below the waves now, 
and when the door opens, you find that you are in a glass dome on the ocean floor. It is nearly pitch black down here, but you can see the professor standing in a pool of light, desperately interacting with a control panel. How did you... You can't be down here! You don't understand what is going on here at all! You don't know what I need to do! When Psycat and I first arrived here, we discovered a dormant Pokémon. We studied the strange poison it secreted, and found a way to restore all of the Paleon region and its Pokémon. But I soon discovered a second slumbering Pokémon, and realized how wrong I was to tamper with the natural order. The lights rise on the obscured form of the dormant legendary. The ball of jagged stone lies half buried in a crater. From within the mass, a burning eye flickers open for just a second. And when you look at Ginkgo, you see her eyes glowing the same color. She gestures to a glass cell filled with levitating rocks. I've been diligently collecting these. Shards of this great legendary lost during a great battle eons ago. I don't have them all, but this should be enough to wake it from its slumber. It doesn't want the Paleon region restored. We should never have done that. It wants it all gone. I need to set things right. I need to wake it fully so it can eliminate all life in the Paleon region as it once did. You run at the possessed Professor Ginkgo and release your starter Pokémon to battle her. She counters with her own starter. After that, the unassuming Whirlicon proves quite difficult to faint. And then her Eevion is a Trixie Chameleon. Next up, we get the final stage of the adorable Rhinosi line. As a reminder, the tiny little baby grass rhino ended up getting its nose sunburnt and has since gained the fire typing. The red hot horn of Rhino Seer is now no longer able to contain the heat, giving us these awesome split flames. Before, the line was pulling mainly from the woolly rhinoceros, but I knew early on that I wanted to end up with the dual horns present on Megaceros. Beyond that, I just wanted the design to feel a little bit more like a classic, monstrous Pokémon. That means, even though the inspiration is decidedly quadrupedal, it'll get this hunched over, kind of partially upright pose. I also just had a blast making the fire and grass types work together. Singeing the ears and leafage on the back gives the design like just a lot of great texture. We'll be continuing with the color palette that Rhino Seer was using, and the shiny, of course, gets to be dead and burnt leaves, which is pretty fun. Alright, this is Mino Seer, the hot horn Pokemon. The two superheated flames that continually shoot from this Pokemon's nostrils are hot enough to partially burn its own waxy leaves. Mino Seer are quick to anger and require open spaces to charge across when they need to cool down. Their nose flames only extinguish when they're drinking water, where steam erupts from the nose instead. Its ability is Flame Striker, and that means that contact moves have a chance of burning the opponent. With well-rounded stats and an annoying ability, Minoseer is a real toughie. You are able to take it down, but it's followed up by something even more vicious. A number of you were able to predict that the tiny Cortulli would be turning into the Tully Monster, and here we are. If you aren't familiar with the Tully Monster or Tully Monstrum, it is a super strange species that people just could not figure out for ages. First off, it's tiny, but I mean, we're gonna play up the monsterness in its name and make it huge, but it's, the actual animal is tiny and scientists just couldn't agree what it was or what it was even related to. Anyway, it has this fun little extended mouth, and then these eye stalks. Just truly alien looking, to the point where I didn't have to change much for it to read like a Pokemon. Just elaborating the top and bottom fins with some spikes, exaggerating the size of the mouth, and I guess figuring out a color palette that works for its new secondary typing. Again, rolling with the monster in its name, 
This meanie will gain the dark type. I love that our region just has so many aquatic animals that we've been able to justify not needing the water type. All right, let's take a look at Taliath, the Enigma Pokemon. Scientists were baffled by this Pokemon's poorly preserved fossils and only understood its bizarre form when it was successfully revived. Taliath are incredibly intelligent, but think little of others. They often lash out at others for the smallest annoyances. Trainers can earn Taliath's trust, but only after a great deal of work. And its ability is Levitate. Again, since it's using its psychic power to, you know, fly through the air, and that means that this Pokemon is immune to ground-based attacks. I love how much the Tully monster just felt like a Pokemon already, and this thing just fits in perfectly. You do knock it out, but you are down to your final Pokemon as Professor Ginkgo sends out the fully evolved pseudo-legendary. Our Goopy Sludgeolum is going to form into a fully functional organism. I knew that I wouldn't be able to make it through the Paleon decks without getting a Carnotaurus in there somewhere, and having it be our pseudo-legendary just felt like a great fit. That also means that as it forms into a complete animal, the fossils in its body are being used more as actual bones, and it's gaining the dragon typing to replace the rock typing. I know there are some people out there who get annoyed that almost every pseudo-legendary is a dragon type, but for a region that is filled with dinosaurs, I mean, our pseudo-legendary just kind of had to be a dragon type. I had a lot of fun, you know, figuring out how the bones would still be visible, you know, communicating the rounded part of the ribs and the jagged jaw. Just a lot of cool elements to bring into this almost undead looking design. And this certainly is on the edge of what Pokemon would feasibly put in their games, since it's a little gruesome. Oh, and the shiny in particular feels even more visceral. All right, let's take a look at Carnotox. The New Life Pokemon. Strange chemical byproducts from research in the Paleon region resulted in the gooey sludge of this Pokemon's body. Carnotox's rudimentary muscle system is based on an amalgamation of trace DNA from various fossils. They are fast and intimidating, but show affection to anyone who can look past their grisly appearance and treat them like any other Pokemon and its ability remains gooey, so that means contact with the Pokemon lowers the attacker's speed stat. With awesome pseudo-legendary stats, a kick-butt typing, and an ability that makes up for its, you know, kind of decent speed, this thing is a serious threat. You'll have to let me know what you think of the pseudo-legendary line for the Paleon region. After her final Pokemon falls, Professor Ginkgo's eyes roll back in her head and she passes out. With the aid of Grant and the other researchers, you are able to get her back into the elevator and up to safety. When she finally comes to, her eyes have returned to normal. I can't believe I let that legendary Pokemon overtake my mind. Psych had warned me that I was changing as I worked on it, but I wouldn't listen. I love our restored fossil Pokemon, but I had slowly become overcome with the desire to destroy it all. Not only did you save me, but you saved all of the Paleon region. And with that, the credits to the game roll. However, this dormant legendary Pokemon is quite troubling. There's more to be done if you wish to ensure that nothing catastrophic happens in the future. Alright, some time has passed, but you have returned to the Cenozone Lab to check on the nefarious dormant legendary. To your surprise, you find Grant working at the control panel. Oh good, you're back. I've been busy trying to learn all I can about this strange legendary Pokemon. It seems as though Professor Ginkgo was collecting the missing pieces that were scattered all across the Paleon region in the distant past. She hoped to introduce them back to the dormant Pokemon in hopes of awakening it. <laughs> Luckily, she didn't get that chance. But it looks like there are still some more of those strange rocks out there. To ensure that nobody else gets the same idea, we should collect the remaining pieces so that they can all be contained securely. Here, I've rigged up a scanner that shows you where they are. Looking at your map, you now find icons showing the positions of the remaining legendary shards. It will take some time to collect them all and ensure the safety of the region. 
As you leave the underwater lab, you are greeted by the newly appointed Professor Psycad. Ah, there you are. I just wanted to thank you again for stopping Professor Ginkgo in time. She's taking a much needed break in Alola. I did want to let you know that some visiting professors from other regions have shown up to aid me with research. Just to give them the appropriate clearance, I've designated them the grass, fire, water, electric, psychic, and fairy type head researchers. You may want to track them down to gain further insight on this region's past and increase that access code level even higher. Taking a look at your map again, you now have elemental icons showing where these other professors are. You also remember that there were three restricted gates across the Paleon region, each labeled with a large 18. You'll need to track down these visiting researchers and get all of their access codes if you want to get through the final access gates. And since it's nearby, you head north to the floating platform where the water type icon indicates. You soon spot a friendly researcher in plaid. Austin is a researcher from the Cascade region and is all too happy to get a battle in. In fact, you'll need to battle all of these visiting researchers. Austin has a full team of Pokemon from the Cascade region. Vakwamail, Sanuk, Garuchi, Umbralu, Glashulim, which actually isn't a water type, but acts as a great curveball, and then even a war cane. Links to Loxton's Cascade region in the description below. After you defeat him, Austin gives you the water type access code and eagerly shares with you some of his recent discoveries on the Paleon region. He pulls out a stone that has been crudely etched into. Some unknown Pokemon has been leaving pictographs around the region. He explains that the Paleon region thrived in ancient times until a legendary Pokemon of extinction arrived and threatened it. A rival legendary Pokemon arrived to stop its rampage and a vicious battle began. With this new discovery, you head south and arrive in Salur City. You quickly come across a researcher in a stylish jacket. This is Jack, the electric type specialist hailing from the Maza region. Jack is all too ready to battle and leads with his Road Raptor, followed by a Chispeka, Kafkaracha, Flitjitter, Malharo, and then a Mega Gohila. A truly shocking team. And there's a link to the rest of Subjective Lee's Maza region below. Jack gives you the electric type access code before pulling out yet another Pokemon carving. Jack has no idea what Pokemon is making these drawings, but analyzes the images nonetheless. It seems that the Extinction Legendary lost much of its form during the battle. Small pieces of its body broke off and scattered around the region. In a final act, the Extinction Legendary rose into the sky and plummeted back down onto the Paleon region. With that new information, you head into the thermal caves of Mount Paleo. Here, you find a rather hip researcher, insisting that you call him Hoops. He hails from the Norklo region and specializes in Psychic-type Pokemon. The two of you battle, and you have a tough time against his Itini, Cerebrufo, Cinchilla, Bubblies, the non-psychic but adorable Venopine, and even a Mega Grumpig. Check out more of Hoop and Hip Hop's Pokemon Cardinal series in the description below. He congratulates you on the victory and gives you the psychic access code. He also has another strange carving to show off, explaining that the Extinction Legendary's impact obliterated all life in the region. With its energy exhausted, it fell into a dormant state at the bottom of Paleon Bay. Though dormant, its negative aura ensured that nothing would grow in the Paleon region. On your travels around the region, you also discover that the hotel back on Route 10 is now operational. Talented trainers from all over the world are visiting here and looking for a chance to battle. You take a short break from tracking down professors and collecting legendary stones to battle your way up the increasingly difficult hotel floors. One of the guests is none other than Jim from the Solar Region. He shows off his Agravelas, Batazoom, Solarian Polyrath, Poisoverane, Palletgeist, and the wonderful Rotopon. See more of Pewter City Jim's Solar Region linked below. 
There's a ton of trainers here at the battle facility. I mean, if you have a Pokemon region of your own, who knows, maybe you'd be visiting here too. But needing a break from the cold of Mount Paleo, you fly all the way to the west side of the island. And studying the cliff faces here, you find another researcher. This is Professor Spruce from the Cornera region. Unable to settle on fire types alone, he also battles you with a number of formidable ground types as well. Say hello to the adorable Corneran Slurpuff, Pyrat, Tortress, Spurfetched, Slowstack, and Corneran Decidui. Check out more of Pragmagic's Cornera region linked below. Spruce gives you the fire type access code as quickly as he can because he's just too excited to show off his new findings. He pries a new stone from the cliff face and studies the carvings on it. He theorizes that some very intelligent Pokemon must have made these. He explains that with the threat neutralized, the opposing legendary had also exhausted itself. But wanting to help rebuild the world, it used the last of its energy to create three guiding Pokemon. After this, it too fell into a dormant state. These guiding Pokemon sound like they could be fey in nature. You book it to the fairy type researcher who you find has just arrived on the dock at Camp Raihan. This is Boreal, fresh off the boat from the Germansburg region. You fill her in on the other drawings and she agrees that they sound like a trio of fairy type Pokemon. She lets out her Pokemon to stretch after their voyage and you get into another battle. You have to take down her Rabble Raptor, Germansburgian Drovalisk, Fafroon, Crow King, Splendog, and the oh so cool Cryocany. Check out more of Boreal Mines Germansburg region linked below. She gives you the fairy type research code and recounts what little Psycad had conveyed to her over the phone. It seems that when Professor Ginkgo and Psycad found that helpful legendary, they were unable to awaken it, and instead collected and studied its strange toxic secretions. This led to the technology to restore life to the region. You start to trek through the dense jungles around the abandoned lab until you happen upon Ron, a researcher from the Asone region. He looks up from a recently discovered carving and pats his little elephant. He's excited that you just need the grass type access code that he has, but decides to make it a bit more of a challenge. After a moment of rearranging his team, Ron sends out a Persephant, Grassassin, Thunderix, Lorisurge, Actite, and even a legendary, Macog. Go and check out the rest of True Green 7's Asone region down in the description. Ron congratulates you, but as he reaches out with his ID badge to tap it against yours, something swoops down from the sky and grabs it straight out of his hand. Someone riding a mysterious Pokemon lands in a clearing nearby. He apologizes for taking Ron's access code, but he slept in and wants in on the fun. This is Toby, uh, I mean, this is Herman from the Olympia region. From the way he's messing with Ron, they appear to be good friends. Ron sighs and motions that you battle his bird keeping friend. Straight from the Olympia region, you have to take down Spook Hoot, Happen, Pinaclaw, Furipin, Zelosis, and a Serapin. Check out the rest of Birdkeeper Toby's Pokemon Tempest series linked down below. You're given the final access code as the two researchers huddle over Ron's recently discovered carving. They concur that it seems if the trio of fairy type Pokemon are returned to the helpful legendary, they may be able to wake it from its dormant state. With all of the visiting professors met and defeated, your access code level is finally high enough to get through the last three restricted gates in the region. The remaining legendary shards lie beyond those gates as well, along with who knows what else. Alright, you recall that back on Route 1, inside Plyo Cave, and on Route 13, you had found access gates with large 18s on them. Now it's time to visit those. First up, Route 1. On the other side, you find a peaceful, secluded grotto 
where you can catch wild Cactamo, Cactolodge, and Ankylotus. I mean, you gotta be able to finish that dex if you didn't pick Cactamo early on. It's a rather pleasant little area, and after some exploring, you come across another legendary shard. You only need two more after this one. And waiting in a clearing is the first of a legendary trio. This is also the first because there is decidedly an order to these Pokemon. We'll be calling them the Progress Trio, and they are tied to the rise and fall of civilizations. So, our first form is going to be all about discovery and be loosely based on Prometheus. The other bit of imagery that I wanted to work in was an hourglass, and I found a way to work that right into the little mask-like face pretty easily. The curved lines are subtle enough that it isn't screaming hourglass. And being the first member of our trio and having all of the time ahead of it still, its hourglass is going to have its sand still up at the top. So it gets a cute little forehead marking, little tuft of hair fire, and that'll just be on the upper part of the hourglass. I also knew that I wanted this trio to be fairy types for two reasons. One, love the imagery of the Miyazaki like Kodama forest spirits, and I wanted this trio to feel a little bit like that. And secondly, there are still a couple unused fairy pairings that we'll be able to knock out with these designs. So, I'm pretty sure you could guess from Prometheus alone, but this will be fairy and fire. Which I cannot believe we still haven't got yet. The color palette is pretty straightforward. I mean, I already had an idea of what it was going to be, but it just so happened that the reference image of Prometheus just kind of matched it perfectly too. Uh, and for the shiny, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't have any cool inspirations. I just wanted them to be punchier and exciting versions of the palette. All right, let's meet the first of the progress trio. This is Promisty, the discovery Pokemon. Depictions of this curious Pokemon are seen amongst the oldest civilizations. It is often shown presenting fire for the first time. Promisty traveled the world, acting as a muse for early humans. It values discovery and ingenuity above all else, but has returned to the Paleon region as it has sensed potential doom for its home and creator. And its ability is adaptability, so that increases its stab from 1.5 to 2. It's a little cutie, and you go ahead and capture it. For the sake of Pokemon Amber, this would be an instance where if you accidentally knocked it out, you could return and try and catch it again, because as a reminder, you'll need all three of these if you want to wake up the legendary that created them. Flying over to Plyo Cave, you find another access gate and pass through it. After a dark, winding tunnel, you emerge on the east coast of the island in another tranquil, secluded area. This time, you get the opportunity to catch Wild Fleetwee, Ovanish, and Flytor. You explore this area and pick up another legendary shard, just one more to go. And, like last time, you find a legendary waiting in a calm clearing. So, this trio is about the rise and fall of civilization, so what do you have in the middle? Well, you have stability and order. Our main point of inspiration is going to come from Themis, the Greek god of law and order. I uh, mean, you may recognize her more often as that blind lady with the sword and scales, all the justice and whatnot, so she'll be our jumping off point. Now, we're also going to tweak the proportions a bit. I mean, Promisty was really just a little kid, but now we have essentially an adult. Going back to the hourglass motif on the mask, all of the sand here is being held in the center of the hourglass, and that's why she gets this kind of banded symbol right in the middle of the mask. Well, the other thing that I definitely glossed over with the first design is how the arms work with this trio. This design shows it a little better, but they don't really have arms. Instead, there's kind of a ribbon that comes down from the underside of the mask, wraps around their backs, and then is essentially an arm on the other side. So overall, silhouette-wise, I want them to look like they're holding a mask up to their face and then have a free thematic hand as well. In this case, what was a torch for Promisty is now a sword of justice. She will, you know, smite you down if you go breaking any rules. And that brings us to the typing. Now, 
I know that we just recently got a fairy and fighting type in Scarlet and Violet, but when I was initially making this trio, that typing wasn't covered yet. So yeah, we're doing fairy and fighting. And I think the fighting type works really well for, you know, the law and order part. Kind of like the Swords of Justice. All right, let's meet our second of the trio. Here is Themisty, the order Pokemon. This stoic Pokemon has been glimpsed throughout the ages whenever a civilization is on the brink of collapse. The Misty was often able to inspire humans to maintain control and order, though its means were often cold and calculated. It has returned to the Paleon region in hopes of assisting its mysterious creator, and its ability is steadfast so that raises the speed stat each time the Pokemon flinches. Pretty kick butt. And I like that this trio feels, you know, kind of like the Lake Guardians a bit, but if they had a little more personality. Okay, you catch it because, you know, you're awesome, and you hightail it to Route 13. After passing through this final gate, you find a beautiful little lagoon. Wild, Sailil, Sliscale, and Spinozar are splashing about in the water and just waiting for you to catch them. In addition to them, you find the very last legendary shard. Very cool. You could rush back to the Cenozone lab and hand them off to Grant, but you know that there's got to be a final trio member here. And sure enough, you find it standing on a rock, staring out to sea. As you approach, you see that it is scratching markings into a stone. It seems that this was the Pokemon that was leaving all of those pictographic records all over the Paleon region. Very interesting. Downfall of civilization time. How pleasant, am I right? So, who are we going to be dealing with here? Well, this is a lesser known Greek god, Geras. He is the Greek god of old age. And honestly, he's probably the least important inspiration. I mean, yeah, we want the design to look elderly. Like the last of the sand is rushing out of the hourglass. In fact, right off the bat, I mean, just look at the mask. Uh, just having the sand down at the bottom of the hourglass, and it, it's kind of pouring out and becoming this wonderful old man beard. We're also tweaking the pose again. Things get nice and hunched over, and what was previously a torch and a sword is now a cane. I actually initially thought that I would do a play on the, you know, what animals on four legs, two legs, then three riddle, but I just couldn't think of a good way to do Promisty on all fours, so that got thrown out pretty quick. But I knew that I wanted this final member to have a cute little cane, and with this pose and its short little legs, it ended up being the most grounded of the three. Speaking of being grounded, you know what other typing hasn't been paired with fairy yet? Yep, yep, it's the ground type. Now, this connection is maybe not as strong as the other two, but the hourglass imagery along with, you know, things crumbling to dust are enough for me to justify the fairy and ground type. A few splotchy markings on the body help tie the typing in a little bit too, and and these colors are pretty intentionally muted, you know, being like a faded old man, but they work for the ground type too. All right, let's wrap up our trio with Grimisty, the downfall Pokemon. Sightings of this contemplative Pokemon are often interpreted as a sign of approaching ruin. While Grimisty often accompanies the downfall of a civilization, it also encourages the documentation and passing down of knowledge. Strange carvings across the Paleon region appear to be Grimisty recounting its past, and its ability is aftermath, you know, since it's the end of civilization, and that means if a Pokemon knocks it out, it will lose a fourth of its HP. Yeah, it's a sweet old man who lets you know that it's just all gonna come crashing down around you. So, of course, you catch it. Good work, you nerd. Uh, but what do you think? What do you think of Grimisty, Themisty, and Promisty? Which one of them is your favorite? I would love to hear your thoughts about this legendary trio down in the comments below. Well, you've got all of the legendary shards that you need to return to Grant in the underwater lab, and this new fairy type trio should be able to wake the dormant legendary in Ginkgo's office. All right, first thing is first, you hightail it back to Santa's own lab. When you visit Professor Ginkgo's office on top of the building, the dormant legendary is still hovering in the middle of the room, all goopy and weird and everything. As you approach, 
the legendary fairy trio that you recently caught emerge from their Pokeballs and circle around their dormant creator. They do a cute little dance, and the blob of ooze shudders and slowly unfolds before you. Now, initially going into this project, I had really only planned on there being one legendary, so this one was added right before I started with all of the scripts and whatnot. I knew that I needed to have a second legendary, but I just could not find a good counterpoint to what I already had planned. Uh, spoiler alert if you haven't figured it out, but the other legendary that is lying in a crater is an extinction themed legendary. So it took me a little bit of time to figure out what this design would be. I mean, the tough thing is that I can't just do creation or life because I mean, the other legendary isn't death. It's specifically extinction, specifically the process of a species dying out. So what keeps a species from dying out? Well, adapting to the environment. So this will be the adaptation legendary. Also kind of the natural selection Pokemon. The other thing that this let me do was squeeze in another typing. Now, when I came up with this, Grafii didn't exist yet, so we were covering an unused type. We'll be dealing with a normal and poison type here. And as much as I love Grafii, it's not particularly deserving of the normal type. I mean, it could have just as easily been a mono poison type. So what I was going for here is something that thematically kind of needs to be both normal and poison. With natural selection, you have your mutations, poison type, that are hopefully advantageous and become part of the functioning organism, normal type. A little out there, but you know, just go with me here. Now, as far as the design goes, I wanted something that felt like the leader of the fairy type legendary trio. And that's where this humanoid build came from and the expressionless mask-like face. The poison on its body also let me do a really fun asymmetrical design, which again, you don't always get to do with Pokemon. That goo may look pretty familiar as it's the basis of the pseudo legendary line, little Fossage, Sludgeolum, and Carnotox. Just a fun bit of lore connecting them. All right, let's meet our first box legendary. This is Mutineo, the adaptation Pokemon. Researchers are still studying this Pokemon's poisonous body. The strange gelatinous spikes are always quivering and shifting into new biological structures. While the slime is still potentially destructive, Mutineo can also accelerate beneficial mutations in itself and others. Though large and intimidating, it seeks to aid Pokemon in need. If ill-adapted to an environment, Mutineo will help change their biology. And its ability is something new that I am calling Mutation. And that means that a random one of the Pokemon's stats will increase by one stage every turn. Mutineo thanks you for waking it from its slumber and respectfully engages you in battle. It's tough, obviously, and its ability makes it a bit unpredictable to deal with. You catch it, nice work, and you decide to head down the elevator to the underwater Cenozone lab. It took some time, you know, traipsing all over the region, but you are excited to return the last of the legendary shards to their containment cell. You plop them in there, but after you do so, your rival Grant turns to you. His eyes glow with the same light you had seen once in Professor Ginkgo's. Thank you so much. Looks like you've managed to return all the remaining pieces. You see, I've realized it was foolish to want to leave this Pokemon in slumber forever. Oh, frustrated with your mentors and friends continually being possessed by this legendary Pokemon, you battle Grant in hopes of ending all of this. Grant's team is extremely formidable now. He uses an Ankylotus, friendly and tanky as ever, Flytor, intelligent and speedy, Spinosaur, aggressive and ferocious, a Quetzal Key with its pretty awesome typing, an Eeveon that is constantly changing its type, and a Carnotox, which is terrifying and goopy. But you manage to defeat Grant. He stumbles backwards in anger and manages to press the button opening the legendary rock's containment cell. They all sail over and rejoin the ball of rock. 
The earth shakes beneath your feet, and it rises out of its crater, fully formed again. We've had a bunch of people clambering for an asteroid Pokemon, and here we finally are. I mean, I knew early on that we had to have an asteroid. I mean, it kind of had to be the big bad legendary. It's also letting us knock out the final unused type combination, rock and ghost. Yep, across the Pokemon Amber series, we have covered every single unused type combination, and this final Pokemon of the decks is the last piece of that puzzle. An asteroid Pokemon could definitely be, you know, rock and fire just as easily, but with this being our big bad and being so closely tied to death and extinction, the ghost type is absolutely perfect. The only thing that I was a little unsure of going in was what to do with the tail. In my initial sketch, it was just a trail of fire, you know, kind of colored all ghosty, but I eventually landed on something a little more wispy and ethereal. And yeah, it ended up turning out pretty freaking sweet, if I do say so myself. Um, also, like its counterpart, it was fun to just get a touch of asymmetry, you know, with the crumbling bits of rock. Yeah, yeah, rock types, they lend themselves pretty well to subtle variability like this. And I will say, I mean, it's a little bit of extra work, but doing the colored line work really elevates the rendering. I mean, for these two in particular, it takes what would normally be an extremely limited color palette for these legendaries and just makes them pop. Okay, enough talk. Let's check out Spectrect, the extinction Pokemon. This malicious Pokemon destroyed all life in the Paleon region millions of years ago, and sat in a dormant state at the bottom of the ocean. Spectrix overwhelming ghost-type energy leaves it with an unwavering desire to obliterate natural life. Researchers are uncertain if this Pokemon could ever be tamed, and its ability is Decay. This is a new one, and it's basically the opposite of what Mutineo has, so that lowers a random stat of an opposing Pokemon every turn. And with no other choice, you engage in battle. Like Mutineo, its ability is unpredictable and a bit of a pain to deal with, but eventually, you capture the legendary Pokemon. And with that, you have encountered every Pokemon in the Paleon region and saved the freaking day. Honestly, things seem pretty stable in the Paleon region. Professor Psycad is successfully keeping an eye on the region as a whole, as Professor Ginkgo is still soaking up the sun in Alola. But... It isn't long before your buddy Mal catches up with you. There you are. I've been looking all over for you. I've just discovered something that you just had to know about. Well, remember that time that we may have accidentally blew up Psycad and Ginkgo's old lab and let loose that hybrid legendary? Well, I was digging through the rubble and I found numerous references to another island. Apparently, when research was just starting out, they used this island as a large nursery to raise the newly revived species. When Professor Ginkgo started to lose control, the island was just abandoned. I asked Professor Psycad about it, but she told me to stay away from it because she's worried I might blow up another lab there. Gosh, you blow up one lab, and people are so sensitive about it. Anyway, I'm planning to check it out. Are you in? You can't resist, and the two of you are able to borrow a boat and make sail for the small nearby island. From afar, you can just barely make out an overgrown building at the heart of the island. The sheer cliffs and choppy water make for a dangerous approach, but luckily you find a dock and tie up your small boat. Whoa, yeah, it looks like they left this place in a hurry. Just look at all this stuff that didn't even make it to the main Paleon region. There are crates left stacked all over the dock. You peek through and see scientific equipment, toys and treats for baby Pokemon, and a number of large containers filled with merchandise for the Paleon region. It looks like at some point there were plans to monetize the whole Paleon region like a theme park. 
As you look through the toys and lunch boxes, something rustles inside a nearby crate. When you go to investigate, it pops out and begins running around. All right, time for the very first Pokemon selected from your submissions. And it was created by none other than Pewter City Jim. If you aren't familiar with Jim, he has his own Fakemon region series over on his channel that I will link down in the description below. The Solar region is just amazing, so go check it out. Uh, anyway, Jim submitted a really adorable ghost type that I knew right away I had to have as the very first Pokemon. The design was pretty solid, and all I ended up doing was just making it a little bit more squat uh, to give our overall deck some body type diversity. But enough explanation, let's meet our very first Pokemon! This is Ghost Tomb, the mascot Pokemon. Initial plans for a recognizable Paleon Region character mascot were abandoned, and a number of rubber suits were left behind. Feelings of creation, determination, and heartbreak coalesced into a spiritual ball of energy which is able to control the suits with its multiple arms. It is a conflicted creature, seeking crowds and wanting company, but still feeling betrayed. And its ability is Filter, and that reduces super effective damage by 25%. You would need to chase the little ghost tomb between the crates, uh, but every time you get closer, it shambles to another spot. So it would be a bit of a logic puzzle to get it somewhere where it couldn't run away and you actually get the chance to catch it. Wow. What a resourceful Pokemon. Very interesting. I've got a feeling that we'll find even more new species. Come on, let's go. You follow Mal onto a road that is barely visible under the encroaching vines and weeds. In the surrounding vegetation, you spot Pokemon that you are all too familiar with from your adventures in the Paleon region, but you keep your eyes peeled for anything new. Crossing over a rickety bridge, you spot a playful Pokemon bobbing about in the water. All right, Pokemon number two. This first episode is going to have a lot more cute Pokemon and it doesn't get much cuter than Procellion submission. They are such an amazing artist and their submission matches my art style so closely that I didn't even have to redraw it. Now, if you haven't seen Procellion's work, I will link to the Monosodes channel down below. Uh, but let's meet this little cutie, Ragdolly, the flop Pokemon. The body of Ragdolly is soft and malleable, allowing it to bounce back easily from physical trauma. It is an extremely gentle Pokemon that has adapted unusually quickly to human contact, causing speculation that human ancestors may have trained Ragdolly when this Pokemon originally roamed the sea. And its ability is unaware. Uh, so when attacking, the Pokemon ignores the target's stat changes. And yeah, oh, it's just so stinking cute. Oh, Ragdolly's so cute. Ah, as I suspected, there are additional species of Pokemon here that were resurrected but never made it to the main island when the operations were shut down. I really want to make it to the lab we saw at the center of the island, but it also wouldn't hurt if we went out of our way to document all of these new Pokemon either. You continue into the dense jungle. The Pokemon on this island are all of a very high level, and you're finding it tough to make your way through. Luckily, a helpful Pokemon waddles out of the bushes and offers you a berry. Yes, time for even more cuteness! I got this little submission from Donnie K9, who is a pretty talented artist, and I'll link to their Deviant Art page below. But I loved seeing a mono grass type based off of the fossil tree Zamites. I rounded things out just a hair um, to up the cuteness, but other than that, I didn't really have to change much. Let's go ahead and meet Zamini, the small sapling Pokemon. This tiny grass type is very hyperactive and happy. If it ever encounters a sad Pokemon, it will do whatever it takes to cheer it up. Along with its upbeat attitude, it is covered with incredibly tough bark, making it surprisingly sturdy. Trainers who catch Zamini are guaranteed to have a loyal companion, and its ability is Overgrowth. That powers up grass-type moves in a pinch, um, which is actually kind of useful when you have decent bulk. 
Yeah, the, the small Pokemon is quite tough and not afraid of you. And peering out of the jungle nearby, you can see something is watching you and ensuring that you mean little Zamini no harm. Ah, that's right. Donnie K9 actually submitted a two-stage design. And little Zamini gets to turn into a powerhouse of a grass type. With some pretty minimal tweaks, we've got another feminine design, which the region definitely needed more of, and one with stats that would make it a serious threat. All right, here is Zamidame, the Zamite tree Pokemon. Scientists believe this could be the ancestor of Trevenant and Executor. Its body is covered with a durable bark that makes it incredibly difficult to damage. When it is feeling lonely, a Zamini pops out of the leaves on the top of its head. Reasons as to how this happens are still unknown, and its ability remains overgrown. Now, it's up to you if you would want to try and catch either of these two. Samudame certainly looks like it means business. You continue on, though, and end up passing over another bridge. The boards creak under your feet, and yet again, you see something new swimming just under the surface. You lean over the edge to get a better look. What's this? A submission from good old Dead Bedspread? Now, if you don't know DBS, first, how have you missed him? And secondly, I'll link to his content, so go down and check it out. Well, he gave us something not only based on like the Chimera and other slowly evolving sharks and fishies, but he also tossed in an elephant shark and accompanying Dinotherium. That is the type of weird Pokemon-y combinations that I am a sucker for. Also, it's painfully cute. The original submission was dragon and fairy type, but we'll be starting out with just a mono dragon type as we've got a lot of fairy types in the region as is. Here is Tuscute, the Chimera Pokemon. Found on the seafloor, this adorable little water type uses their long noses and short but sharp tusks to forage for food. Evolving very slowly over the course of millions of years, they are often overshadowed by relicanth, which go out of their way to pick on them. They aren't particularly strong, but have dreams of eventually evolving. And to pay homage to the fairy typing that it kind of almost had, um, its ability is Cute Charm, and that means that when it's hit by contact moves, there's a chance that the attacker becomes infatuated. It is kind of goofy, but also painfully adorable. Um, you also see something swimming nearby that must be its evolved form and is much less cute. Now, here's a fun twist. The evolution is actually by another person. I loved what the Iron Templar submitted, and it just so happened that it kind of works as a Tuscute evolution, like, really well. Iron is a newer artist, I'll link to his Instagram, but he has already shown like, a lot of potential. Uh, and I just love the inspiration and execution so much that this kick-butt design had to make it into the region. It's also fun because, I mean, just look at it. It could easily be dragon, dark, electric, water, or steel, so it was really nice to be able to use it to balance the types for the DLC. Alright, this is Pristage, the Blade Ray Pokemon. Its snout is lined with razor-sharp blades that also serve as sensors, able to pick up on minute electrical disturbances. This Pokemon is incredibly fast and deadly accurate, capable of jumping three meters into the air in a flash. Even modern Gyarados are no match for its blade. And its ability, kind of to reflect that it could easily be an electric type, is galvanized, so that takes its normal type attacks and makes them electric and boost their power. So yeah, it's basically got triple stab, kind of. Catching Pristige would be extremely difficult, very low catch rate, and relatively rare, but if you want to go the Tuscute route, um, they need to be leveled up to a super high level before they evolve, probably like 60 or something ridiculous like that. Now you continue, but you have to catch your breath a little ways on next to a roaring waterfall. Phew, this place is difficult to navigate. 
It's crazy how overgrown everything is already. We've still got quite a trek before we even get to that building, so give me your Pokemon and let me heal them up. Mal pulls out a bag of supplies and restores your team. Come on, it's not that much farther. We just need to climb this mountain and we should be up where that building was. This is certainly much easier said than done. The roads and paths that lead up to the top have been all but destroyed by time. Rock slides and mounds of new vegetation block the path regularly, forcing the two of you off into the wilds. It is here that you spot a couple of brand new Pokemon. Well, to start things off, we've got a submission from none other than Gibster himself, who voices Mal. He has his own Fakemon channel that I will link to down below. His submission is based on early stem mammals like Lycosuchus and Megazostrodon. Now, I love the inspiration, but even more so, I love that it is just a teeny tiny little cutie. And uh, getting the fur and the stereotypical dino scales in there helps communicate that transitional mammal idea. Now, other than toning down the colors to hair and scalifying the sail on its back a bit, it stayed pretty much the same. So let's go ahead and meet Lysokus, the stem mammal Pokemon. This tiny creature sports both fur and scales and is thought to be a transitional species between reptilian and mammalian Pokemon. Though incredibly adorable, little Lysokus are very territorial and tougher than they look and will challenge opponents many times their size. And its ability, because of that, is Moxie, and that boosts attacks after knocking out any other Pokemon. Unsurprisingly, Mal adores this little Pokemon and catches it for themselves. And Mal isn't even sorry about it. But looking around you, you see another small Pokemon rustling about in a patch of dead grass. This clever submission is from Escondida17. This is the first of a two-stage line that references the massive tree-like fungus that grew on land before trees even existed. In addition to that, Escondida sprinkled in some wizardry flavoring. So what we've got is an ancient mushroom that looks like a wee little wizard, like a little hat. It's, it's so cute. Now I did give it some puffs of spores to accentuate the brim of the hat, and Though the original submission was a dual poison and dark type, I am simplifying it down. In fact, you may have noticed that we're getting a lot of monotypes on this island. Now, the existing Paleon Dex is pretty overwhelmingly dual types, so I'm trying to remedy that here. Alrighty, let's go ahead and meet Necrotot, the fungus Pokemon. This ancient species of mushroom protects itself with a cloud of spores which it manipulates as if casting a spell. They prefer to be stationary, but will walk on their long roots if needed. Though poisonous, they love attention from their trainers. And its ability gets to be Effect Spore. Um, I thought that worked for like wizardry spells, and that means contact with them may leave them poisoned or cause them to fall asleep or be paralyzed. It is pretty good. All right, another two Pokemon added to your decks. And even though they are cute, it has been tough trekking through this island to find them. Mal walks over and produces a couple of potions for your Pokemon. Hey, let me heal up your team again because I have quite the abundance of healing items. Eh, oh, uh, oh no. I think I spoke too soon because I'm getting really low on supplies already. I uh, just hope we can make it the rest of the way. You continue up the winding trail until you come across a dusty clearing. It appears to be some sort of excavation site, and you see a number of fossils poking out of the ground. A table nearby has spots that are labeled for various species, but no specimens are there. This is where we get to have a little fun uh, and have a kind of little mini game or side quest. You decide to take some time and explore the dig site and begin pulling up wonderfully preserved fossils and placing them on the table. While you are busy collecting, you see a strange Pokemon stumbling about. All right, time for some more cuteness. This ridiculous little creature was submitted by Salvris, 
and is based on snouters or rhino grades. These were small, shrew-like mammals who had super specialized hand-like noses that they could even hop around on. Except, <laughs> the best thing about rhino grades is that they never actually existed. They were a wonderfully executed zoological prank that uh, Gerolf Steiner put together in the, in the 60s. Basically, a super detailed scientific document that he used to trick his colleagues. And I think that is hilarious. Anyway, you may be asking, what am I doing putting a fictitious creature in the Paleondex? Uh, well... One, again, I think rhino grades are really funny. And two, something strange like this fits in with the lab's lore. So let's check out the decks. Here is Snooter, the hand and nose Pokemon. This extremely strange creature was found around the lab on Site B. There are no examples of Snooter in the fossil record, and it seems to have been an early attempt at the revival process, a hybrid or a combination of the two. Its dexterous nose appears to be its main way of sensing the world around it. And its ability is Frisk, uh, and that lets it see what item the opponent has. Yep, this thing is definitely pretty odd. You're certainly curious about the lab that's farther up the mountain, but you've already started something, and you quickly gather up the remaining fossils and display them on the table. It is only then that an exceedingly rare Pokemon digs itself up out of the ground and runs over to the table excitedly. All right, this well thought out design is by Cheerios. Based on the Episeon Hedenai, an incomplete fossil that was first theorized to have a more feline head, but then it was discovered it had a more like dog-like head. So Cheerios took that swapped heads idea and turned it into a just a genius direction. So we've got a digging Pokemon who finds bones and puts them on its own head, uh, which then grants it stat boosts in battle. And I just, I love that idea and how well thought out it was. So yeah, I had to put this in here. Now it was originally a dual type with an electric typing, but it didn't feel particularly justified. Um, and we actually will be set with electric types in the DLC. So it will be another trusty monotype. Let's say hello to Epixcavate, the bone Pokemon. Early fossils of this Pokemon were often a mystery as it was found with multiple heads. Now that it has been restored, researchers have observed that it will dig for fossils and wear their skulls and bones as stat boosting armor. Because of this clever adaptation, it is highly unpredictable in battle. And its ability then is found armor. So whenever it uses dig, it will pop back up covered in a random piece of armor. A Pixcavate excitedly admires all of the fossils that you have discovered and actually ends up putting on a bit of a fashion show for you. It's basically strutting its stuff and looking cool as heck with its various fossils that it plops on its head. It's so thankful, in fact, that it is basically begging for you to catch it. Now, with a rare Pokemon at your side, you continue the last nearly vertical stretch to the top of the mountain. Stumbling up over the cliff edge, you and Mao finally pull yourselves up onto a clearing. Now, in addition to the large building that you had spotted from afar, there's also a dilapidated Pokemon Center, which you both sprint to. Luckily, there's still a small amount of power that is trickling through the buildings here and you're able to heal up your Pokemon. Close call, eh buddy? But uh, how about we finally check out the lab? Mal runs in and you try to keep up. The interior is dark and sections of collapsed roof have let sprawling vegetation in. Much of the equipment looks identical to what is back on the main island, no doubt used to revive the new Pokemon. You see lists of some of these Pokemon on the wall, including some that you have yet to see. But you have no doubt that they are lurking somewhere on this island. You walk through the dark lab and hear skittering coming from around the hall ahead. There are actually quite a few new Pokemon to be found here. Strizzles was an easy choice with their new Primal Klefki. Now I know I am in the minority, but I actually love Klefki. 
So a primal form based on flint creating fire was just right up my alley. In fact, if it weren't for making room for more people's designs, um, I very nearly actually almost chose two more of Strizzle's submissions. There's a primal Dwebble and Crustle. Loved them, uh, but of their ideas, Klefki was my favorite. It's just so cute. Now, I went ahead and gave it a couple more rocks so that it matched Klefki's keys a bit more uh, and came up with a new mouth. But after that, we've got Primal Klefki, the Flint Ring Pokemon. This bizarre form of the familiar Klefki loves to collect flint stones and smash them together to create white hot sparks. While it is all too capable of igniting things with the flame atop its head, it prefers to demonstrate its ingenuity by striking stones together in most instances. Researchers suspect this Pokemon helped instruct early humans. And its ability is Levitate, um, which is mainly because I love Klefki and getting uh, an immunity to ground when it would normally be... Cr you get it. I like Klefki a lot. It gets a cool ability. Now, after you catch one, it hovers around and actively helps light your way through the dark hallways. Something waddles out of the shadows ahead of you and glares at you. Oh man, I am so excited about this little abomination from Mimo Baruch Galardo. Now, the primary inspiration is the fact that there were a bunch of transitionary birds that had teeth in their beaks. Plus, there's definitely a sprinkling of Big Bird from Sesame Street and a pinch of mascot horror also. And I gotta say, I love how messed up this thing looks. Having a single eye and a beak on top, this just ends up working really well with the lab lore. It's just perfect. All right, let's go ahead and meet Fangic, the odd bird Pokemon. Found around the lab on Site B, it seems that this Pokemon was either a failed attempt at reviving an early bird fossil Pokemon or a strange hybrid. If the single eye and beak on top of its head weren't enough of a clue, Fangeek's personality is completely unstable. It alternates between wanting to snuggle and angrily clamping its tooth beak on anyone who gets too close. Its ability is Intimidate, because, I mean, look at it. Uh, and that lowers the foe's attack. It's not particularly tough, but it is just mad that you're even there. You dodge its bites, uh, but you'd have to let me know. Would you catch this weird little thing? All right, continuing through the maze-like building, you actually manage to find a hidden room. By pulling some vegetation aside and sliding through a few deteriorating walls, you encounter a very rare Pokemon basking in a beam of sunlight pouring in through a partially collapsed roof. All right, you have Lava Tyrant to thank for one of my favorite designs of the DLC right here. Now, if you don't know Lava Tyrant, you need to go check out their channel, which I will link below. I actually recently got to do some voiceover work for their Pokemon Legends Lotus series. So be sure to watch that. It's a ton of fun. Uh, but on to what makes this submission so good. Lava Tyrant took a dinosaur, the Barapasaurus Tagori, and combined it with the person who it was named after. Rabindranath Tagore was a Bengali poet, writer, painter, musician, and the very first non-European to win the Nobel Prize in literature, um, and just chef's kiss for how Lava Tyrant merged the two together. It's so good. All right, let's meet Rabi Rapa, the poetic Pokemon. Known as the wisest Pokemon of the Paleon region, Rabi Rapa are known for their beautiful voice and helpful nature. They often scribble things onto bits of bark and leaves using their removable spines and shimmering sap. Though unrecognizable as any known form of language, the scribbles still evoke a deeply moving form of poetry. And its ability is own tempo and that prevents it from being confused. You're quite fortunate that you have stumbled across this wise Pokemon, and it can sense that you'll need its help on the island, and after a quick battle, it happily joins you. You continue through the building, and you eventually find where Mal has ended up. They are in some sort of laboratory whose lights are struggling to stay on. At the center of the lab, there are two large glass chambers, completely covered by ice. 
Mal is attempting to peer through, but with no luck. They do find a computer terminal between the two and begin powering it on. Okay, let's see if we can figure out what these two are. Come on, little computer, power on. You can do it. I need to know. The small screen flutters to life, but in doing so, it causes the rest of the lights in the building to flicker in response. An error message pops up on the screen. Insufficient power. Redirect? Yes? No. Yes, of course. Let's see if I can figure out what's going on here. Just then, all of the lights in the building fail, plunging you into darkness, save for a few weak beams of light sneaking through the deteriorating roof. There is a creaking sound, and then you hear the two glass cases shatter. The room is filled with an icy mist. And when the lights flicker back on, you see faint shapes darting through the haze. After it clears, you and Mal are alone. The two glass cases are empty, and you can't help but give Mal a little bit of a side eye. Oh, come on. How was I supposed to know that would happen? And we'll pick up from there in the next episode. All right, be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. And a big thank you to Gibster for voicing Mal and all of the artists who got their submissions in. And with that, I will catch you in the next one. Later, nerds. Mal is furiously typing at the center computer terminal. Oh, the professor's gonna kill me. According to this, whatever was in those frozen chambers were super early attempts at creating hybrid Pokemon. They are extremely unstable and dangerous. I think we may have put the whole island in jeopardy here. Yes, we stop giving me that look, but the lab is lacking the power needed to access any further data. But according to this, there is a power station off to the west. If you can get that back online, we should be able to warn all we need to stop any peril that I may have put the island in. There, you happy? You agree and begin heading west. Immediately leaving the lab, you are reminded how difficult this will be as you run straight into a new species of Pokemon. We're starting things off strong with a design from Kato. She is a talented artist and I will link to her deviant art page in the description. Now I'm a sucker for anything that uses archaeological concepts and Kato decided to incorporate the medieval process of trepanning. But that's like boring a hole into a person's head to release the evil spirits. She combined this with a kappa, a Japanese yokai, um, and that has like a hole or a bowl in the top of its head, so it works really well. I, mean, I think technically Golduck is supposed to be a kappa, but um, Kato's design just does it way better. So yeah, just a great non-animal based concept that fits really well into the region. Let's go ahead and say hello to Impanion, the unlucky duck Pokemon. This hapless creature lives in murky waters and jumps at the chance to be cared for by a trainer. A ghostly parasite saps its energy, making it sluggish and reluctant to battle. But if pushed to its limit, it can release torrents of chilling water and spectral energy. It is thought to be an ancestor to both Psyduck and Lotad, and its ability is Cursed Body, uh, and that means that it may disable a move that is used against it. This ghostly little buddy is pretty happy to chill in a small pond, and you sneak past. You see large power cables leading to the west, and you follow them. You start descending the mountain, and the vegetation begins to thin out immediately. It is out here that you spot evolutions to two of the new Pokemon here on Site B. The first up is an evolution for Snooter, the fictitious Rhino grade submitted by Salvris. Now, obviously the first stage was adorable, but Salvris was holding off on giving it the truly specialized hand-like nose that you know, Rhino grades are known to hop around with. Now, the other thing that completely won me over about this design 
And honestly, it's kind of completely unrelated to the inspiration, but I just recently started watching the One Piece anime, and the two nose arms on this rhino gray just give me major, like, stretchy Monkey D. Luffy vibes, and I dig that. Okay, let's go ahead and meet the evolution. Snooteruff, the fist nose Pokemon. With their nose now sporting two stretchy arm-like appendages, this Pokemon is now quite formidable. Able to use their nose for locomotion, they are very speedy, while being able to deliver powerful punches. The rubbery nature of their noses allows them to extend and reach targets far taller than them. And its ability is Iron Fist, since they are going to be punched and everything, and that boosts punching moves. It's a pretty tough little guy, but luckily, they aren't very antagonistic. But further on, you see a much larger and more imposing Pokemon in your way. Now, we already got the ancient fungus-based Pokemon Necrotot from Escondida 17, but when it evolves, they really let it look like the massive tree-like fungus that grew on land before trees ever existed. Not only that, but this tiny little wizard hat is getting an upgrade too. I mean, it still definitely looks like a wizard uh, and even has those kind of twisted arms that feel like magic wands casting a spell. But it's so big that the overall shape ends up reading like a wizard's tower instead. And bringing in those spores, we've got these juddy outfits on the sides that read both as mushroom caps and bits of roofing. Very fun. Oh, and... Like the last stage, we're maintaining the mono poison typing here. All right, let's meet Sorcellium, the odd tree Pokemon. Before trees existed, this towering Pokemon littered the ancient landscape in their place. They towered over most predators and used their spores to control their actions. How they produce their spores in a conjuring manner is enough to dissuade most from advancing and their ability remains Effect Spore. After seeing these two evolutions, you'll have to let me know which of these lines would you add to your team. As you get closer to the power station, you start to understand how it is generating its power. Fissures in the earth are blasting up superheated steam, and you gather that the mild volcanic activity is powering a geothermal plant. The cracked path is quite treacherous, as you do your best not to topple into any of the magma-filled ravines. You see the small power plant ahead of you, but there are some Pokémon in the way. The first seems to thrive on this heat. Yeah, I got the coolest looking Intelladont design from Thog, and I just had to get it into the decks. If you're not familiar with Intelodonts, uh, think of them as gigantic, carnivorous, pig-like creatures. In fact, I mean, they have earned the name Hell Pig. And Thog took that nickname and gave us something that looks like it just, like, crawled its way out of the underworld. And this is pretty great, um, as so far we've had a lot of little cuties in the DLC and could use some more intimidating beasts. All right, let's go ahead and meet our meanest member of the DLC so far. This is Torbentello, the Hell Pig Pokemon. Many consider this wild hog to be completely uncontrollable. Torbentello are voracious predators who eat anything they can catch, then rolling their prey along their back to toast them before devouring them. They were once thought to be ancestors to Embor, but research indicates that they are actually closest related to Sedamut, and its ability is Anger Point, and that raises attack to the max after receiving a super effective hit. After dealing with this roasted piggy, you turn around and come face to face with another Pokemon that looks like it wants to nom your face off. In the last episode, we got Gipster's tiny little Lysukus, but his stem mammal is going to get quite a bit bigger and tougher. Now, I've got some pretty sizable tweaks to make here. Originally, the design was based on Smilodon or Sabretooth cats, but unfortunately, good old primal Persian is already based on that. So we're keeping pretty much everything else the same, but swapping the head for another big toothed critter, the Therapsid Gorgonopsid. So, let's go ahead and meet another hungry Pokemon, 
Lysogorg, the mammal Pokemon. This fierce beast is incredibly aggressive and difficult to train. During the evolution process, Lysogorg become much more physically intimidating, but do not think through their actions. Forming a bond with this Pokemon will hopefully keep it from attacking you, but it will still take a great deal of effort to train its feral mind. And its ability remains Moxie. You are pretty over dodging vicious Pokemon like Lysogorg and Tormentello on the side of an active volcano by the time you finally slip inside of the power station. You find that the mechanism which allows the plant to generate power has been partially disabled. You can see that there are a number of gears that should fit together, but they're nowhere to be seen. You explore the dark halls and walkways of the power plant and approach something that looks like sparking electricity. Unfortunately, it turns out to be a very large Pokemon. All right, I have to thank Crimson for giving us a design that I didn't even have to redraw. And if you don't know Crimson, I mean, you absolutely must check out his YouTube channel and the ridiculously amazing Revlar region. It's linked below, but let's go ahead and learn about his stellar design here. This is Thorium. The Bulb Head Pokemon. These Pokemon will rub their bulbous horns on trees, not to sharpen them, but to charge them with static electricity. The massive amounts of charge that Thorium can build up all over their body means that it can be dangerous to pet them. This is a shame, as even the most aggressive looking Thorium enjoys being scratched under their chin. And its ability is Lightning Rod, and that means it absorbs all electric attacks, and instead of taking damage, it boosts their special attack. It's a bulky brute to be avoided as you explore the power plant. Continuing on and peering through the dark, you spot a group of Pokemon playing with the gears that you need to fix the mechanisms. We've got another fun design that brings in a touch of archaeological inspiration. This time from Pint-Sized Kiwi. I'll link to their channel below. So, what they are folding into this design are the Egyptian god of knowledge, the ibis, since it's like the corresponding animal for that, the Rosetta Stone, and the Trodon, since it was a real dino smarty. And there's just a couple really cute details that I appreciate here, uh, like the writing quill look of the tail and the little circles under the eyes that feel very like librarian glasses. Well, and again, um, we are trying to get more monotypes in the region, so I did take away the dragon typing that was on the submission, so we now have a solid mono-psychic type. Uh, let's learn about Trucetus. The only fossils left behind by this extremely intelligent creature were intricate claw marks left by their elongated talons. It is suspected that early humans were inspired to create the written language by watching Trucetus create their beautiful carvings. Scientists suspect that they have a language of their own, but it is yet to be deciphered. And its ability is insomnia, which means it cannot be put to sleep. You run after them, and it takes some time to corner them in different spots around the building. Eventually, you manage to catch all of them and retrieve the gears you need to fix the power plant. It is a bit of a puzzle, but you eventually get things back in working order, and you hear the power cables leading back to the central lab humming with power. Oh good, you're back. Nice job getting the power back up and running. Now, as far as I can tell, it looks like there is one thing about these escaped hybrids that may help us track them down. Apparently, they are drawn to some mysterious material called Prismatic Amber. Fancy name, isn't it? I don't seem to have any information on what it is, but there is a quarry off to the east that has a deposit. I figure, if we're lucky, we can catch the two Pokemon there. You ready? The two of you heal up your Pokemon, grab whatever healing items you can find, and begin trekking east. After immediately leaving the lab, you bump into the evolution of one of the lab's experiments. You remember that cute little Fangic by Mimi Baruch Gallardo, right? Well, it's about to get a whole lot bigger. Again, 
The primary inspiration here are all of the transitional birds with teeth in their beaks. But what makes this so good is just how wonderfully messed up it looks. There's certainly a splash of like Moa Moa in there, which I appreciate. And of course, it is 100% Big Bird. And here's the thing, I absolutely love the Muppets and the Sesame Street crew, so this was a big win for me. Um, and again, it's so messed up. Just look at it. It feels like a big bird, but also like it's got mascot horror. It's just such a great design. Okay, let's go ahead and learn all about Bibikeith, the big bird Pokemon. This massive avian creature has finally gotten control of its anger and is a trusted friend. While it is able to use the razor-sharp beak atop its head to cut through the thickest of tree trunks with ease, it is now able to control the instinct to do so. Bibikeith make trusted partner Pokemon and are surprisingly fond of working with baby Pokemon and young children. And even with that, its ability remains intimidate because I, look at it, look at it. But are you like me? Would you have no choice but to put one of these on your team, or is it just too strange for you? Uh, well, as you progress, the Pokemon seem to be getting even stronger. And heading off to the east, there is one that seems to be intentionally blocking your path. Oh yes, time for a great big barrier of a Pokemon from Gladiator Gigan. I'll link to their Instagram down below. Now, they got so many brownie points for basing their design on a cryptid, as I love everything to do with cryptids. Specifically, this is a Mokele Mbembe, a cryptid that is thought to be an aggressive sauropod that resides in the Congo. They also sprinkled in some Caprasuchus, a prehistoric crocodilian, since the whole Mokele Mbembe attacking anyone that gets in the water thing, that's often blamed on crocodiles. So this is super well thought out. It's a cryptid, which is fun. Uh, so let's check out the decks for Berry Bembe, the river barrier Pokemon. Their solid metal bodies, formidable tusked bite, and stubborn personalities make them nearly impossible to move. Berry Bembe are notoriously known for their territorial behavior, often blocking the flow of rivers to prevent the growth of foliage in the territories of rival clans. Rumors claim that a handful of Berry Bembe escaped extinction and still reside in the jungles of a foreign region. And its ability, even though it's not a water type, is water absorb! Uh, so that means it will be healed by water type moves. Now, this specific Berry Bembe seems absolutely crazed. It appears to be both confused and poisoned, and seeing a steel type that is poisoned is just extremely strange. You end up catching it, if for no other reason than to heal its conditions. But it certainly was tough to get past. Luckily, the next Pokemon you discover seems to be pretty weak. Yep, we got something just stinking fun from Jam Man. Now, it's really nice to get animals that went extinct all along the spectrum of geological time. It's just, that's fantastic. So, something as recent as the Passenger Pigeon is amazing, all right? It is just so cute. And it has the flying and ice typing. Uh, this typing, all right, it may not make a ton of sense right the second, but I promise you that it is really well justified. Okay, let's say hello to the pitiful little Phrygian, the cold bird Pokemon. These timid avian specimens are quite the little wimps. Phrygian run away from even the slightest sign of danger. They love the cold and snow and prefer to live in high secluded mountain ranges. Though weak, they make loyal companions and enjoy flying messages between people they trust. And its ability is flocking, which we'll get to here in a second. You honestly feel a little bad for this cutie and decide that it would be best to catch it. But as soon as you enter battle, something strange happens. A bunch of other Phrygian flock in out of nowhere and join together. Yep, just like Wishy Washy from the Alola region, 
we have a bunch of individuals coming together to approximate the appearance of a much larger animal. And this is where the flying and ice typing comes in. So we know that there were flocks of passenger pigeons so massive and dense that they could literally cast sprawling shadows across the land. Uh, so Jam Man was clever and extended that. So it's not only casting these dark shadows, but they're also cooling the land. So there's our ice type. I love that. It's so, it's so good. So let's check out Phrygian's flock form. Now, when Phrygian gather in their flock, they become a force to be reckoned with. They are ferocious and can easily hurt anything that may have picked on them when they were alone. A Phrygian flock is so large that they cover the sky, bringing darkness and freezing temperatures. And yep, there's that ability, flocking. So they'll change into their flocking form as long as they're above 25% HP and, you know, they have to be a high enough level. You are kind of getting your butt kicked on this island with all of these tough Pokemon, but Mal is able to heal up your Pokemon a tiny bit here and there. But this really is just a grueling journey and you're both feeling pretty worn out. Eventually, you pull the vines off of a nearby sign and see the area ahead is the Prismatic Amber Quarry. The hybrid Pokemon have hopefully been drawn here, but they aren't the only Pokemon here. All right, we met Gibster's tiny little Lizukas and feral Lizogorg, but now this line gets to become something completely enlightened. The entire line is based on the advancement of mammals towards human intelligence, and Gibster pulled together a design that accentuates the upright posture, huge brain, and general anatomy of a human. I simplified a bit of the detail and also sprinkled in some Mind Flayer inspiration since, I mean, I love me some Dungeons and Dragons influences. Uh, and we end up with a pretty awesome design. This is Lysapian, the advanced Pokemon. In extremely rare instances, Lysogorg are able to evolve into this immensely intelligent species. Researchers are still unsure how such a massive advancement in intellect can be made by a Pokemon. Lysapian have been recorded using their telepathic abilities to communicate directly with humans, but it seems that they prefer to keep their abilities a secret from most. And its ability actually gets to remain Moxie. This individual that you've run across seems pretty upset. It's poisoned also. But that doesn't actually seem to be what is freaking it out. What could be in this area that could be frightening a Lysapian? You spot a large Pokemon peek around the corner, and you rush over to get a better look. We're getting a ridiculously big bug from Lizardfish. Their jumping off point was the unbelievably big Brontoscorpio, but we're having some fun with the name and morphing it into a scorpion that's kind of turned into a sauropod, you know, with Bronto in its name and all. So you can think of this kind of like a dinosaur or a dragon mimic. It's just so large that it's convergently evolved a similar body plan. Okay, let's go ahead and meet this big, big friend. Here is Scorpronto, the lost stinger Pokemon. This Titan is by far the largest bug-type Pokemon ever recorded. Scientists doubted its size based on the partial remains, but this colossal bug rivals even the largest dragons. They are very kind and travel in large groups that actively help one another and anyone in need. And its ability is Swarm, and that powers up bug-type moves in a pinch. Now this big sweetheart is being uncharacteristically aggressive, and you can tell that it's actually been confused. You do your best to calm it and continue exploring. In a pool of nearly frozen water, you see another new Pokemon nervously scanning its surroundings. All right, what we've got here is one of the coolest designs from Paleon Reel. So it is based on the great big Kulusukis, an amphibian that lived quite close to the South Pole, and that's where we're getting the ice typing from. 
And since a good number of amphibians use electroreception to detect prey in the murky waters, he also added the electric type here too. But what elevates the design is that he didn't just stop there, all right? Instead, he used the energetic electric and cool ice types to craft a personality. And that's how we get this super chill DJ. Now, I did tweak the tail a little bit so that he can DJ scratch on his electrical patterns of his tail. Um, and with that, we ended up with Kula Scepter, the wavelength Pokemon. This amphibian actually prefers relaxing in frigid bodies of water. Kula Scepter have a very finely tuned set of electroreceptors, allowing them to scan their surroundings even in complete darkness. They are supportive of their friends in and out of battle. Based on their genetics, they seem to possibly be an ancestor to the Seismitoad and Toxtricity lines. And because of that, their ability is Punk Rock, which boosts the power of sound type moves and kind of gives them a little bit of a buffer to them as well. This specific specimen is also poisoned and confused. I mean, you have no choice but to catch it and heal its injuries. It smiles its big goofy smile at you, but it still seems worried about something in the surrounding area. All of your Pokemon are quite exhausted, but Mal can't help themselves from examining the bits of prismatic amber sticking out of a rock face nearby. Whoa, look at this stuff. It's mesmerizing, isn't it? And you can feel the sort of power emanating from it. Here, let's each take a piece. Mal struggles a bit before prying two shards of prismatic amber loose and hands one to you. Your Pokemon are transfixed by its iridescent glimmer. You're not certain exactly what it does, but it must be some sort of held item in battle, as your Pokemon are desperate to interact with it. You pick a member of your team to hold it and continue searching the quarry. Look over here. It seems that we're not the only ones collecting prismatic amber. These claw marks are fresh. Perhaps our missing hybrids have been collecting shards as well. But that means that they're around here somewhere. Almost on cue, you hear rustling overhead. Standing atop a rocky outcropping are two menacing silhouettes, which do not seem happy to see you. All right, the first of the two hybrids comes from Carno13, whose Instagram I'll link down below. This is, of course, based off of the Scorpius Rex from Camp Cretaceous. If you are not familiar with the Scorpius Rex, you should go watch that show. It's pretty fun, especially the season that spotlights this baddie. Now, I'm digging the overall color palette, especially the gradients on the poisonous quills, but I did tweak the proportions just a little bit because for me at least, Part of what makes the Scorpius Rex so fun is just how intentionally haphazard and ugly it looks. So it needed just a bit more ugle. And here is our first new legendary hybrid, Venorex, the experiment Pokemon. This unstable hybrid was created during the initial experiments of the Paleon region. The toxins present in a Venorex quill can take down a Whale Lord in a minute. Its violent behavior and incredibly potent toxins forced researchers to cryogenically freeze it in order to protect the Paleon region's species and environments from its poisonous effects. And its ability is corrosion, meaning that it can poison any Pokemon, including steel and poison types. It snaps its jagged maw and swooshes its spiked tail before looking over to its fellow hybrid. Yes, our second hybrid comes from Topaz. You can find her links down below. Now, she has some clear inspiration from the Indoraptor in Fallen Kingdom. Uh, this is also great because while both of the hybrids are aggressive and mean, we're able to get two distinct personalities where Venorex is squat, brutish, ugly, and more masculine, this design gets to be upright, exceedingly intelligent, graceful, and more feminine. On top of that, their typings actually cover for one another extremely well, and you end up with a pretty formidable pair. 
let's meet our second hybrid. Here is Cindorex, the experiment Pokemon. This unstable hybrid was created during the initial experiments in the Paleon region. Cindorex has an overpowering psychic aura that bends even the strongest Pokemon to its will. Its malicious behavior and incredible mind control forced researchers to cryogenically freeze it in order to protect the Paleon region from its tyrannical reign. And its ability is Infiltrator. That means that it will pass right through any opponent's barriers and strikes. The two monstrosities roar, a direct challenge at you. You see psychic waves emanating from Cindorex as Venorex fires poisonous quills into the ground around you. A wave of mind-controlled Pokemon converge on you from all directions. You and Mal have quite the gauntlet ahead of you, six powerful Pokemon to deal with. Though confused, the mechanics of this battle minimize the chances that they will ever hurt themselves. On top of that, there are toxic spikes in place already. By the time you get through those six Pokemon, most of Mal's team has fainted. And unfortunately, the two hybrids now leap down and challenge you. This would easily be the most difficult battle of Pokemon Amber. Two extremely high-leveled legendaries actively synergizing and working together to decimate your already weakened team. If that wasn't enough, they each have a Prismatic Amber. When they drop below 50%, that Prismatic Amber boosts their highest stat by two stages. So it's a pretty challenging battle. Luckily, the two of you are able to just barely knock them out and catch the vicious hybrid Pokemon. Yes, we did it. Phew, I was getting pretty worried there. Well, I think I can safely say that I need to take a break from exploring abandoned labs and accidentally letting loose rampaging abominations. Now, how about we introduce some of these new species to everyone on the mainland? After saving the day, the new species found on Site B are scattered across the Paleon region mainland and even find their way into the Battle Hotel, which you would have a blast dominating with your new Prismatic Amber. You continue to help the professor with their research, always on the lookout for new fossils, and every day in the Paleon region continues being a prehistoric adventure. And with that, you have completed the Pokemon Amber DLC. A monumental thank you to all of the artists who submitted their artwork to the contest. I was initially only planning to pick 18 designs, but there were so many that I had to expand to 29 instead. And even then, there were so many amazing submissions that I wasn't able to fit in. All right, the biggest thank you to you for following the series. And if you were sad to see this region come to a close, it's okay, because I will see you very soon for the start of a brand new region. All right. Later, nerds.